All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Lawrence Mella, and I am a mechanical engineer here at, at the CPSC. Um, I work on micro mobility safety, um, specializing in e scooters. On behalf of the commission, I want to thank you all for your participation in today's forum. Um, before we get started, I want to highlight that this presentation and all of CPSC staff's participation in the forum has not been reviewed or approved by and may not reflect, reflect the views of the commission. Neither the commission nor its staff endorses any particular micromobility product. Today's forum is looking broadly at the product category of micromobility and not any specific products or manufacturers. Uh, we request that questions or information be provided with that goal in mind. Additionally, I just wanted to make, uh, make it clear that this forum will be recorded and it will potentially be made available to the public. So we have a number of participants with whom we have some long established relationships with, but we also understand that there are attendees with uh, more limited experience with the CPSC. So I just wanted to take a quick moment to introduce you all to the agency. The CPSC is an independent federal government agency with a health and safety mission to protect the public from unreasonable risk of injury or death from consumer products. With over one trillion annually in societal costs attributed to incidents with consumer products, we play a crucial role in helping the U.S. economy and keeping consumers safe. The agency is led by a presidentially appointed Senate-confirmed commission, which presides over about 500 engineers, scientists, attorneys, enforcement professionals, and other safety-focused staff. CPSC has more than 15,000 products in its jurisdiction, including consumer apparel, toys, furniture, and almost any other consumer product that you can buy in a store and interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. For today, we will be focusing on micro-mobility products. So, what is micro-mobility? When, when people talk about micromobility, uh, they usually are referring to a single rider, small form factor mobility device. These products can be powered or not and tend to operate at relatively low speeds. So why do consumers love these things? Consumers, can, consumers find these products convenient, accessible, and relatively inexpensive. Many of these products allow consumers to have enhanced mobility in areas mostly accessible to pedestrians. And in some cases, these products can help consumers who have limited physical mobility. For today's forum, we're focusing on three specific micromobility products, and they are e scooters, e bikes, and hoverboards. So an e-scooter is generally described as having the following characteristics. It usually has a foot platform to stand on, a center column with a handlebar for steering, um, a speed controlled, speed is controlled using an accelerator and brakes. It's powered either partially or fully by a motor, and it's usually composed of two or three wheels. E-bikes are usually two or three wheeled vehicles with fully operable pedals and an electric motor of less than 750 watts. The electric motor can either provide a pedal assistance or fully propel the bicycle. Hoverboards can be described as having foot platforms to stand on, may have a self-balancing mechanism, and is 
controlled by either um, a control unit or the rider distributing their weight. And usually it has one or two wheels that are in parallel. All of these products are electrically powered, typically with lithium ion batteries. Consumers interact with these items both as products they own or as fleet rideshare products where a company owns and maintains the products and consumers can rent them for short periods of time. So the CPSC has jurisdiction over consumer products, which includes micromobility products that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration does not consider to be a motor vehicle. Um, NHTSA guidance advised, advises that the following micromobility products are not considered motor vehicles. So one, the scooter is lacking seats that are operated in a stand Stand up mode. Two, scooters that are incapable of a top speed of 20 miles per hour or greater. And three, electric bicycles with operable pedals and an electric motor of 750 watts or less, whose maximum speed on a paved level surface when powered solely by a motor while ridden by an operator who weighs 170 pounds is less than 20 miles per hour. So these micromobility products fall within CPSC's jurisdiction. Also, by statute, CPSC has jurisdiction over low-speed bicycles, which is codified in CPSC bicycle regulations. Uh, Pedal-assisted micromobility products, even if they can exceed 20 miles per hour, that are not capable of continued self-propulsion, also fall within CPSC's jurisdiction. So, how can we enhance micromobility safety for consumers? So, we have engaged stakeholders across a broad spectrum of the industry, including academic, consumer advocates, manufacturers, and rideshare fleet. We will highlight the importance of a multi pronged approach to addressing micromobility safety. While the CPSC is a regulatory agency, we recognize that there are a number of avenues that, when coordinated, can provide a more robust safety outcome than only using regulation alone to address an issue. So research and data will give us information about hazards, risks, and mitigation strategies. Consensus standards will establish best practices and safety requirements developed by a broad group of stakeholders. Safety-focused design and manufacturing from the product development stage can result in improved safety outcomes. Education and outreach transfers, information on safe operation to consumers. Policy provides a construct that can promote safety by establishing baseline expectations or requirements, and regulations can help establish a set of legal requirements codified by law. As we move through the panel today, I ask all of you to keep this holistic approach in mind when thinking about how best to enhance safety. So I put the forum agenda in the handout section of the GoToWebinar. It should be available there to download. Um, the agenda for today includes five panels. We have a panel on data, standards development, best practices for enhancing safety, micromobility design and research, and policy and, policy and consumer safety. So we're starting today at 9 a.m. and we expect that the panels will conclude around 4.30 where we'll have a short closing to end the day.
before concluding this introduction, I just wanted to go over some administrative points. Um, so once all speakers in a session have completed their presentation, there will be a discussion period of about 15 minutes to address questions that come up. There's a question box where you can type in your questions and you will be collecting them there and presenting them to the panelists um, by the moderator. The moderator will, will be asking the panelists the questions. We're gonna have three breaks. There will be two 15 minute breaks, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And then around 12.15, we'll, we'll break for lunch for about 45 minutes. All of the presentations in the form have been cleared for public distribution. Um, slides and other meeting documentation will be included in the official meeting log that will be posted to CPSC's website. Again, I want to thank everyone for participating in today's forum and being a partner in consumer safety. Um, my colleagues and I, we're, we're pretty excited for today. We're looking forward to the discussion and the potential safety enhancements that, that can come out of this forum and all the good ideas. So thank you once again. So we can get started on session one. Um, session one will be moderated by my colleague, Kirill. And I will hand it over. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Carolee Hillard, and I am the program analyst within the Data Operations Branch, Directorate for Epidemiology here at the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And I will be moderating this first data section. I have been with the agency for about a year, and I work with coders and hospitals in support of the NICE program. We'll start off the webinar today with our first panel on micromobility safety data. Our speakers today are members of the CPSC epidemiology staff and will be presenting on agency studies of micromobility incident data. Malka Glazer is a program analyst within the data operations branch directorate for epidemiology at CPSC. Her role is to work with coders and hospitals in the management, operations, and quality control aspects of the NICE program. She holds a master's in public health from the University of Michigan, as well as a bachelor's in environmental health from the University of Georgia. James Tark is a mathematical statistician in the Division of Hazard Analysis, Directorate for Epidemiology, Office of Hazard Identification and Reduction at the US Consumer Product Safety Commission. At CPSC, he supports EPHA, the Technical Center of the Commission in the area of injury statistics and special studies. In addition, he evaluates and analyzes data on potential hazards. Thank you both for getting us started today, and I'm now going to hand the controls over to Malka so she can begin. Okay, hi all. Sorry for that, we uh, Malka lost connection, and, but I'm actually going to start, I worked with Malka a little on this, so I'm going to start the presentation um, and get us going until she can get back on. So our presentation is about the micromobility products. So we're just gonna go over a little bit about what that is. Um, so micromobility is the last mile solution, and um, we focus on e-scooters, self-balancing scooters, hoverboards, and e-bikes. Some of the trends include advancements in battery technology, shared use commercial products have increased, and issues around sharing the road. Mal I believe Malka's back, so Malka, if you want to unmute, you can continue. So CPSC data use, we set priorities to identify emerging product hazards, um, evidence-based for mitigation actions, um, such as creating and evaluating product standards, product recalls, and develop information and education campaigns. 
The agency informs voluntary standards development organizations um, like develop performance requirements and develop effective labelings, warnings, and instructions. I'm going to talk a little bit about the NICE program. The a NICE is the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System. It's more than 40 year history collecting emergency room data and CPSC, support CPSC and many other federal agencies. They nationally represents 96 US hospitals with, and the qualifications to be a NICE hospital are to have at least six inpatient beds and 24 hour emergency service. The hospitals that participate code injury data um, involving consumer products, anything that falls within our jurisdiction. And we have a subset of hospitals that code all trauma injuries, including CPSC jurisdiction, including the non-CPSC jurisdiction. So the system collects over 400,000 product-related CPSC injury reports each year and an additional 350,000 non-CPSC injury reports. Um, you can go see more about the NICE data at this link, cpsc.gov, um, to learn more about this injury data. If you're interested in seeing NICE data, it, it is available to the public at um, this link, the CPSC NICE query, and I can talk a little more about that, but the information, the data that we use for our um, presentation is right from this, um, right from the query. And usually each year's NICE data becomes publicly available um, the following April. So April of 2019 became available on April of 2020. So coders enter a set, standard set of surveillance variables for every NICE case. And a, a coder may be instructed to enter more variables on an additional screen, and those are what we call our special study cases. Um, responses in certain surveillance variables trigger an additional second screen. Um, so if the child is under the age of five and um, had you know, ingested a drug, then that would, inc that would um, incur a second screen, which is called our child poisoning screen. So we have a number of these cases that uh, open a second screen where we can collect even more in-depth data. We also collect information through telephone internet investigations, and we have investigators who do on-site investigations. So as I said, you can use a, the query to download um, NICE data, and these are some examples of what the data would look like once it's gone through our cleaning process. Um, so some of, the, some of the examples for e-scooter and hoverboard are what we pulled here. So this is an example of a seven-year-old who was on a hoverboard and doing circles when she lost balance and fell. And then it will always have what the diagnosis, um, what the hospital diagnosis was. Another example, um, it's not, it, there could be multiple products involved. So a 19-year-old state, stage, they were riding their bicycle when an electric scooter ran in front of them in order to avoid crashing, they had to brake hard and fell. So this is an example where there are multiple, um, there are multiple products involved. You also see once the data is cleaned, there's asterisks where there's possibly a, um, a product named or a um, company name. So we remove all of that. So it's just, we just wanna get at what the injury was and what was involved, not, um, not what the product, not the brand name of the product. Some of the other surveillance databases are the Consumer Product Safety Risk Management System. This is injury and potential injury incident data, death certificates, and in-depth investigation. Death certificates are another way that we can collect this information. And um, we have separate contracts with all 50 states. We purchase 8,000 certificates annually in certain ICD-10 codes. We read all and code 5,000 certificates. Some will be outside of CPSC jurisdiction, but we still um, go through those. There's lag issues with death certificates. We don't always get them really timely for a number of reasons. And there are brief narratives, usually not, um, not much information about the product.
There are limitations of CPSC database nice specific underestimate deaths they only include if occurred in an ed no non-emergency department treatments doctor's offices school nurses athletic trainer urgent care are not going to be collected in this data they are national estimates only the sample is not designed for regional estimates and for the cpsc cps rms it's not statistic not statistically sample and not nationally represented we have underestimated deaths, and they might have a lengthy lag between event and data collected. So I believe Malka's back on. I'm going to try and pass this over to her. Malka, can you unmute yourself? Yes, hello, everyone. I'm back. Um, my router went out at the exact wrong moment. Sorry about that. So I'm here to talk about how NICE data can be used to analyze e-scooter-related injuries. Next slide. So we decided to look at the 5042 NICE product code. This includes a number of things, such as the hoverboard, the skateboard, the mobility scooter, Segway, as well as your classic powered scooter. So for the purpose of this study, we decided just to look at the powered scooter. We defined this as having two wheels, handlebars, a floorboard that can be stood upon while riding, and a motor that powers the vehicle. Um, we also decided to exclude patients over, over the age of 65 in order to differentiate between mobility scooters and a powered scooter. We also will be focusing on power scooter related ED visits for 2015 to 2019. Next slide. So as you can see here, the e-scooter related ED visits per 1,000 increased dramatically between 2015 and 2019. The rate shifted from 1.75 per 100,000 in 2015 all the way up to 8.49 in 2019. This is over a 400% increase in injuries. In addition, as you can see, there is a wide variance in the 95% confidence interval over time. This indicates that injuries are occurring unevenly across the country. This is because um, some cities have scooters while Others don't. In addition, some scooter, some cities used to have scooters, then they got rid of their scooters. Also, some of our hospitals are very rural, while others are very urban. Next slide. We also decided to look at e-scooter-related ED visits by sex and age groups. So one of the most interesting things I think is how um, the age, the age shifts from five to fourteen. Um, in 2015-2016, all the way at, which was 54% of the injuries, while in 2018-2019, the ages 5 to 14 only made up 18% of the injuries. But in that, in 2018-2019, it made up 27%, um, sorry, 27% of the injuries were ages 25 to 34. In addition, there is a trend towards male-dominated injuries. In 2015-2016, males represented 6% of the injuries, but by 2018-2019, males represented 67% of the injuries. In addition, there's also a higher variance level that we saw previously. Now on to James's presentation. Hello everyone, my name is James Tark, statistician within epidemiology at CPSC. I had an opportunity to work on Epi report on my phone video this year. Uh, it will be posted on the research injury stats webpage of cpsc.gov in the near future. Let's go through the uh, disclaimer first. Uh, this presentation was prepared by the CPSC staff and it is it has not been reviewed or approved and may not necessarily reflect the views of the commission. Okay, now onto the presentation. I would like to share some examples from the report. Uh, next slide. Okay, let's see. All right. So first topic I would like to talk about is in-depth investigations from CPS RMS. Uh, so what is it? It is more comprehensive look at uh, how incidents were happening. So based on reports of incidents in CPS RMS, that occurred between 2017 and 2019. So we completed around 140 follow-ups um, related to our micro-mobility product. Here are some of the hazards identified in each of the product types. 
so the uh, the break the break problem was the top hazard identified in e-scooters. A number of investigations show that brakes not engaging at all, uh, sporadically engaging or engaging excessively following a delay. Followed by unexpected power losses caused, caused the riders to tip over or get thrown out. Lastly, the fire hazards occurred while charging the e-scooters. Well, fire hazards was a top hazard for hoverboards. The reports describe fire sometimes after an explosion, smoke or sparks emanating from the product. Some reports describe the product overheating or melting. So there were around 60 um, out of 93 incidents occurred when the board was being uh, charged. Other electrical hazards include unexpected loss of power resulting in, an, um, in the rider losing balance. And for e-bikes, uh, example, um, Hazard is related to brake problems, such as um, the user constantly needed to tighten the brakes repeatedly until the brakes fell completely. Next slide. Okay, now uh, we'd like to discuss the fatalities involving micro mobility devices. Uh, we are aware of 41 fatalities from 2017 through 2019. Number of fatalities were five. 10, 26 in 2017, 2018, and 2019, respectively. While data, is, data reporting is ongoing, we see that there is an increase in overall number of fatalities. Uh, E-score related fatalities represent uh, 27 of them out of 41, or 66% of total fatalities, increasing substantially from 2017 to 2019, as you can see on the chart. E-bikes account for 10 fatalities 10, fatalities, <coughs> excuse me, 10 fatalities, or approximately 24% of total fatalities. All four fatalities involving hoverboards occurred in 2017. Next slide. So we estimate that there were um, 132,800 uh, injuries related to all micro-ability products treated in U.S. emergency departments over the uh, three-year time period. Uh, the annual estimated ED visits were 34,000, 44,000, and 54,800 in 2017, 2018, and 2019, respectively. The ED treated injury estimates for overall microbrewery products reflect a statistically significant increase from 2017 to 2017, 2018, as well as 2018 to 2019. Next slide, please. So this slide shows that the distribution of injuries by product type and sex. Overall, males experience higher percentage at 56% of micro-ability related ED treated injuries. Specifically for e-scooters, uh, it was around 66% uh, during that three-year um, time period. In contrast, females had higher percentage, 56% uh, of hoverboard related ED treated injuries. Next slide. Now on to uh, limitations of micro-mobility annual report. Uh, we weren't able to uh, report separate injury reports for ductless or rental e-scooters and e-bikes. Uh, states did not meet minimum reporting uh, requirement or criteria for NICE. Next slide. So data improvements at CPSC. Uh, several new product codes um, replace old codes. For, for example, 5042 was used for scooters, hoverboards, uh, skateboards altogether in the past, and 3215 for e-bikes, uh, mopeds. So in, 20, in 2020, we want to improve classification of micro-mobility devices. So we are using uh, 5022 for power scooters, excuse me, 5024 for unspecified scooters, and 5025 for hoverboards and power uh, skateboards. So we are doing survey on possible e-scooter related incidents in nice cases involving power scooters and on specified scooters treated after January 1st, uh, 2020 to understand if it was power versus non-power and also to understand information on such as uh, whether it was for ductless rental versus personal uh, and also to understand the environment they were riding in and also the invent event um, when the incident took place. Next slide. 
So that is it, folks. Thank you so much. Thank you, James and Malka. Okay, so next we're going to have a presentation um, by Dr. Katie Harmon. Dr. Katie Harmon's presentation is titled Injury Surveillance Considerations Regarding E-Scooter and Other Micromobility Devices. Katie is a research associate at the University of North Carolina Highway Safety Research Center. At UNC SHRC, she applies epidemiologic methods to the study and prevention of injuries among users of active transportation. Katie holds a PhD in epidemiology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, an MPH with a joint concentration in epidemiology and environmental and occupational health from St. Louis University, and a BS in environmental health science from the University of Georgia. In addition, Katie is a graduate of the CDC Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists Applied Epidemiology Fellowship. With that, I'll pass the controls over to Katie. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thank you for having me. Can everyone see my slides okay? Yes, I can see them. Okay, too. good. All right, well then I'll get started. So um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm, my name is Katie Harmon and I'm a research associate at the UNC Highway Safety Research Center. And today my presentation will be focusing on injury surveillance considerations regarding e-scooters as well as other micro mobility devices. Ah, there we go. As you are all aware, e-scooter, e-bicycle, and other micro-ability rideshares are emerging in many cities across the United States and the globe. As of September 2020, more than 120 U.S. cities contained at least one micro-ability rideshare. While some cities halted their programs at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, many have now returned to active status. Even some cities that have previously banned e-scooters, such as Seattle, are reconsidering programs in order to address the need for sustainable, physically distant modes of transportation. In addition to the growth in the number of programs, ridership has also skyrocketed, with a total of 136 million micro-ability rideshare trips in 2019. Over 60% of all of these rideshare trips were made using e-scooters. While initial reports have indicated that 2020 ridership has, de has decreased in many cities due to the COVID-19 pandemic, ridership levels are beginning to return to normal, and in some cities have even surpassed 2019 levels. While micro-ability rideshares offer many benefits, increased ridership has come with a cost. Since the launch of the first e-scooter rideshare in September 2017, there have been more than 30 fatalities worldwide involving e-scooter riders, as well as pedestrians struck by e-scooters. Four of these fatalities occurred in Atlanta, Georgia, including the death of a 34-year-old nurse and mother of two who was killed in a hit-and-run incident. And this screenshot is of the intersection in Midtown where this fatal collision took place. In injury epidemiology, we often use the injury iceberg or injury pyramid to represent injuries and fatalities and their respective data sources. Deaths are represented as the tip of the iceberg because these events are the rarest, although the most severe. The levels below deaths are wider because more people are affected by non-fatal injuries. And just below deaths are disabling injuries, such as trauma activations and hospital, administration, hospital admissions. Below that level are medically attended injuries that do not result in hospitalization or hospital transfer. These include emergency department visits, emergency medical service transports, et cetera. Um, in general, the NICE data that was mentioned earlier falls into this category. Below that are minor and my medically unattended injuries, and these occur include urgent care and other outpatient visits, as well as injuries that are treated in the home. At the bottom of the pyramid are near injury events. These events are typically the most common events, but often are the least likely to be documented. 
We obtain information about these events from observational studies, surveys, self-reports, etc. It's important to note that few of these levels are completely independent. Um, for example, a person can be transported via EMS to the emergency department where they is, are subse subsequently admitted and later die from complications related to their injuries. So I'll start at the tip of the iceberg. At HSRC, we are keeping a running list of e-scooter fatalities that are reported in the media. Um, as of August 1st, 2020, we have extracted information from 24 e US e-scooter fatalities as well as several more fatalities from around the globe. And uh, to date, we have not been tracking any deaths related to other micro-ability devices. However, considering recent fatalities involving e-bike and moped ride shares in Chicago and New York City, respectively, we may um, expand our project scope in the future. So what we have learned um, so far from the 24 e-scooter fatalities um, is that 80% involved motor vehicles. And this picture is very different um, from e-scooter involved non-fatal injuries in which the overwhelming majority are due to falls or from striking against stationary objects. Since we know the number of e-scooter fatalities, we can compare the, these counts to other modes of travel. In 2018, for example, there were four US e-scooter fatalities involving ride shares, 857 bicyclist fatalities, 6,227 pedestrian fatalities, and 22,891 passenger vehicle occupant fatalities. However, as you're probably aware, counts are not the best comparisons because they don't account for the differing levels of exposure. And while we have national estimates of exposure data for e-scooter riders as well as motor vehicle occupants, our national exposure data for bicyclists and pedestrians, the modes of travel most suitable for comparison to e-scooters are lacking. I am involved in a new project BTSCRP10, along with Dr. Chris Cherry, whom you'll hear more from later, in which we are planning to better contextualize e-scooter injuries and deaths by comparing them to other modes of active travel. Currently, we can obtain information describing e-scooter fatalities using data gathered from media reports, medical examiner and coroner reports, death certificates, and crash reports. To date, there is no real national surveillance system in place. While NHTSA's fatality analysis reporting system are or also known as FARS, is often used for studying fatal transportation events. It has several limitations regarding e-scooter mortality surveillance. For one, FARS only includes records or for fatal events involving motor vehicles on public traffic ways. Therefore, FARS would not have any records for the 20% or so of e-scooter fatalities that do not involve motor vehicles. Second, FARS data are not particularly timely. Third, until recently, FARS did not contain a specific code for e-scooter fatalities, making them difficult to identify in the system. Uh, I will have been informed that e-scooter fatalities will be coded separately in future editions of FARS. For the last two years, FARS has cat categorized e-scooter deaths under deaths of persons on personal conveyances, which is a very broad category. FARS is just one of several data sources that have struggled with classifying adverse health outcomes related to e-scooters and other microbial devices. And I'll return to this problem later. So moving on from fatalities, I'll now discuss uh, non-fatal e-scooter injuries. As part of our BTSRP 10 project, we are building an inventory of e-scooter related epidemiologic studies, as well as other literature that pertains to e-scooter safety. And we are posting many of these resources on our Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center website. I'm not going to spend too much on this slide because we've already had a wonderful overview of the NICE data and how it's used for e-scooter injury surveillance. Um, but it's important to note that um, that um, like since 2014 and 2018, there was a 222% increase in the population-based rate of e-scooter injuries. And um, in this study by Namiri et al., such a large increase of rate is not particularly surprising considering it went from zero e-scooter ride shares in 2016 to a handful of ride shares in 2017 to more than 100 e-scooter ride shares in 2018. It should also be noted that the case definition that was used was not exclusive to standing e-scooters used in ride shares and likely contained injuries related to other types of scooter-like devices. As mentioned earlier regarding the fatality data, this problem with case definitions is really common at the moment and one that the CPSC as well as other data sources are in the process of rectifying. 
And um, the old nice code for dockless ride share scooters was under code 5042. And in the future, um, dockless ride share scooters will be under code 5022. Because of the challenges associated with national data sources, most studies have been performed at the community or hospital level. And this slide displays some of the results from the first three e-scooter descriptive epidemiologic studies um, that were performed and were based in Santa Monica, California, Austin, Texas, and Portland, Oregon. From these three studies, as well as numerous studies that have been published since then, there have been some general trends, um, despite differing studying locations, East Coast versus West Coast versus South, differing geographies, hilly versus flat terrain, different study settings, hospital versus urgent care clinics, and differing study methodologies. Uh, in injury surveillance studies using a hospital administrations, the hospital administration data versus data studies that used data abstracted from the electronic medical record. As an example of this convergence, um, we see that three very different studies with very different um, approaches all determined a medically attended e-scooter injury rate of approximately 20 injuries per 100,000 e-scooter miles traveled. Other trends that have emerged from the literature um, include that most e-scooter riders with medically attended injuries are male, are working age adults, are injured on sidewalks as opposed to on street, are injured due to a fall or collision with non-moving objects, although many riders with severe and fatal injuries are injured due to motor vehicle crashes, are injured during the daytime, although many riders with the severe or fatal injuries are injured at night, are not impaired, but impairment is more common among riders with severe or fatal injuries, are not wearing helmets at the time of injury, are likely to have a head injury and or a fracture, and are somewhat likely to be admitted to the hospital. Similar to, similar to death and NICE data, many researchers, researchers have struggled to identify e-scooter related injuries, including myself. Um, hospital data typically contains ICD-10 CM codes that can be used to identify mechanisms of injury. Unfortunately, ICD-10 CM does not contain a code specific to e-scooter related injuries. Therefore, many of the e-scooter epidemiologic studies have had to pre perform rather laborious, non-standardized keyword-based searches to identify injuries related to these devices. This rather simplistic example of health data demonstrates why. All three of these emergency department visits involved scooters of some sort. Two involved e-scooters and one involved a mobility or rover scooter. One of the true positive cases contained an ICD-10 CM code for a fall from a mobil mobility scooter. The other true positive contained a code for a motorcycle crash. The false positive contained a code for, for, for a fall from a mobility scooter, the same code that was used to indicate one of the true positive cases. In order to address ICD-10 CM coding issues, our UNC HSRC team developed a poster providing guidance for clinicians and medical coders to flag e-scooter and other micromobility related injuries. We worked with our North Carolina Division of Public Health and our North Carolina Trauma Registry to create this poster. We then distributed it to more than 1,500 individuals and organizations within North Carolina, as well as individuals from, from numerous other states and one other country. You can view a copy of this poster on our CS, CRS website. Meanwhile, we worked with a 50 plus member group called the E-Scooter Injury Surveillance Work Group to develop a proposal to the National Center for Health Statistics to add e-scooter and other micromobility specific ICD-10 CM codes. The good news is that our proposal was accepted with minimal revisions and these codes will go into effect on October 1st, 2020. A copy of these codes are posted on the NCH's, NCHS's website. In addition, we will be developing a new poster highlighting these codes that we will post on our CSERS website. The bad news is that we also introduced a case definition for e-bicycle codes that was not accepted by the NCHS. I know that several of my e-scooter injury surveillance work group colleagues are interested in developing a new ICD-10 CM proposal for e-bicycles, but since many of these individuals work in public health, COVID-19 has delayed these plans. If anyone is attending, attending this forum is interested in revisiting this, this proposal, please let me know. Although I should add, I don't have attention, uh, any intention of leading this effort in the future. I'd rather be a supporting player on this one. So why are micromobility injury surveillance and other safety studies important? Well, the reason is that cities and states are implementing policies and procedures with limited understanding of the pro problem and limited capacity to evaluate the safety effects of their actions, including 
the implementation of curfews, geofencing, requiring helmets, restricting ridership to sidewalk and traffic and or traffic ways, and sidewalk or traffic ways, and enforcement measures. And to conclude, UNCHSRC, under the leadership of Dr. Lara Sant, is leading a multi-organizational team, including project team member Dr. Chris Cherry from the University of Tennessee, to better understand e-scooter safety issues. While this project has several research aims and objectives, research aim number two is to characterize the relationship between e-scooter crashes, injuries, fatalities, and contributing factors, both behavioral and environmental. And at the conclusion of this project, and a bit more of a year's time, we should have a better understanding of some of these safety issues relating to e-scooters. And that's it. Thank you so much for that presentation, Katie. Um, we are going to go ahead and roll into questions. We had a few come in, so I'll invite Katie to unmute as well as Malka and Jane. So the first question comes for both presentations. Um, do any of the speakers think that there are data gaps or opportunities for using different data sources that could provide a more robust view of microbility safety issues? Well, this is Katie. I, I guess I, I'll go first. Um, yes, the, the answer is that you know, no one data source provides all the answers that we need. And so by looking at different data sources, we can have a more full, a fuller understanding of the problem. A good example is I um, often use emergency department visit data as well as trauma registry data for some of my projects. And while emergency department visit data gives you a more complete picture of injuries within a certain geography, um, trauma registry data, although limited to more severe injuries, um, gives you a much more in-depth look. And then other data sources are needed to say if you want to calculate exposure-based rates. For example, you need both the numerator data, the number of injuries, and the denominator data, which is the number of trips, miles traveled, etc. Great, thank you, Katie. Katie, I have another question for you um, that came in since I have since we have you unmuted. Um, you indicated that most e-scooter injuries involve sidewalks rather than streets. Do you recall any information relating to micromobility devices injuries on street intersections? I actually I don't know the answer to that question off the top of my head. I'll have to. What I can do is I can um, get back to you later. But that's a great question. Thanks yeah, for asking. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Great. <coughs> Hello, this is James from uh, CPSC. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you, James. Yeah, okay. All right. So we had a question uh, for uh, 140 IDIs. Uh, what is the source of the names of those interviews and stuff? So uh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know top of my head uh, at the moment. So this I need to get back to uh, in the future. Thanks, James. And James, is there, we had a question come in that, um, just to read it so the audience knows, for the 140 IDIs, what was the source of the names of those interviewed? Um, reports, newspapers, lawsuits. So that is what James was referring to. Yeah. Another question for Malka and James from the EPI department. Um, you referenced, I talked about it a little bit and I can answer this as well, but there was a link where others can query this data. Um, can you speak a little bit more about this process for those who are interested in reading this data themselves? Uh, Malka, are you able to answer that? Yes, I can answer that question. Okay, so if you would like to go, you could just go to Nice, Cor uh, nice Coriana website. And you could go as a researcher or as an individual and decide how you want to look at it. You could pick any product that you like to look at, say you want to look at injuries involving uh, regular sk regular skateboards, not just powered skateboards. So you could pick that product and then you could pick the years where you want to see, say you want to see 2015, 2019, you could look at that. 
and then you could download that data in an Excel spreadsheet and use it however you want. You also could choose the age range you want to look at as well as the outcomes. So you really could design it for however much you want, where, how, whatever specificity you want or, or as how general you want. In addition, you could request it from us. Great, thank you, Malka. Katie, another question has come in for you. Is there a generic form of the injury pyramid distribution that can be applied to consumer products in general to estimate underreporting? Oh, that's a very that's a very good question. Um, I know that the that those ratios have been calculated for specific injury types and but for specific injury mechanism types not for micro mobility devices as far as as far as i know and not in general and not in general injury overall um because the distribution can can vary quite a, quite a bit depending on the lethality of the mechanism so for example if you're dealing with say something like like poisonings that involve like drugs oftentimes it's a much uh, narrower pyramid because the base isn't as large as it would be for say um sports injuries um, so it really is, it is injury mechanism specific. Thank you. We had another comment about the um, incidents on sidewalks. So it says the incident, the insight about incidents on sidewalks was interesting. Do we have a way to understand where scooters are using bike lanes? Are crashes occurring mostly at conflict points such as intersection and crosswalks? So as you mentioned, that's definitely something that um, we can look into and when you have chances. Yeah, I'll look into it. I also um, got a notice from my colleague, uh, Dr. Chris Cherry, and he's actually going to address some of those questions in his presentation. Okay, and I'm gonna, I have one more question um, that we'll get to. We, we have actually a lot of questions come in, but unfortunately we are trying to get back on the timeline. So I have one more that we'll share. Um, are shared systems like Bird, Lyft, and other better sources of data that private that privately owned e-scooters could they be safer too? Um, are shared systems like Bird, Lyft, and others better sources of data that privately owned e-scooters could they be safer too? That's the. I'm not sure if I completely understand the question. Um, the data could be safer. Um, do you mind repeating it one more time yeah. for me? So I think these go together. Which data databases would be which databases would be best sources for injury data like e-bikes? Are systems like Bird, Lyft, and others better sources of data? Ah, uh, okay. So um, your your ride shares are, are your best sources for exposure data. Okay. And those um or those companies are often sharing data with um local cities. It's often built into their agreements with those cities. Um, I know that that some of the ride shares are collecting injury reports from users, um, but those are self reports, and people have to voluntarily like they have to choose to report their injuries to those um, organizations. And so I would say that healthcare data sources are probably a better indication of medically attended injuries, which tend to be a little bit more severe. Um, with, you know, it obviously, ideally, you would have injury data from all levels of, of severity. So everything from outpatient clinics, urgent care to emergency department, hospital, etc. That's often not possible in many cities. Um, but I would rely on those sources first. And also because those sources are just gonna have better information about the injuries themselves, um, like the location, nature, severity, procedures done, et cetera. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, um, Katie and Malka and James for these presentations. That was a great way to start our day. Um, we are going to now transition into our 15 minute break and I'm gonna pass it back to Lawrence um, for directions on this. Thank you again, everybody. So. Our first presentation is Standards in the World of New Mobility by Dr. Chris Cherry, John McArthur, and Dr. Ryan Yee. Chris is a professor in civil engineering at the University of Tennessee. He is the chair of the SAE 
Powered Micromobility Vehicles Committee. She has conducted transportation system research on e-bikes, scooters, and other micromobility for the past 15 years. John is a research associate in the Transportation Research and Education Center at Portland State University, where he leads a robust micromobility research portfolio. He is the vice chair of the SAE Powered Micromobility Vehicles Committee and the document sponsor of SAE Standard J3194. Brian leads vehicle compliance at BERG and is the document sponsor for SAE J3230. Previously, he was with Lyft's Level 5 Self Driving Division in a safety and compliance role, and prior to that, an engineering consultant with Exxon. Thank you all for being here, and I will now give Chris sharing. I'm muted. There we go. Now I'm not. Here you. Here we are. Uh, slideshow. I think I'm up. Okay. So I, I hope everybody can see and hear uh, my slides. I, as mentioned, I'm Chris Cherry. I'm a professor in civil engineering and and going to kick off this section on standards for the new world of mobility. Okay. Um, here's uh, how the speakers are going to go. Uh, I'll be giving an introduction to the work that we're doing and hand the mic off to John MacArthur in about four or five minutes, who will talk about our first standard that came out of SAE, uh, J30, SAE's micromobility group, SAE J3194, a, ta a taxonomy standard. And then we'll pass to Ryan E, uh, who will talk about 31, 3230, which is our kinematics, basically braking, acceleration, and speed standard. Uh, I want to acknowledge while I'm here that Annie Chang was, uh, throughout all of this process up to very recently, uh, the SAE staff member who drove a lot of this forward, and she moved on to a micromobility company, uh, Lime, and so um, she has a lot of credit in this process, okay? So first of all, uh, we'll talk about standards, and, and we're going to talk about standards for the next uh, few presentations, of course, but this is a, a agreed away upon way of doing things. If there's one thing we've learned is that uh, we've had a hard time even defining what a scooter was. We heard that in the last several uh, presentations and and if we can't understand how uh, the, the terminology uh, and how we're going to measure things then it's very difficult to uh, come up with any any way to manage or regulate or even measure uh, things that we are interested in measuring like safety so what we've done the, the idea here is uh, working with under SAE uh, as SAE I should say uh, we're trying to enhance this safety. We're trying to create this common language that we can use across operators, across jurisdictions, across uh, ac ac academic domains or uh, safety or epidemiology or whatever, and uh, permit common interfaces that we can use, promote uniform testing and performance. And all of this is to essentially harmonize uh, the market, the industry, so that we all are uh, at least going in the same direction. Our SAE Powered Micromobility Vehicles Committee is uh, one uh, committee at SAE that is in this emerging area of uh, shared mobility, of new mobility, and we spent a bit of time right when we started trying to figure out what our name was going to be and what our scope was going to be. So uh, we brought together a lot of uh, experts from around the industry, around academia. Uh, you can see some of them here. And uh, really got to thinking about how we're going to uh, define, for example, the key features of a scooter, of a hoverboard, and, and so on. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, if you want to try to kind of think of scope keywords, that's the best way I, I can remember what we're talking about. 
We're talking about powered micromobility in this committee, uh, not, uh, you could say human powered, but actually electrical or gasoline or other in combustion powered. Uh, they have to be low speed, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. They have to be lightweight. And for now, we're talking about personal ground transportation. We're not talking about freight. We're not talking about delivery drones. Uh, we can expand our scope into that area once we get our arms around uh, personal ground transportation. But um, th those are sort of the four keywords that dictate where we're going with this. So there's this big area of vehicles, a big class of vehicles that are um, what we'd call powered micromobility vehicles. Uh, our scope includes all the vehicles that fall into this yellow box. And this yellow box generally is under 30 miles per hour. This is where you enter into different NHTSA designations for vehicles and FMVSS designations. And then uh, the, the real challenge was 500 pounds trying to land on a number that was meaningful and not arbitrary. Uh, and some people would say that's not very micro. Other people would say that's not micro enough. Uh, but the idea here is we still have this uh, this size uh, envelope that we're and speed envelope, which ultimately leads to like kinematic energy and so on. So we're not low speed cars that are much heavier, and we're not passenger vehicles which are both heavier and faster. So with that, I'm going to pass over to John. He can tell me when to advance the slides, and we'll talk about our first uh, our first standard. Hey, thanks, Chris. Uh, can you put it back one slide? Yep. Yeah, and I just want to add here. So, uh, hi, I'm John. It, it sounds like everybody can hear me okay, if Chris could. Um, and I'm the document sponsor for J3194. This is the taxonomy and classification of powered micromobility vehicles. And uh, as Chris said, uh, you know, our uh, charge of the committee was to uh, start the process of both defining uh, what these vehicles are, but then uh, to start creating standards uh, for the industry and uh, the industry in general as being the, the OEMs uh, that are creating the uh, vehicles, but also the people that are using them that are creating policies around them. And so we really felt because of a lot of, I guess, um, confusion or or uh, broad use of terms related to these uh, these uh, devices um, that are used all over the place. Um, we felt that we wanted to do a taxonomy and classification of what we're looking at. So this box it was created to kind of help us to find where we're going to go with uh, uh, with this um, standard and what we're not going to uh, focus on for this first part of the standard. And Chris kind of talked about it's really a weight and speed classifications, but it was also what uh, devices are out there already and what are being regulated within this space. So um, top speed was kind of, you know, really pushed on the e-bike side of things, also a little bit on on what you would traditionally call a scooter or like a Vespa type of device that kind of was low speed, but also the curb weight of 500 uh, pounds, which is really kind of like, you know, we were kind of looking for justifications for this, but it's kind of three times the weight of a average male, but also what we were seeing within the, the landscape of devices out there. So, um, and then one thing, you know, Chris did mention that we're, this was not freight vehicles, and they were really for personal passenger use, but they're also primarily for on-road purposes. Uh, Chris, you can uh, move it on to the next slide. So the uh, committee, which uh, Chris showed you a bunch of their uh, names and um, the logos up there, but really was a, a, a nice mix of, of industry uh, and city and policy, nonprofit groups kind of uh, working together to kind of classify uh, uh, these devices. So we came up with six types, and, and I'll go into that, and then four classifications that we use to classify these types, and those were speed, weight, power source, and width. Uh, next slide. So these are the, um, the types of vehicles that we um, kind of came up with. And you notice that uh, they are uh, powered bicycles, 
power, powered standing scooters, powered seated scooters, powered self-balancing boards. And I noticed there was a use of the term hoverboard before. We chose not to use that term because there's a trademark with that term. So we wanted to provide terms that are generic and uh, easily used within the industry without you know, trademark infringement or, or other things. Uh, Self-balancing uh, boards, this would be what some people would consider a skateboard, uh, and powered skates. Um, now, one thing that is uh, key here is that all these are powered devices. We obviously have skateboards, uh, you know, that are non-powered and uh, even, you know, standing scooters that are non-powered. So we're looking at ones that have a powered element to them. And we were able to kind of use these five components of, uh, you know, uh, center column seats, operative pedals, floorboard, uh, and self-balancing as a way to distinguish between these six types. Next slide. So then we went about uh, uh, devising these kind of ideas of classification. So how do we classify these devices and uh, with a, a naming device to kind of determine how these devices or, or vehicles are different from each other? And we use uh, weight, vehicle width, top speed, and power source. So in most cases, you know, uh, I think people have been talking about electric, uh, for power source, but we didn't want to exclude a, a, another type of uh, engine um, that could be put on these, like typically a gas-powered uh, device. But as you can see, we kind of um, had a top weight of, of 500 pounds, and then we had some uh, classifications types within those. Vehicles with, um, we kind of felt this was important uh, because of how devices if they became you know larger than what you would think of a typical scooter you know like uh, three feet uh you know that a city may want to differentiate between them to kind of say where they are uh able to use or or how they should be used and then obviously top speed was a big issue so to the uh to the right of the slide is uh, i think a good way of uh showing how we would use the classification uh you can see there's a standing powered standing scooter, uh, and uh, if in this case it is 40 pounds, two feet wide, uh, it top speed is 18 miles per hour uh, in electric. So we would you know, call that an ultra light weight, uh, standard weight, standard width, low speed electric standing scooter, a mouthful. Uh, we recognize that, you know, that's probably not how the person is going to be describing their their vehicle to some other friend, hey, this is what I'm riding right now. But it's a way in which I think the industry, but also policymakers can differentiate these devices uh, from one another. And so uh, the other example is what uh, people would traditionally consider a seated scooter uh, that has you know, 190 pounds, uh, two feet wide, goes about 30 miles an hour. And that would be a mid-weight standard uh, with Mid, mid speed electric seated scooter. So I think that's um, kind of uh, a good summation of where we got with the, the standard. And I will move on to Ryan to talk about our next uh, standard that we're working on now. And just to note, this standard is available. Uh, you can go and get it uh, from SAE right now and it's uh, freely available. So uh, you can read all about it there, okay? Go ahead, Ryan. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so uh, Ryan Yee here. I'm the uh, document sponsor for J3230, uh, which is an emerging standard around uh, kinematic performance metrics for powered micromobility vehicles. Uh, so jumping right in, uh, jumping right in here, uh, the rationale behind J3230 is to one provide uh, practicable vehicle level performance based metrics. Uh, two, provide test methods and conditions, and three, ultimately provide meaningful metrics for industry, consumers, and public agencies to evaluate safety and performance. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the development of the standard really is currently largely focused around test procedures and metrics for top speed, acceleration, and deceleration slash braking. And 
as you'd expect in such a standard consideration has been given to things like initial vehicle conditions. So things like upper bounds on accumulated mileage of the vehicle being tested, tire, consider, uh, tire condition, as well as things like battery state of charge. Um, in addition, we've thought through as a committee things like operator anthropometry and positioning on the vehicle when testing, as both these criteria are expected to have an impact on performance that's measured during the testing. And also important for repeatable measurements, there's been a, a good discussion around environmental conditions, as well as test track conditions, um, as, as well as conditions that would consider performance on an incline as uh, these can be quite important from a safety perspective. Now, in terms of timeline, uh, we're expecting that we'll be able to finalize and publish J3230 by the end of this year. Um, we're working on getting comments on the current draft by the uh, committee this month. Um, and of course, in addition, um, here I'd like to, to recognize other committee members who uh, have participated in this work and draw from their experience and their roles at Lime, Lyft, and a few other organizations that um, have really contributed to this work thus far. Um, next slide, please. Finally, uh, to give folks a sense of, of how we've been thinking about things, I thought it might be helpful to describe uh, some of the test scenarios being considered as well. Uh, so currently for, for D-cell or for braking, uh, there's really three scenarios, as you'd expect. The first one is around uh, nominal braking for performance, where all brakes present on the vehicle are uh, intended to function as expected. Uh, we have a second scenario here that addresses brake uh, redundancy. So uh, what happens if one brake potentially fails? What does uh, braking performance look like then? And finally, um, deceleration around geofence boundaries. Um, so is there any potential operator instability that could be introduced around these boundary conditions? Uh, so that's it for, for J3230 here. Um, uh, looking forward to um, getting all the comments, like I said, in this month uh, so that we could move forward with uh, a committee vote on, on this work and hopefully get this um, published by the end of the year. Okay, thank you, uh, Ryan. This is back back to Chris. That's it for our, our SAE uh, uh, presentation, and, and we look forward to comments and questions from the audience. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, John. And thank you, Ryan. All right. Up next, we have Diana Pappas Jordan, and I will grab her screen real quick. Lawrence, this is Diana. You're going to load the slides, correct? Yep, I'm loading them up for you right now. Okay, One great. Second. So that's good. You can hear me. Okay, hold on. Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. So I'll introduce you real quick. So okay. Diana is a standards program manager in the UL Standards Division and has been with UL for over 30 years. Diana graduated from the Illinois Institute of Technology with a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering. She has held various positions at UL, including the Conformity Assessment Area as well as Standards. Diana is currently responsible for the UL Standards Technical Panels for batteries, e-mobility devices, e-scooters, e-bikes, drones, alternative energy, and other products. Thank you for joining us today, Diana. Good, thank you, Lawrence. Well, good morning, everybody. As Lawrence said, I'm a standards program manager for Underwriters Laboratories, and I'm here today to talk to you about the UL standards for e-mobility products. And next slide. Uh, so first, let's talk about UL standards just quickly at a glance. We have over 400 UL STPs. That stands for our standards technical panels. I'll be talking a lot about our STPs throughout the presentation. We have over 1,600 standards published at UL. 
We've been developing standards for over 120 years. I think as uh, long as UL has been in existence, we have been developing standards. Over 30 countries are represented on our STPs and committees. We have dedicated standards professionals around the world, and we have over 4,000 volu unique volunteers on our standards committees. So we have it's quite a, uh, quite a group of people that help us develop our standards. Okay, next slide. A little bit more about our standards development. Uh, we support public-private partnerships, platforms. We collaborate with other SDOs. Um, when we develop a standard or we revise our standard, we want to make sure that those requirements are based upon research and they're science-based. So we do testing in our labs at times, you know, other manufacturers perform tests. So we want to make sure that there's data behind a lot of our safety requirements that are in our standard. A couple years ago, we have a new feature for standards. We now offer free online view of our UL standards. Um, on the bottom left there, we want to make sure that we respond to market demands in short development time as quickly as possible, especially when there are critical safety issues. We want to try and turn around the safety requirements as quickly as we can to help the industry. Um, we also promote um, and we collaborate with IEC and ISO. We have some standards that we have harmonized and adopted with IEC and ISO. We sit on some of the IEC and ISO committees, and a lot of the people on those committees are also on our standards committees. And lastly, we support national and regional adoption of our UL standards globally. Next slide. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about our process. So we have a consensus process. Our process is accredited by both ANSI and SCC. So ANSI is the American National Standards Institute. They're the accredited body for the United States. So if a standard is designated as ANSI, that means that it is the national standard for the United States. Um, in Canada, there's SCC, which is the Standards Council for Canada. They're the accredited body, accreditation, um, the accredited SDOs in Canada. So if a standard is designated as SCC or CAN, that means it is the national standard for Canada. Um, our standards are developed with through our STPs. Again, we'll be talking, you'll hear, hear me talking a lot about our STPs throughout this presentation. There is no cost to join our committees or STPs. It's all volunteers, so we have no membership fees. And also our procedures align with the WTO TBT agreement with respect to consensus, openness, transparency, and due process. In the bottom right there, there's a link to our accredited procedures in case if anyone would like to know more information about that. Next slide. Okay, uh, next, now let's talk about our standards uh, process, how we develop our safety standards. So we collaborate with our industry, with industry to develop our standards. We have STPs, again, we've talked about that, which are our standards technical panels. They're really a central part of our standards process. They're the heart of how we develop our standards. Um, we collaborate with industry. The STP serve as the consensus body for developing, reviewing, and maintaining our standards. So the STPs, that is our voting body. So if you're an STP member, you're able to vote on our standards. Um, our STPs are made of a balanced group of individuals. I'll be talking a little bit more about the makeup and the structure of our STPs in a minute. Participation on our standards development is open to anybody. So we have an open process and we encourage everyone to participate. So even if you're not an STP member, you can still submit comments, you can attend STP meetings, you can be part of working groups, you can ask that a standard be revised. Really the only difference is that a non-STP member unfortunately would not be able to vote. Um, proposals can be submitted at any time. We have an online system called CSDS, which stands for Collaborative Standards Development System. It's accessible 24 seven. So if someone is reading a UL standard and maybe there's a gap or maybe something isn't clear or more information is needed or we need to address new technology, you can submit a new proposal in CSDS and that will move forward to the standards uh, STP in the future. Um, again, it's accessible for anybody. CSDS is also the system where all of our proposals are um, posted to, so that's where all commenting is done, voting is done, our STP meetings are posted, um, and everything is open, everything is transparent, so anyone can see what's posted, um, you know, what comments are received, how people vote, uh, things like that. Next slide. So now let's look at the structure of our STPs. So at the top, you'll see there's a UL staff who's the STP chair, 
Um, I'm the STP chair for all of the e-mobility, the micro-mobility products. There's also a standards project manager who will work very closely with me and the STP. Along the bottom, you'll see the nine interest categories. So when someone applies to an STP, they would have to designate one of these categories. So, you know, the producer, supply chain, commercial industrial interest, and so on. Um, the goal is for these, for one group, not to be over one third. We need to keep our STP balanced. Um, however, keep in mind that if there, if it's not everyone has to be represented. So for instance, if it's not a consumer product, we would not expect there would be a consumer on that STP. Um, due to balance, we might have to limit our membership. So if someone applies and the balance does not allow us to add them, we would place them on a pending list. And then at such time when the membership changes, you know, people change jobs or, you know, they retire, we look to the pending list to see if we can add additional uh, members to our STP. We also need to limit our STP membership to one person per company. That doesn't mean that multiple people for the same company can't participate. It really means that only one person per company can be a voting member. So other people from your company, we would encourage them to participate. They still can participate, but they just would not be able to be a voting member. Uh, next slide. Oops, okay, so let's talk about hoverboards now. So you can go to the next slide. Okay, so hoverboards. Uh, hoverboards were uh, pretty much the holiday craze for uh, the 2015 uh, holiday season. Um, unfortunately, though, after those were a lot of holiday gifts, uh, we saw some incidents. You know, there were some fires, there were a lot of the battery charging, things like that. So there are obviously concerns from consumer groups, CPSC, retailers, even UL. We wanted to look at, you know, into the safety issues around the batteries. So we quickly developed a set of requirements that was published in January 2016 to address a lot of those safety issues. Next slide. So the next slide shows a lot of what our response was with respect to hoverboards. We formed a technical team. We looked at a lot of the issues and incident reports that was happening. Uh, we developed a draft uh, standard. We published an outline. Um, we held STP meetings. We had formed the STP. There were some recalls. Um, we achieved consensus on our standard. Uh, Singapore had adopted our standard. And we also collaborated with ASTM and CPSC to hold a workshop in China. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple slides. Okay, next slide. So STP 2272 is the STP for hoverboards. There are currently 33 voting members on that STP. STP 2272 is responsible for UL 2272, which is the standard for electrical systems for personal e-mobility devices. And it's also important to note that 2272 is the standard for both the United States and Canada. So what does 2272 cover? So the scope is really it covers the electrical safety. And when we talk about electrical safety, we're really talking predominantly about the fire and electrical shock hazards. So it covers the electrical safety of the electrical system for e-mobility devices. So 2272 takes a system approach. So it's not just the batteries. So if you look at that, it's the battery, the charger, the motors, the controls and the wiring. So it is a system approach to the e-mobility products. Um, and some examples, you know, 2272, the initial focus was hoverboards, but it does cover more than just hoverboards. It covers electric skateboards, skates, electric scooters, electric personal transporters and electric unit Next slide. So here's the timeline of 2272, how it was developed. So we published the first set of requirements in January 2016, again, just shortly after the 2015 holiday season. Then we set, we published another set of requirements in April 2016. And then we worked, we continued to work with the STP and we published the first edition consensus standard in November 2016. That standard again is the standard for the United States and Canada. Uh, those of you that work on a lot of standards committees, you're probably aware it typically takes many, many years to develop a standard. So in this case, you can see that a UL standard was published in less than one year. So that was, you know, almost record time. It was very aggressive. So there was really a great collaboration with the industry uh, on this standard to develop the standard, uh, really to address the safety concerns that we saw out in the industry. So that was uh, really great. The next standard. Or I'm sorry, next slide. Thank you. Um, so, you know, UL standards, they complement other standards that are developed by other SDOs such as ASTM. So I have a few uh, ASTM standards listed here. I believe ASTM is going to have a presentation after, after me. 
Um, you know, our standards, the UL standards typically cover electrical safety, but there are other standards that exist in the industry that could cover other scopes, you know, other performance issues, things like that. We do our best to try not to overlap with other standards developers. So we want to have a very collaborative, um, you know, relationship with these other standards developers. But we also want to be aware of, you know, other activities, the other standards activities. You know, many stakeholders are on our committees, um, are also on other committees. So it's, a, you know, a lot of people that are on the same standards committees working together. Okay, next slide. So let's talk a little about uh, the, the um, workshop that we had in China. So a lot of these products are manufactured in China. It's important, so we felt it was very important to collaborate with um, China to discuss these safety issues. So in 2016, we partnered with CPSC and ASTM um, to have a workshop there. Uh, since then, we've signed an MOU with SAC, which is the Standardization Administration of China. We signed an MOU in 2018 to agree to establish common requirements for hoverboards. Um, this MOU also laid out um, the framework for forming a working group, a joint working group. That joint working group has the goal to harmonize the requirements between US and China. And they will identify the differences and the goal is to really to reduce those differences. Uh, once those standards are more closely aligned, the US and China will work together to develop a joint proposal to the IEC as appropriate. Uh, next slide. So let's look at e-bikes. Uh, next slide. So e-bikes e is under STP 2849. It's comprised of 21 voting members. UL 24849 is the standard for the electrical systems for e-bikes, and it is also a national standard for both the US and Canada. So the scope of UL 2849, it covers the electrical system of e-bikes powered by a lithium-based rechargeable battery. So again, just like 2272, it is also a system approach for safety. And 2272, or I'm sorry, 2849, it includes electrically powered e-packs e and non-pedal assist e-bikes. Next slide. So here's the timeline for 2849. This is probably a more traditional timeline that you'll see. The first issue outline was published in 2013. Then the next set of requirements was published in 2014. And then we published the third set of requirements in November 2016. If you look, uh, that date is very close to the date where the hoverboard standard or the 2272 standard was published. And we pretty much changed this. We published this third set of requirements really because of batteries. We had a lot of lessons learned um, about the battery requirements for 2272. And we wanted to make sure that the e-bike standard had really the same level of rigor and safety requirements for e-bikes. So that's why we uh, published a new set of requirements in November 2016. Um, after that, we continued to work with the industry. And then we published the first edition standard 2849 in January 2020. So earlier, right at the beginning of this year. That is also a standard for both the United States and Canada. Next slide. Okay, so other related standards. So there are other uh, related standards for e-bikes. There's a CFR, there's an EN standard, and there's an ISO standard. Um, again, just a few examples here. Um, again, it's important to be aware of other standards activities. Uh, we want to continue to, coll to collaborate with other standards developers. As I said before, a lot of people that are on some of these committees are probably on our committees and vice versa. So, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we continue to work together with the industry you know, to promote the safety of these products. Um, next slide. So really later today, uh, there's going to be another UL colleague talking later that he's going to be providing more technical details on the standards requirements for e-mobility products. So he's going to go into the standard, the technical requirements in more detail. But hopefully today I was able to provide you with a good overview of the standards process and the development of the e-mobility standards for UL. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. Okay, up next, we have Dr. Robert Whittlesey, and he will be giving us an update on the ACM Safety Standards Task Group for e-scooters. Robert is a program manager at BIRD in vehicle engineering, where the next generation of scooters are designed and tested. 
He previously worked as a consultant for six years at Exponent, aiding companies from a wide range of industries such as renewable energy, theme parks, and micromobility. He received his PhD and MS from the California Institute of Technology. Thanks for presenting today, Rob. There we go. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Lawrence, for the kind introduction. Um, happy to be here today to uh, share with you all about the work that's going on in our ASTM task group. Um, so, uh, again, as noted, I, I work for BIRD, um, but I am uh, the task group chair for this ASTM task group that's um, focusing on uh, powered scooters. So I just want to give a little bit of safety and context. I think that it seems like a lot of this material has been parodied by others in this um, in this session. Um, but so safety and standards. So standards help industries, you know, by giving a consistently safe uh, products, you know, so that that way everyone in the industry is delivering products that are um, uh, safe enough for all to use, or at least all that it's intended for. Um, and it ultimately, this helps elevate the industry and ensure that customers always have a safe experience, um, regardless of what manufacturer or what product they're actually using. Um, and I think it's interesting though, because there was this study on safe micromobility by the International Transport Forum that showed the ER visit risk is somewhere for bikes and scooters. Um, but I think as an industry, like the question is like, can we do better? Can we do better than that and make these, the, the safest mode of transportation possible? Um, and uh, hopefully we can. Um, but with respect to the ASTM, uh, just so everyone's aware, the ASTM, uh, much like we have a little intro on SAE, a little intro on UL, um, ASTM International is formed known as the American Society for Testing and Materials. Um, they're a very old organization, um, and they currently issue about 13,000 or more standards. Um, they're built by all sorts of volunteers around the world, um, and much like with these other organizations that are presented today, anyone can join a committee. You can um, uh, get involved and share your thoughts and uh, critique or, or uh, contribute to all sorts of different standards across a wide range. You know, um, ASTM doesn't cover just micromobility. They do everything from metal alloys, cement, leather, plastic, cannabis, forensic science, nanotechnology, and everything. You know, it's a quite a wide range. Um, and all of their standards that, that are developed follow a process. And, and this is what I think helps make sure that the standard, once it's uh, formalized and approved, has um, been given a lot of thought and consideration. Um, so there's a main committee which covers a broad topic, and each main committee has its subcommittees that, that focus in on, on different topics and, and narrow down um, to more specific issues. Um, and just to be absolutely clear, I'm just an AST member. I'm not speaking on behalf of the ASTM, so uh, whatever I say are my own thoughts and ideas <laughs> um, and, um, and through my experiences with them. So to give our task group in context, um, so uh, I am heading the ASTM task group WK70724. Um, it's a really sophisticated name. Um, but really what it is, it's just a, a uh, designation that we give us, uh, that was given to us for our act, specific activity. And this is one that um, Diana actually mentioned in the last presentation referred to. Um, but the way that it works on AS10 is you have the consumer products, which is F15, and that's the main committee, which covers a wide range of consumer products. Um, so you have toys, you have bunk beds, shopping carts, you know, you know, anything that a consumer may interact with. Under that main committee, there's a subcommittee, specifically seven, uh, sorry, F15.58. Um, this covers powered scooters and skateboards. Um, and as we've also seen today, there's a lot of um, complications in the language that we're using um, because scooters can be confused with a mobility scooter or a kick scooter or you know whatever else it may be. Um, so we thank the SAE for, for helping with that taxonomy. Um, but nevertheless, these um, Subcommittee at 1558, you know, uh, was around before that that taxonomy came out, and so they're issuing um, standards F2641 and F2642, which cover recreational powered scooters and pocket bikes. Um, that's for 2641, and then 2642 is specifically the same topic, but on the labeling side. Um, the scope of these are primarily aimed at, uh, I'll say, more like kids' toys. Um, they're aimed for, um, <clears throat> for for younger people, um, not intended for adults, um, and um, kind of low-powered. And so 
as a consequence of the development of this industry, um, the ASTM has started this, this task group, WK70724, um, which is specifically looking at creating a standard for commercial electric powered scooters for adults. Um, doesn't have a number yet. Once we get to that process, it'll get its own number um, like other standards get, um, but we got to first work on our standard and get it into the uh, voting stage. So just give you a little history of, of our task group. Um, so basically in November of last year, so we're coming up on uh, almost a year, but it's it's still less than that. So it's, I think made quite an amount of progress. Um, uh, Bird presents the ASTM um, along with others to advocate for a scooter standard, basically saying that, you know, we need to have something that, that covers um, uh, scooter safety and, and mechanical design. And so Dave Dick of, of Bureau Veritas, he was uh, the initial um, task group chair who was inaugurating the group. And so basically he starts out the discussions by taking a draft of F2641 as just the starting point. You know, a lot of work had gone into that standard and it seemed reasonable to use that as our template, so to speak, for um, creating our own standard. Um, in January of this year, we had our first online meeting. Um, it was over two hours to discuss the standard over WebEx. And subsequently, we, we found out that um, one challenge of, of this um, industry is that these rental vehicles are only deployed in certain markets. So if you live in Los Angeles, you live in Atlanta, you live in, um, you know, Portland, like those are all cities that, that have scooters. And so it's, it's you know, reasonable that you would have access to, to a device and go out and actually use it. Um, but unfortunately, if you live anywhere else in the country, um, there's just not scooters easily that people get familiar with. And so we had a lot of people um, that were interested in this topic, that were interested about, you know, consumer safety, but also um, just had not had a chance to even ride one themselves. And so we had planned a scooter showcase with different uh, manufacturers who were going to come and, and bring their scooters so that the different participants in the work group could have a chance to, you know, take a ride, test it out, see how it feels. Um, but ultimately, uh, that was scheduled in April. Um, it had to get... Uh, canceled um, because of um, we were unable to travel and meet in person. Um, and so since then, there's been this kind of delay, but we're kind of uh, trying to um, rekindle the effort. And so uh, we had another meeting in August, um, just last month. Um, and uh, basically to get the group kind of reacquainted with the standard and just kind of keep moving forward. And so even though um, there will be that uh, lack of familiarity for some people that are involved, um, I think we're still we're trying to get as much as we can done in, uh, since then. And so between January and August, when I took over as chair, because um, Dave Dickey got reassigned in his position at, at Bureau Veritas. Um, and uh, so that's why I hosted this. And we have another one coming up next month. Um, one nice thing, though, about our, our group and, and uh, you know, as others have talked about today, you know, there's always going to be a balance in the voting uh, membership between um, you know, you want to have enough uh, manufacturers and consumer advocates and consultants and academics and all these kind of things. Um, and it's really great to see that we already have a good um, breadth and, um, and array of people involved from the get-go, you know. And so even though eventually we'll get to the point where it's put up for vote and it'll have the quote-unquote proper balance, it is really great to see that in our initial discussions we have a lot of wide involvement, everyone from consultants like ESI and Exponent to manufacturers like Puffy, Bird, Lyft, uh, Razor. Um, we have some some lawyers. You have the CPSC involved. Um, the city of Austin is also very active. Um, so it's just really great to see um, such a wide range of people. And I think it's ultimately resulted in a lot of rich discussion. Um, and, and so I, I hope that by having so many people involved in an early stage that we'll uh, have a, a, a better standard when we actually submit it for, for balloting. Um, as I mentioned before, so our current approach basically is that um, we're using F2641 as a template. Um, as I said before, this is the consumer safety standard for recreational powered scooters on pocket bikes. Um, and so even though, you know, I, I'm not going to make any um, guarantees or assurances here, uh, I would expect um, the content in their adult scooter standard when we finish to be roughly similar to the scope of the F2641. Um, I expect to be some additions, some deletions. Um, but for those of you that aren't familiar with 2641, here's kind of an idea of like the different topic areas that are in that standard. Um, so you have everything from, you know, brakes, electrical systems, curb impact tests, fasteners, the discussions of plastics, shields, guards, dynamic strength, static strength, wheel retention, grip retention, um, talking about the handle stem, there's talk, uh, discussions of the paint, the material quality, toxicology, 
um, exposed bolts, labels, accessible points, and, and edges. Um, so to kind of just give you a feel like to where this is separated from, you know, like the SAE one that was talked about earlier um, that, you know, Brian was talking about, that was specifically looking at, you know, scooter performance and, and you know, how fast they can brake or, or how, how quickly they accelerate. Whereas this, uh, at least if we follow 2641, we expect the scope to be more based on, I'd say, mechanical testing um, in terms of strength, whether it's static or dynamic. Um, in terms of grip retention, um, you know, curb impact tests. So a, a, a very, I mean, different scope, but these are all going to be in the end complementary to one another in terms of the the testing. Um, you know, that was the areas and here's the actual tests that are called on 2641. You know, uh, as I said before, curb impact, dynamic brake, dynamic strength, static strength, guard tests, uh, some fatigue and compression tests as well. Um, and, uh, and again, just to reiterate, you know, um, one would expect, but cannot guarantee that these topics would be included in the adult scooter standard. You know, one mention here is, you know, this one in 2641 has a method of measuring maximum speed uh, because the SAE is uh, already taking this on. It seems like we would probably just refer to the SAE standard um, when it gets um, published. Um, but um, yeah. And then for those of you that were not participating in our meeting in August, just wanted to kind of share with you what we did discuss. Um, Basically, we, we had a sharing of some of the CPSC compilation of scooter accident data. So I think that was part of the information that was shared in our first session today. Um, and then the remainder of the meeting actually, um, it was a two hour long meeting, I believe. Uh, we spent a lot of the time actually discussing the scope. And I think it's um, it's really important business to, to really iron out the scope early on so that everyone's clear as to um, you know, what, what, what work we've set up for ourselves. And so some members were, were really, um, interested in having the standard be inclusive both rental and retail scooters. And the idea here is just to try and get um, a standard that would have a greater impact and, and cover a wider range of vehicles. Um, but other members wanted to have the standard more narrowed because um, they saw a, a, uh, a distinction between rental markets and retail markets. And the standard that we should apply to, to both of those um, would have different testing requirements. In the end, um, the task group has decided that we're going to start by adopting a rental-only approach and focus on making it better for rental scooters first. Um, and then we plan to apply uh, develop a standard for retail scooters um, later. Um, also during the new business discussion, there was a request for concern safety scooters as it pertains to connectivity, uh, which may result in a collaboration with another F1575 group that is drafting a similar standard for um, kind of Internet of Things um, standard. Um, so the next steps for us, though, is, is you know, once um, we're going to continue having meetings, um, we're playing monthly meetings about an hour long. Um, so I'll have my contact information at the end. So if you are interested in participating, like I said, it's open to all. Just, you know, let us know who you are and, and, uh, and your email address so we can make sure to get you the meeting invite. Um, but we're going to have these, these meetings um, uh, monthly to try and just really mold and shape and, and try and get this uh, standard into a... Uh, a form which we can set up for balloting. Um, once the task group has kind of done a, a cursory approval of it, it then gets sent up to subcommittee, and then here's where it starts to get you know, official, so to speak. Um, so the subcommittee at 1558, that's the one that's um, on, uh, on recreational bike or scooters or what powered scooters, um, they have to vote. And when they do their voting, it requires two thirds approval to pass. So that's you know a pretty high margin to ensure that the standard is is adequate and appropriate for um, adoption um, but then it goes a step further and after the subcommittee approves it it then goes to the main committee at 15 and um, what is known as the society um, to review um, for voting um, and in this process the main committee so at 15 has to have 90 percent approval so um, uh, again i think that really kind of speaks to the uh, level of quality um, that is expected of our standards in order to get these to, to actually be um, accepted and, and, um, and available for people to use. Um, and during each voting process, any negative votes must be addressed. So if, if an individual um, uh, votes against the standard, uh, they have to provide a reason. And that reason has to be responded to. Um, so it doesn't mean enacted. It doesn't mean that they 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 had you know veto power, um, but it does mean that at least the committee has to respond to that concern. And that's probably what the society is there for. The society to make sure that the voting process is done accurately, and that you know if someone comes in and has you know four points that they 
feel need to be addressed, that those four points at least get addressed. Um, so that's kind of where we're at here at the ASTM um, task group. Um, as I said, we're planning monthly one hour long meetings to get this done into vote ready shape. Um, our next meeting is actually later this week um, on Thursday. Um, it's between 2 and 3 p.m. Eastern time. And if you are interested in participating, um, we would love to have you um, join the conversation and, um, and uh, see where we're at and also help you know, um, contribute to the development of the standard. Um, please let me know. My email address is here. It's just robert.whittlec at bird.co. Um, if uh, you can't type this down fast enough, I'm sure you can get the, 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 the it's, my name's in the agenda. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, however you want. Um, but we'd be happy to have uh, more people join us. So that's all I have. And now I'll pass it back to you, Lawrence. Thanks, Robert. Okay, thank you. Our last presentation in standards development session will be the development of micromobility safety standards by James Berg. As an R&D manager, James helped oversee SPIN's development and evaluation of e-scooters, and as an early employee, helped build SPIN's hardware team. In his role, James also works with SAE, UL, and ASTM on the development of new micromobility standards. James has over 13 years of experience working in product development, creating products in the consumer, solar, wearables, and mobility industries. James has a BS in civil engineering from Cornell University. Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, so yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so this is, I'm gonna talk a little bit about standards development from the perspective of a scooter sharing company. Um, you gave me that great presentation, so I'll uh, intro, so I'll skip all this. Um, that's me and my kid. Uh, before I get into to the details of this, um, this was mentioned briefly, but there are a number of different things people talk about when they talk about scooters. There are, of course, moped, Vespa style scooters. There's a number of different uh, scooter products for kids, both powered and unpowered. And then what uh, I'm just going to be talking about uh, right now is powered scooters for adults, sometimes called kick scooters, sometimes called standing scooters. But the reason I want to distinguish between kids and adults and powered and unpowered is uh, later on we'll talk about some, some rules and standards that apply or don't apply based on those uh, differences. So why does SPIN want an industry-wide safety standard? The stereotype is that companies tend not to like standards, but actually I think that micromobility is an excellent example of how standards can help industries. And actually uh, common standards is something that SPIN has been pushing for uh, since before I got there. And of course the, the primary reason is safety. Uh, and safety is a very important part of SPIN's culture. It's written into uh, our company values. Uh, one of them is do the right thing, even if it means more work and care. And so that comes out in, in a number of areas. Uh, we've had to develop our own internal standard for, for testing scooters to make sure that anything we put on the street is safe. Uh, and we do work in a number of other areas. Uh, my colleague, Kay Chang, is going to be talking in, a little bit later on today uh, in the next hour about some of the work she's done partnering with cities to improve uh, street infrastructure to make it safer. And then industry reputation is also tremendously important. You know, for any new industry, even a small number of bad actors can create an industry-wide reputation that hurts everybody. And at SPIN, we think that micromobility and scooter sharing uh, is one of the greatest changes of, of the decade, and we really want to see it succeed and, and show its full potential for how it can improve society. And so we want to make sure that everybody's operating to the same high standards and that the industry as a whole has a reputation for safety and reliability. We also think that common standards can help us um, 
can help reduce regional variations and that that's a benefit, uh, of course, for scooter operators since it means uh, fewer um, customizations to, to hardware. But we think it also actually helps cities a lot as well. If you think of somebody working for a city trying to write a scooter permit process and they want to make sure that the scooters on their streets are safe, they're not necessarily an expert in what makes a scooter safe. And so they either need to put out some incomplete rules on safety or they need to spend a lot of time and effort developing some custom rules and uh, much simpler for them to just be able to go and reach for common safety standards. And then we also think that it will make evaluation of new scooter products uh, faster and help the in industry innovate more quickly. So right now, whenever somebody comes to us with a new product, we have to start taking that product through our internal safety standards, uh, which is not fast and not cheap. Um, whereas if somebody, if somebody developing products for scooter sharing or micro mobility, you know, can just go look at the, the common safety standards, um, then they can just develop their product to that standard from the beginning. And so by the time they're bringing it to spin or, or other companies or to market, it's basically ready to go. So, but despite all these good reasons for one, currently there is no, there are no safety standards for adult powered scooters. There are a, a number of rules uh, for adult powered scooters. Uh, there are national rules, state rules, city permits of course have a number of rules in them. And then there are some voluntary standards that cover uh, portions or subsections of scooters. So this is an example of some of the, the current applicable standards, uh, many of them, some of them, the UL ones were uh, spoken about previously. But as you can see, these are talking about very specific portions of scooters. And, and these are very important aspects of safety, but none of them are talking about scooter behavior or rider safety. And then there are uh, standards that are cover very similar products, uh, such as uh, scooters for kids or unpowered scooters or bicycles, of course, have some similarities. And these are useful standards for, for looking at how it's been done and, and taking some inspiration. But uh, none of these standards actually cover adult powered scooters. And then, of course, there are laws that do cover adult powered scooters. Germany probably has the most prescriptive one to date. It has fairly detailed guidance on braking performance and uh, headlight design. A number of US states have rules on scooters. They'll usually have a brief definition of a scooter to define it as a vehicle class and then a section on visibility requirements. A few of them will have additional requirements on maximum vehicle weight, but for the most part, um, the state DOT rules are pretty brief, and we've found that there's a lot of room for interpretation, that often there is room for interpretation in them, and I'll get to an example of that on the next slide. And then, of course, there are city permits, which uh, can be quite detailed, but they're primarily concerned with how scooters are deployed and how companies operate within the city. They, they do have some rules on, on the, the safety and behavior of the scooters, but for the most part, um, they refer to state rules uh, for those aspects. So um, in terms of state rules and ambiguity, uh, I'm gonna pick on my home state of California here. So this is a, an excerpt from the California Vehicle Code on uh, rules for scooter headlights and i'll just read the highlighted section it says illuminates the highway in front of the operator and is visible from a distance of 300 feet in front and from the sides so this is a fine rule uh, there's it, it's a, a perfectly reasonable requirement but there is some room for interpretation of exactly what this means so for example how much should it illuminate the highway and how do you test for visibility do you just send somebody 300 feet away and ask them if they can see the headlight? Uh, 
I assume you're doing that at night, but the it doesn't say. And then it says that it has to be visible from the sides, but it doesn't say how far to the sides. Just a little bit, 45 degrees, 90 degrees. So if you talk to somebody that designs or tests bicycle headlights, they have kind of common understandings of, of what this means and how to interpret it. But if I'm designing a new product or if I'm evaluating new products, often from companies that, that aren't familiar with uh, California vehicle code, it's nice. I, I would like to have a solid understanding of how they've tested their products and made sure that it meets this requirement and not be relying on their, how they have interpreted this possibly to the best advantage of their product. So this is one of the areas where we're hoping that uh, common standards can provide a little bit more detail. So out of all these, uh, the, the current set of, of voluntary standards that apply, the adjacent voluntary standards and the, the laws, the, what is left out is uh, a common definition of what a scooter is. And uh, SAE has just recently uh, come out with a taxonomy which is fantastic. Um, there's still, uh, you know, all these standards are under development. So, you know, this is, um, uh, <laughs> all, all of the standards organizations that presented previously are, are working as quickly as they can, as quickly as we can, since I'm on all of those committees, uh, to cover these areas. I'm just highlighting what um, the, the importance of, of why we're doing it. Um, there's, there's, we need guidelines on how to measure performance. Um, if there's going to be rules on maximum speed, if there's going to be rules on braking performance, uh, we need to make sure that everybody's measuring those in the same way. And really those first two things are just a foundation so that we can get to the meatier topics of durability and rider safety. So scooter sharing in particular has some uh, interesting needs around durability. If you think of a, a, a vehicle that somebody owns privately, they understand that they are responsible for the maintenance of that vehicle, even if only to the extent that they take it to a mechanic every so often. But for uh, shared scooters, shared vehicles of any kind really, not only is there the additional um, wear and tear that they uh, have to absorb, but when a rider gets on a shared scooter, they have to trust that the operator has properly maintained that. And so uh, for everybody to have some common understanding of what proper maintenance means um, is, a, is an area that isn't covered yet. And then of course there's rider safety uh, and you get into questions of what is a, a safe speed, uh, when something breaks and no matter how well we design things, the, things will break. Uh, how do we make sure it breaks safely? Um, for example, if if a throttle breaks in the middle of a ride, does uh, can the scooter detect that and uh, slowly and safely come to a stop, or is it just going to hold on to that last speed signal it had and keep going forever? I'm not going to cover these again. Um, they they've talked already, um, but these are the organizations that Spin has been working with. Um, we've been involved essentially from the beginning of all three. And in fact, um, we worked with ASTM in, in March of 2019 to, to formally request a new standard to cover uh, powered adult scooters. Uh, I've been the primary contact. It's been for all of these, uh, all three of these committees. But uh, as we get into more areas of technical, uh, more technical areas, we've been bringing in subject matter experts as needed. So that is it. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, James. I want to thank again all the uh, speakers for our standards development section. Um, we're going to have some time here to to get some questions answered. One for me, one second. Okay.
So we had one question here for SAE. Um, the question reads, does the SAE J3194 recognize that there are three types of key bytes, classes one, two, and three? Uh, classes one and three do not have self-propulsion even though there is a motor. Yeah, uh, Chris Cherry here. Um, the SAE standard does, uh, I'm trying to remember what the language exactly says, but it does reference that the uh, um, people for bikes uh, class system is sort of the law of the land essentially uh, for most states or many states at least. And I think you'll hear a little bit more about that later on in the uh, conversation uh, today um, near the end. But uh, yeah, we we explicitly included the sort of definition of an e-bike uh, that it has operable pedals and some of the same language that's in the um, three class system. We don't uh, break down the speeds and so on. Uh, we and uh, you can actually with our our system say that it's a um, low speed. Uh, electric bike, uh, lightweight electric bike, however you want to do it, but we do we do uh, um, include that in there. Um, also, one of the things we were talking about uh, that John mentioned was with weight. Uh, for example, um, we're not as prescriptive on on some of the weights and other things, but we do allow heavier e-bikes like big cargo bikes that are family hauling bikes uh, that people tend to have or are becoming popular. Um, and so those are those would be a heavier weight version of an e-bike. So, Kit, uh, uh, let me just jump in real quick uh, uh, to add a couple of things to what Chris said. Um, you know, the e-bike classification is in alignment with the three classifications for electric bikes uh, in the standard here. It's under powered bicycles, so you know there is an opportunity to expand that. Uh, one thing that is different from what we have done versus what you see it in the CPSC definition or some other definitions, we are agnostic on um, the power of the motor. Um, we felt that uh, the speed was a more of a, a more important than determining the the power of the motor uh, as it relates to classification of the device. Yeah, and we're also agnostic on the source of the power of the motor. So you could have a powered, a gasoline powered. You've seen these uh, bicycle that still is a powered bicycle in ours. But again, we would have that tag that says it's a, inter a combustion engine, not an electric motor, right? So those are, so it's a little bit broader than the, um, it, it allows for a broader sort of definition than the three class system. Okay, great, thanks. Let's see, um, another question we have here uh, it looks like this one can go out to all the speakers. Have any standards addressed potential need for turn signals as it can be difficult to remove hands from handlebars? Uh, hi, this is James. Uh, I have not seen any standards that cover that, uh, cover turn signals yet, but certainly uh, I think that's um, the the standards committees aren't quite at that phase of development yet uh you know taxonomy is being covered uh standard uh, measure standard ways of measuring performance are being covered uh they haven't gotten to uh specifications like turn signals yet yeah this is Robert. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I say, yeah, this is Robert Britton, just kind of like following what, what James said, the, the same thing. And, and one thing I find interesting is that Germany, which I think has a pretty uh, rigorous standard, they, they do have a lot of requirements for the lighting and the reflectors and stuff does not include turn signals as a requirement. It's, it's optional. Um, so I think it's interesting finding. Um, but yeah, no, nothing in the U.S. that I'm aware of. 
Thanks, Robert. Okay, another general question we have. Are there any plans for other SDOs to follow ASTM scope to decipher between rental and retail products? Um, this is Robert Britt again. Um, yeah, I, I obviously I'm not going to speak for the others. I'm not as heavily involved in those, but I think one thing that might separate though is that with ASTM, like because it is somewhat uh, currently focused on more mechanical testing, um, I think that people in the meeting recognized a need for uh, more rigorous mechanical standards for rental scooters, just because, you know, to give a really easy example, um, uh, people treat things in the quote unquote public space very differently than they treat their own personal belongings. Um, so to give you an example, if I wanted to put a park bench in my backyard, I'd go to Home Depot and get a, a one made out of, you know, probably thin slots of wood and maybe a little bit of metal on it put in my backyard and would use it gently and it would last for several years. Um, if I was to put a park bench in a city park, I would instead get, you know, a few cubic yards of concrete and, and pour a concrete bench. <laughs> so. Um, I think that's kind of a good example just to, to illustrate how people treat rental scooters differently than their own personal property. And so I think that's probably, you know, that was at least some of the, the justification given for why people wanted a separate um, standard for rental versus uh, retail scooters for the ASTM, specifically that people recognize a, a need for higher requirements for um, mechanical testing. And I don't know if those requirements um, would carry over to, like, for instance, EUL has some batteries. You know, I, I said the battery standards is, is pretty high. Um, and SE is, you know, looking at uh, taxonomy, how we define it. They're also looking at high speed, low speed. I don't think there's a need for separation there. I could be wrong, of course, have that other people opine. But but just some color. That was, that was kind of the reason why ASTM, why we so far have decided to separate the retail and, and rental. Yeah, this is uh, Ryan Yee here. I guess um, as far as J3230 is concerned, I'm not sure that uh, the discussion around uh, decel around geofence boundaries would have come out outside of, of the shared context. Though it's, it's not explicit in the standard itself. Okay. Great. Um, looks like we have time for maybe just one more question. Um, we got a couple of questions about uh, susceptibility of softwares to cyber attacks. Um, how do the current standards address these concerns? Um, this is something that I kind of hinted at very briefly in my presentation. Um, and this is a question that was brought up um, during our last meeting. Um, so there is an ASTM standard, uh, I think it's, and I'll have to get the exact um, citation, but there is a, another subcommittee that's drafting a standard about like the connectivity of, of devices. Um, and my understanding is that they are uh, addressing or at least considering cybersecurity as a aspect of that. And so I think that um, with the ASTM um, standard that we're developing specific for, for powered adult scooters, um, we could just refer to that when it does get completed. Um, but to be honest, I, I'm not entirely sure of the content of that and to what level they go into um, ensuring the safety and security of devices, um, but um, that's something we can look into. Yeah, Chris, SAE is not really uh, looking at that within the micromobility group, at least not currently. Uh, there is a different kind of uh, uh, parent, not a parent group, a sister or brother group, uh, related to shared micromobility, uh, shared mobility rather, and that includes uh, a little bit broader scope as it relates to um, data and, and apps and uh, onboard firmware that includes uh, controlling vehicles and so on. And, and this is Diana from UL. Uh, just so you know, UL does have some cybersecurity standards. We can look at adding those to, you know, 2272 or, you know, and or 2849. We also have a new standard, uh, UL 5500 for remote software uh, updates. So we can also look at adding that if there's interest with the industry. So I'll make note of that. We could consider that for the future. 
Awesome. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That was a great presentation, guys, and we got some really good questions come in. Um, let's thank our panelists again, and um, it's time to move to the next session. Um, it will be best practices for enhancing safety. And Einstein Miller from CPSC will be the moderator. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, good morning, all. My name is Einstein Miller. I'm an electrical engineer, and I've been with the agency for roughly nine and a half years. My, my support of ensuring micro mobility safety primarily revolves around an evaluation of the power source of these devices, such as lithium ion battery packs and battery chargers. First up, um, Dr. Chris Cherry will be joining us again to talk about safety data limitation and opportunity for micro mobility. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Chris, uh, you may be muted. Um, we, we're, we're having. Um, Let me start over. Here. I was, I was just, I was getting rolling there. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Try again. Uh, so, uh, professor in civil engineering uh, at uh, University of Tennessee, and I'm going to acknowledge my students, who, of course, every professor relies so heavily on and and uh, appreciate so much. So, Nitesh Shah and Yi Wen were kind of pivotal for the work that um, I'm going to present here. And I'm going to go quickly uh, through this set of slides, but really with the main focus of understanding uh, how infrastructure plays a role. There were questions on the earlier panel about uh, in intersections uh, and behavior, rider behavior, and so on, and we're going to get into that. Uh, here. Okay, so we've heard from epidemiologists, uh, but we don't really learn a lot from epidemiological studies on scooter safety uh, as it relates to the transportation safety. So uh, the studies that have come out have been very interesting and very useful, but they don't really bridge that gap between transportation safety and injuries. So what this side looks at, and it, I, I'll, I'll, I'll confess that the work that I do doesn't bridge the gap the other way, but at least looks at the other side of the chasm, so to speak. And uh, we are trying to really understand where the system has failed and what are the ways that we can remove, improve uh, micromobility safety through uh, system improvements, okay? So, we, uh, I'm going to highlight here quickly that uh, I worked with Bird uh, for last year, essentially hosting roundtables on trying to figure out ways to improve safety. As you all know, this was sort of the the year everything was happening, 2019-20. Uh, there was a lot of safety-related studies coming out, and there was a lot of safety-related uh, incidents that were occurring, uh, uh, crashes and, and collisions and, and fatalities that were occurring. Uh, throughout the year, okay? So we looked at um, operators, what they could do, and then of course, what the public sector can do. I'll uh, focus here is, and, and I'm not gonna um, talk too much about this, but we, we already heard about this, uh, especially from Dr. Harmon earlier this morning about the injury epidemiological studies that uh, uh, have dominated the research. I chair a subcommittee at Transportation Research Board, and we had 35 micromobility papers last year, and very few addressed safety directly. So, what we find, what we found uh, from the epidemiology studies, is that most single vehicle uh, crashes are are what we're seeing in hospitals, uh, in emergency departments. 
Uh, there's been a lot of media scrutiny of head injuries. Uh, we see that non-user injuries are quite low. Um, that is pedestrians, uh, the rate is pretty small. Um, and then the hospital admission rate, so this is maybe an indicator of uh, severity, is about 10% in these, and give or take some, okay? So that's the order of magnitude. Uh, so an, emer uh, an injured person comes to an emergency department and 90% of them are discharged. So what we're trying to understand is what's the role of car crashes? Almost all of the fatal crashes that we see, these 20-something fatal crashes that we've seen in the US and Europe for that matter, 80% uh, of those are, all of the fatal crashes involve a car, okay? A car hits the scooter rider, okay? Um, I should say a car driver hits the scooter rider. Uh, about 10% of the emergency department and these are the more minor injuries involve a car. So you can start to see this, this map. Um, when you're looking at trauma centers, about half of the trauma center uh, injuries or, or reports uh, include a car. So we're really focused on, uh, we, we as Vision Zero transportation safety folks are trying to focus on reducing severe and fatal injuries and trying to understand that involves trying to look at where these car conflicts occur. Um, one of the challenges, of course, is the EPI studies don't explicitly link injuries with car crashes for the most part, and that's been a real problem or a real challenge. Um, a couple of unique insights from some of the studies, the Austin and uh, um, San Diego studies, is that inexperienced riders may have higher injury rates. We, we know that uh, they have higher injuries, but we don't know if they're proportionally higher to the number of inexperienced riders that are out there, right? Uh, there's a lot of inexperienced riders out there. And of course, inexperienced riders are becoming injured. Um, and then there's there was this interesting finding about intoxication and nighttime riding that seems to be a risk factor. And I'll show you a little bit uh, about that later on, okay? So some of the four key recommendations, and I got this aster this footnote here. This is BIRD. I'm, I'm not uh, endorsing or encouraging this, but I agree with these because I've worked with, uh, and these I think these are common sense that any uh, operator can improve on or can uh, endorse, is we need to improve our infrastructure, and that's what this talk is about. Uh, we need to improve education of both riders and car drivers, and I'll show you a little hint of how that might play out in a little bit. Uh, we need to improve vehicle design, of course, and then protect protect the pedestrian right-of-way, okay? And so we'll, we'll look at these two, uh, essentially, uh, we can talk about all of them, but look at these two in this uh, in the rest of this talk, okay? So what we were lucky to do to get is uh, Nashville has a very rich uh, shared scooter data set, and I use shared in both senses of the word here. Uh, it's uh, from the, all the scooter operators and it's shared with researchers in the state uh, at least and, and maybe beyond. But uh, we were able to um, have a data use agreement with the Nashville folks that uh, looked at some of the um, raw scooter data and try to understand where and why uh, scooter riders ride. Uh, there's a question in transportation and this we can unpack this and spend a lot of time talking on it, but should we treat and mitigate transportation risk in similar ways that as we do to recreation risk? And if, uh, it, and sh if we say yes to that question, then should we look at scooter riders uh, trip purpose in different ways. So that's a kind of a philosophical question that you can think about uh, as you're looking at scooters in the future, okay? And then uh, we're trying to bridge this gap of looking at injury data uh, and coupling it with trip data. So uh, I'm gonna highlight the data that we have. Uh, you know, again, the epidemiology studies are very kind of uh, aggregate, uh, which is fine but we don't, aren't able to kind of untangle the specific factors uh, that matter for uh, scooter safety. So for example, exposure matters. Here's, uh, uh, let me see, February is on the bottom and July is on the top in this case. And it, as we're looking at that, we can see of course that there's a higher volume uh, or at least a proportionally higher volume of nighttime riding in February than there is potentially in uh, the summer, that is dark hour riding. So what about first time riders? You can ask the same sort of questions that, and I don't have the answers to these questions, but the data allows you to dig into this, okay? 
uh, we have uh, we were able to do all this uh, fancy uh, um, clustering and and classification and machine learning on the data itself, and we can understand different patterns of uh, travel. So, for example, we have daytime errands here on the top. If you recognize Nashville, you know that uh, obviously the red blob is the downtown area, and then the bottom left is kind of the Vanderbilt University area. So you have a lot of activity on the bottom left, and then you have the downtown, uh, what you think of as Nashville's uh, Main Street and Broadway and the honky tonks and the bar scene and all of that, okay? Uh, you also have a stadium right across the river uh, where there's a little hot spot there too. Um, on recreation on the bottom right, uh, obviously nighttime entertainment, uh, we were able to cluster all of these trips together and you get this pattern and then on the bottom right you have recreation trips and you can probably just by looking at that identify where the parks are, where the greenways are and so on, okay? Uh, so the, so this is uh, so we're able to split this out and, and I'm going to just sort of whiz past this. But the idea is you can follow these different patterns for different times of day, different days of week, and of course different months of the year. I'll highlight the blue line on the bottom right that suddenly drops off the first week of May 2019, and of course that is when uh, Vanderbilt University uh, took off uh, or basically let out, so all the students uh, disappeared, or many of them did, so they're not going back and forth to classes on their daytime errands, okay? And so you can see how you can pull some of these uh, examples out. So let's get in safety data. Uh, so we have, there it is, Van Vanderbilt University downtown, and this is a heat map, essentially, uh, it's not very hot, but it's a, a weighted map of trips that are occurring between downtown and uh, other parts of the city and what we you can see the different uh, crash locations we have bicycle crashes and scooter crashes highlighted here uh, and you can see these hot spots basically you can see this high injury network and you can normalize that to the volume of vehicles on that route uh, I want to highlight the scooter crash hot spot in downtown that row of bicycle and scooter crashes on the kind of in the middle of the the figure on the right top right uh, that's Broadway, that's Lower Broadway, that's where all the bars are. And uh, just a couple days ago, they announced that they're gonna be shutting down Lower Broadway to cars at nighttime on weekends, okay? And so this is gonna reduce one of these big conflict zones, and that's a strategy to allocate space to vulnerable road users and COVID and spacing and everything else, okay? so. We uh, broke this out as a in a crash typology framework. Uh, we have a paper that we've written that, that I'll present some preliminary results on, and it's relying on tight, uh, Tennessee's uh, police crash reporting. And all of these crashes, of course, are uh, are car to scooter crashes. They do have a good classification of scooters in as a non-motorist personal conveyance. We have complete kind of uh, transparency. We can see the narrative. We can read all of these narratives and we can pretty clearly identify what is a scooter crash or not. There's also a person type that's been added called a pedestrian on an electric scooter. Uh, this is relatively new. There's no records in this uh, of of this person type in the crash database, so uh, it's not being used yet. But it is another uh, type. Okay, so I'm going to go quickly here. Uh, we looked at uh, 51 crashes of scooters, uh, 79 bicycle crashes over the same period of time. This is about a two-year period of time. You can see them there. Uh, we chose crashes uh, for bicyclists that were in the same geographic bounds as the scooters that were within a mile of the nearest scooter crash. And so we didn't get the suburban uh, bicycle crashes. We didn't get the uh, long uh, recreational trips outside the city or any of that, just the downtown bicycle crashes. Uh, we have the full crash narratives and we were able to develop these typologies. So couple of differences. Uh, if it's not listed here, it probably means it's about the same. So a few differences is that scooters uh, uh, have a little bit more, uh, quite a bit more uh, crashes in dark and lighted conditions. So street lighted conditions, but dark, uh, after dark. Uh, but uh, that's contrasted to bicyclists who have more crashes in dark or no or low lighted conditions. So bicyclists are crashing in uh, dark and unlighted conditions, whereas uh, scooter riders are crashing on, on lighted streets, okay? 
Uh, the gender balance is a little bit different. Uh, more women uh, crash uh, with cars in on scooters than men uh, relative to bicyclists. And then uh, for age and severity, there's a little bit more severity in this uh, this younger cohort for scooters. 20 year old cohort is uh, what we're looking at as kind of the big peak, whereas the bicyclists tend to be a little bit older. Okay. A few other things that are interesting, we were able to map where people uh, lived and where they crashed. And so what we found is that a lot of scooter riders and bicycle riders were close to home, uh, actually. So people live downtown and they ride a scooter around and, and they get hit uh, downtown. Uh, with one little exception, of course, is about a third of our e-scooter riders are from more than 50 miles away. So these are travelers coming in, riding scooters. So this yields information about education and so on, okay? Uh, the drivers, on the other hand, almost all of them are suburbanites or uh, travelers. So they're all in this 10 to 50 mile range away from home. They're driving into downtown Nashville from outside of the city, essentially, and they're uh, striking bicyclists and scooter riders from outside. So again, talking about education, you have somebody who's not used to driving maybe in a dense urban environment, certainly not used to driving around scooters if they, they, they're they from the outside uh, in their kind of home turf and they uh, are hitting cyclists cyclo and scooter riders about equally actually, okay? A uh, couple of points, intersections are really important. I'm out of time, so I'm gonna really kind of just highlight this. Intersections are, 80% of all crashes for bicyclists and scooters are at intersections. The highest, uh, the thing I want you to remember here, if anything, is that about 25% of those crashes of scooter intersection crashes, a fourth of them, are these right turn, right approach crashes, okay? So bear with me on this. You have a scooter coming from the right of a car and the car is turning right. So they're looking to the left. This is a right turn on red scenario. Uh, and if you if you can visualize that, you don't have to. This is where our uh, this is an example of that. This is where we had a fatality in uh, Nashville, and it was crossing at this point from a direction maybe that that was not where the motorist was looking. Okay, here's another crash diagram. You can see the uh, see what happens here. Okay, so I'm going to uh, get to the end, uh, and you can read these on your own. But the um, we need system risk factors, not just injury factors. We need to look at police crash data to provide context of injuries. Uh, hospitalization uh, is the extent of injuries. Overlay probe count data, like I showed earlier, uh, to provide the rate of injuries and, and patterns of use. And then finally, infrastructure data is really the tools for this. Um, I'm going to point to this. Everybody says, what should, what's your recommendation on scooter safety? And I always say, just read the ITF report. That's a pretty good, uh, they've got 10 really not good strategies that that um, are somewhat in, in included here uh, in some ways, but um, really focusing on severe injuries and fatalities is an important aspect for transportation safety and uh, focusing on intersections, uh, protected intersections, driveways, networks. Uh, the reason people ride on these really hellacious streets in Nashville uh, the reason they ride on sidewalks is because the street is so hostile to scooter riders or bicyclists for that matter in most cases. So build a protected low stress network uh, that deals with one way connectivity and so on and, and uh, maintain this non-motorized infrastructure. So those are the um, key aspects here. And then of course, data is important. So I'm gonna stop there, I'm a couple minutes over. Um, you can uh, reach out to me here. Uh, this work, a lot of it was funded under this Collaborative Science Center for Road Safety, a grant from them, okay? So I look forward to questions at the end. Thank you, Chris. Uh, next we have um, Kay Chen. Uh, she'll be speaking on roommate, remaking urban infrastructure for micromobility. Kay leads initiatives for Spin Safe and Livable Streets program, where she is helping cities provide safer experiences for consumers. Prior to SPIN, she had a long tenure with the San Francisco Planning Department and led many of the departments in innovative projects like Ground Play, Business Zoning Check, Market Street Prototyping Festival, and the Better Roofs Program. She has a knack of pushing the city to try new things. Kay is a board member for 
San Francisco Transit Riders, combining previous experience working at New York City Planning, landscape architecture, architecture and transportation planning firms. Kay has experience in a wide scope of private and public projects. Kay has a MS in urban planning from Columbia University and a BA in urban studies and, and minor in digital design from the University of California, Riverside. Thank you for being here today, Kay. Hi there, it's Kay. I just want to make sure everyone can hear me and see my screen. It looks like everything's green, so I'll go You're ahead. good to go. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, thanks for that great introduction, and I've had a good time listening to all the other presentations and, as well. So, kind of um, focusing on remaking urban infrastructure for micromobility. Um, as the introduction stated, you know, my previous background was, you know, working for city, working around safer streets, working with Vision Zero goals, and thinking about the street as um, as um, accommodating for all users, not just vehicles. So zooming out, like, like Dr. Um, Chris Cherry did, um, looking at the the environment where the scooter operates is where we're focusing for um, safety efforts today. So at SPIN, we believe that um, streets belong to everyone, and our mission is to impact positive change for um, to be advocates for accessibility and safety in our communities. Our SPIN Streets program um, that I lead at SPIN focuses on a couple of buckets, um, and some of these are overlapping, but generally we're trying to help um, people navigate intersecting safely, reclaiming space from cars, whether that be travel lanes, um, repurposing for bike lanes, or parking spaces to um, parklets, which are you know um, temporary or long-term spaces that are converted for parking to um, for people to use to bike uh, to park their bikes or scooters, um, and then just making the physical case for bike lanes. Um, so I'll run through some of our examples. Here's a quick intro from our video, so I'll play a quick clip. And Safety is everyone's responsibility. And while knowing the rules of the road, how to operate our vehicles, and wearing a helmet are important, we know safety is much bigger than the individual behavior. It's about how we design our streets and for whom. That's why SPIN Streets team commits funding and staff resources to help bring together better bike lanes, safer intersections, and infrastructure improvements to make our streets more accessible to all that use them. Whether you're eight or 80, you get around on a bike or scooter, by foot or with a wheelchair, regardless of your gender, your race, or your background, or the neighborhood you're from, everyone deserves to get home safely. Oh. So that's just a quick snippet, um, sort of outlining our streets program. Um, and the whole thing's on our website if you wanna check that out. But basically, you know, we fund um, projects working with cities and advocacy groups throughout the country and um, and the world now um, to, to work on these infrastructure improvements. So I'll walk through some examples. Um, as Chris mentioned, intersections are really important, and this was one of our uh, projects we did last year. In the top left, you can see the before, so it's a, a pretty big um, intersection that, you know, there was an existing bike lane, but it wasn't painted. Um, so what we did is work with a lo local advocacy group and the city and community to um, paint the crosswalks, um, paint in the buffered bike lane, and then add some <clears throat> some um, physical separation so that pedestrians and seniors and other folks in the neighborhood felt sleep safer to um, navigate that intersection. Um, and these are sort of examples that can be inspirational for the city to, that is trying to test out new ideas and try to get people to see the street in a different way. Um, another aspect, you know, that's common for uh, us to have to think about is not just the movement of scooters, but also, you know, where they're parked. So we hosted a parklet competition, which um, allowed for creative thought around, you know, what a form factor of a parklet could be. And we asked the, the designs to also incorporate scooter parking, because one of the challenges we have is to have, if there's scooters strewn across the sidewalks and people are trying to cross, you know, there's um, conflict there. So 
um, all of the ideas that we selected at, in the competition that were built out had different ways to park um, bikes and scooters off of the sidewalk to maintain that clear path of travel. Um, and then Nashville is a great place, but it's there we go. Um, so there's um, sort of a piggybacking on Nashville. We have some examples of working with advocacy groups that um, have you know grappled with how to make safer infrastructure in their city and push um, push electeds to make these um, decisions to invest in infrastructure for quite a long time. So we've partnered with these groups to just give them sort of mini grants to help bring their ideas um, to light, to have people um, you know, participate and ride on a protected bikeway in an area of town that may, usually doesn't have it. Um, and that kind of garners support. And so those are the types of projects that um, our program has uh, funded uh, throughout the country. Um, and we have a bunch of examples. So I'll just kind of go through these. Um, Milwaukee is another example, even in the in the colder months, you know, people still, you know, want a more protected place to travel. So even a, a super wide street like this, where you have bike and cars and everything, people, you know, there's there's always uh, it, with creative thought um, some place to carve out um, space for people to ride safely. Um, and um, uh, another aspect of our program that we've been funding, especially during COVID, is there's been a lot of streets that are um, that cities citywide programs that are closing down streets to traffic or slow streets, reducing streets um, the traffic flow. So we've partnered with cities to um, give them uh, communities some signage and um, the resources to sort of help let people know that you know there's scooter riders there's people there's kids around and that's sort of just helping to reiterate the narrative that the streets can are for um, not just vehicles but for other modes as well um additional examples of um demonstrating um bike lanes so this was a two-way cycle track pop-up in st george um, utah we partnered with the city and bike utah to do this uh temporary installation to show the communities and advocates and po politicians that you know this was possible um and it's making its way through um, council now and um has garnered some support so hopefully we'll see that soon um installed in the future um, another aspect of our program is you know funding not just the physical infrastructure but spending time with communities that have been traditionally disinvested in the safe infrastructure and have high um, fatality rates or crash rates so we worked with um, in dc with um, ward seven and eight working with community members and the local um, bike advocacy organization to talk through some of their like um, top intersections um, of concern. Um, and then the hopes is that after we develop some of these, their ideas, community seated ideas, we'll work with DDOT to install one or two of those. And then I'll just I'll end on two last programs of ours. Um, in terms of data and our streets program, we created a program um, last year that advocated, um, <clears throat> sorry, provided uh, tools for six advocates. So those are listed here. Um, but basically we thought, you know, there's all sorts of data that these advocates could be collecting and may not have the resources for. So we provided them with, you know, populist street light data, all, all sorts of different types of data that they could um, ingest on their own um, and provided trainings for them. And then also provided them with, um, data counters and sensors, so traffic um, counters that could do different modes and then also vehicle um, speeds. So they're kind of in the midway through their program right now and we'll have a report out of all the different projects that they've tackled around street safety um, given the tools that we were able to provide for them. And then our last project um, that I'll talk about is Really focusing on barriers. Um, we know, you know, we've all seen these different types of barriers in the street. They're, um, you know, can be expensive to maintain for what you get out of them. And we thought that there would be an opportunity to invite um, 
the design community and everyday folks to sort of see, envision what that could be. Um, so we held a competition again, um, had a webinar and we announced our winners and we're working um, with them to create a prototype. Um, and we um, solicited a lot of advice from um, different folks in the industry, from transportation planners to people for bikes and all sorts of people who um, have a lot of experience in this realm. And our winning design um, is shown here. Um, and we're working on creating a prototype um, using reclaimed rubber um, tires. And um, so hopefully we'll see those, um, we'll be able to pilot that with our, um, with the community soon this year. And then there's all the different winners. Um, we're runners up as well, all listed on our website if you're interested. Um, so I'll stop there, ready for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. Um, before we get started on questions, I want to take a moment to thank our panelists. All right, we have time for a few questions before we break for lunch. Um, and <clears throat> I see we have one of our first questions here uh, is directed towards uh, Dr. Cherry. Um, I appreciate that your research considered relevant variables for micromobility accidents, such as various trip patterns. And I think it's very helpful that you mapped out scooter and bicycle crash locations. Have you compared your findings to other locations or do you have plans to do so? Uh, we only have really good data on both crashes and scooter trips uh, in Nashville. And uh, we haven't uh, dug into that. And one of the objectives of looking, there's there's been a lot of talk about uh, um, bicycle, whether scooters are, have different characteristics as bicyclists. And that was really our main uh, idea here was to control kind of at least for geography and population to, and road infrastructure for that matter in one area. Uh, it'd be nice to have that, that data everywhere. A couple of challenges, though, is, you know, for example, we don't have great exposure data for bicyclists. So we don't actually know if scooters are crashing at higher rates than bicyclists. Um, anecdotally, some of the staff at uh, uh, Walk Bike Nashville, which Kay just mentioned, uh, have told us that in the downtown area, scooter, scooter riders are out on, a, you know, three or four to one uh, in terms of uh, ratio compared to bicyclists. So um, you can use that for what it's worth, um, but it'd be great to have more data on that. Okay, thank you. Um, we had another question um, related to um, the um, um, e-mobility devices with those motorcycles. Um, it seems that factors that elevate occurrence and severity of injuries seem to follow those of motorcycles. Have these, have these data been compared? Uh, the the ITF report actually goes into motorcycle related crashes versus scooter and bicycle related crashes, and it found that that motorcycles have about a five time uh, crash uh, injury and fatality rate as uh, bicyclists and bicycles. So, and of course, it all it's all related to speed pretty much. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, the point being is motorcycles have a much higher uh, injury and fatality rate than scooters or e-bikes for that matter. Okay, thank you. Um, for Kay, I have a question for you. Um, first, I'd like to applaud SPIN's creativity and cooperative approaches to designing safer environments for micro-mobility riders in the public. Um, I think it's incredible how many innovative approaches are taken to address the environmental considerations for these products and getting communities involved it certainly helps raise the awareness of the hazards and buy-in from the cities. Um, did you run into any challenges? Um, in particular, I'm wondering about complaints you have received, such as reducing the number of lanes and roads, and if some of these designs became distractions for pedestrians, riders, or drivers? Um, yeah, certainly um, there's um, always some points of friction when you introduce new ideas. Um, but I think the sense that the types of projects that we are funding um, and have worked with is um, from the community with strong like support for local residents and businesses so you already have that baked in support 
and then with the approval always. So you have those two taken care of. Um, and I think the other thing that lends itself to success for our projects is that the pilot. So, you know, it's an opportunity to say, okay, well, if you're not happy with this, like, let's, let's do some, you know, speed counts, let's do some um, observation and interviews and see what we like or don't like. And then, then we could adjust, um, you know, the project moving forward. So it's as much as a <clears throat> feedback tool as it is like an information tool. Okay. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, I think this one is for uh, Chris. Uh, Chris, can you comment on the disparity between instances of male and female rider injuries? Um, are there just more male riders? Yeah, that's a good question. So there's been some evidence that uh, in the pilot studies that females, that women are riding scooters at a higher rate than bicyclists, uh, that are better represented among scooter riders than bicycle riders. So that probably captures that. Uh, that statistic, whether they crash at a higher rate relative to their proportion, we don't know. Uh, the scooter companies may know uh, what proportion of their riders are male or female. And if, uh, I can't remember what it was, 30% or something, if 30% uh, are crashing uh, and are also the, the matching proportion of females, then that's something. There's plenty of evidence out there that men tend to have a higher crash rate than women on motorcycles and bicycles and everything else too. So uh, that would be interesting to explore. Thank you. All right. Um, that was a great presentation and questions. Um, also, I'll continue to send your questions if you have any. Um, you know, we'll try to respond to those at a later time. Um, Lawrence, uh, thank you. I hand it back over to you. Hey, thanks everybody. All right, we'll uh, we'll break here for lunch. Um, everyone, please plan to join back here at 1 p.m. for the start of our next panel, which will be on micromobility design and research. Okay, so for our first presentation in micromobility design and research, we have Benjamin Cribb. Um, he will be doing the presentation called UL2272 and 2849. Mitigating Risk of Explosion Fire Electrocution. Benji has been with UL for over 20 years and is the North American Regional Direct Technical Lead for Micromobility for the UL Consumer Technology Division. Personal e-mobility devices, e-scooters, and e-bikes are part of his responsibilities, along with batteries, electrical systems of e-cigarettes, e-cigarette products, optical radiation, IT equipment, and consumer electronic, electronic products. He observed standard development of UL2849 and works closely with UL standards division in both UL2272 and UL2849. He also leads the North America Eastern Region engineering team involved with UL MARC services, evaluating, testing, and certifying products in meeting UL2272 or UL2849, as well as battery and charger safety. Benji, I will unmute you now, and I will be pulling up your presentation. Okay. Thank you, sir, and just let me know if you can hear me. Yep, I hear you. All right. Well, first off, I want to thank you for the opportunity to present in this forum on the topic of UL2272 and UL2849 as it relates to mitigation of risk of explosion, fire, and electrocution. So if we can go to the next slide, please. I've actually had the ability or um, the privilege of working for UL for the past 21 years on many different types of products in a lot of different industries, but in the context of this presentation, we are going to talk about UL2272 and the inherent risks and mitigations that are needed for battery-operated e-mobility products. I was able to observe during the STP panel meeting, uh, UL 2849 edition one, how the different industries came together and discussed the specific requirements that were needed and that were specific to the e-bike industry. Uh, also similarly, I support the standards technical panel and UL's aspects and enrollment in UL 2272. 
One thing that I want everyone on the call as a takeaway from my presentation is to just remember that we have to consider these products as an entire electrical system. A lot of times individuals or companies feel that they meet the requirements when their components and their component subassemblies are evaluated and they meet the requirements for those components, but oftentimes they don't consider when these various components are married together to create an end product. So I would like to make sure that we keep that as forefront, if anything else that you remember in the presentation. So if we can go to slide three, please. So if you look back and take a moment and let's think about the dramatic increase in all the battery operated products that we've seen in the past, you can see how standards and standards development has played a significant role in the mitigation of the fire, explosions, and electrocutions from these products. Starting way back to when, if you remember the laptop issues with the laptop batteries exploding back in 2005, 2006, and it resulted in the industry change where we realized there were mitigations that were needed in these particular products. And as time has moved on, we've seen batteries installed and used in many different types of products across many different industries. And on the screen, really what we got is a just a small timeline of some of the products that you may be familiar with and some of the applicable standards that would address these battery related hazards and the mitigation factors that are required for a minimum level of acceptability. The hoverboards we've already discussed earlier from 2015 and 2016 timeframe, that was the hot new gift of the year. It resulted in many occurrences of explosions, fires, and electrocutions. And as Diana noted in her presentation, the industry came together and in a phenomenal turnaround time of less than one year, they were able to publish a standard that helped manufacturers understand what are the inherent risks what are the things that need to be considered for those particular products and how those individual components that come together, how they need to be considered at a system level and at a system level approach. And as you go through and look at these various, again, these various products that are on the screen, the red box tells you what is the current applicable standard for that product type. So laptops, it's UL62368. E-cigarettes, it's UL 8139. Power banks, UL Outline of Investigation 2056. Hoverboards, again, UL 2272, which we're going to talk about in more depth later. Cell phones, UL 62368. Portable electronics, also 62368. E-scooters, also fall under UL 2272. And e-bikes under the recently published UL 2849. So if you can, let's go to the next slide. What I mean when we say consider a system level approach is that each component that's used in the system does have its own set of requirements that must be met. But additionally, when you marry that component into a larger subassembly before it makes the final end product, each time you stage and stagger this together, you're actually increasing the potential risk as you go through this. So in UL2272 and in UL2849, we'll look at the smallest level first. So the smallest unit inside is typically the cell. The cell is going to have mechanical integrity tests and electrical and environmental susceptibility. It's going to have specific ratings that the cell must operate in, and it's not suitable for use outside of that operation range. Typically, it's a voltage, a current, and a temperature. When you begin marrying cells into larger and larger packs, as you put that pack together and that pack is then worked through its paces of its charge and discharge cycles, we have to not only make sure that the pack is acceptable, but the internal cells inside of that pack do not exceed their ratings, um, again, temperature, voltage, and current, because if it's operated outside of those ranges, there is the potential risk of either an explosion, a fire, or a electrocution that could result. When we move up to the system level for the e-bike or the e-scooter, we have to consider the fully assembled device now. So you've got a cell that was tested more than likely in an open air environment. Then it's put inside of a pack and that pack is tested at a certain level with a certain enclosure size around it. 
And in certain cases, the pack is then slid inside of a down tube or a frame or a footboard inside of an e-bike or an e-scooter. So each time you've got a change in how much temperature those cells may or may not be seeing. And if we do not consider that system level approach, then there is the potential of a hazard that could result. The last thing that is typically part of the system level is the charger that's used. So when we look at the chargers, we have to know, is the charger going to be providing current voltage at a higher rate than the cells can demand? Is it going to be able to balance the charging of the cells? Is the pack going to be able to balance the discharging of those particular cells? And what we have found out is in our experience, at UL, when we begin reviewing customers' products and we go through a third-party certification, a lot of times they feel that their product complies because their individual components were evaluated to the applicable standards. But when we begin doing these system-level tests, deficiencies are identified and non-compliances are noted. And the good thing is the non-compliance is noted before it goes out to market and the industry so that we can work with the manufacturers to ensure that their product meets a minimum level of acceptability as defined in the applicable standard. So if we can, let's go to slide number five. We've talked about definitions in many of the presentations today, and I'm going to do the same. UL 2272, most people traditionally think of 22720, that's the hoverboard standard. Well, in fact, you're right and you're wrong. It's actually the personal e-mobility device standard. It's not only hoverboards, but it's e-scooters, e-skateboards, e-roller skates, and other types of personal e-transporter devices. Normally, you're going to have a single rider, you're going to stand on it, doesn't have pedals, and it's not made for over-the-road use. Your e-bikes are covered under UL 2849. You can have either pedal assist or non-pedal assist versions. Again, a single rider, but it could accommodate passengers if needed, could accommodate a load if needed for carrying groceries or things of that nature. Typically, you're going to be seated and it does have to have pedals that are operational pedals to provide motive power. If we can go to the next page, please. So what I want to do here is let's talk about the system levels and the differences uh, and compare and contrast of UL 2272 and UL 2849. Many of the major components on this system level chart that I'm showing, there's a lot of overlap, but there are some differences. In UL 2272, which are our hoverboards and our e-scooters, your battery charger is typically going to be evaluated to UL 62368-1 as a component. Your traction battery pack, it can be evaluated as part of the overall UL 2272 evaluation and test program, including the evaluation of the battery management system. And for those looking at the screen, the blue notes are the actual specific clause references in that standard. So you can evaluate the battery pack for a UL 2272 product inside of the end product investigation. Potentially, you could also use a UL2271 battery pack and uh, eliminate some of the testing that would occur. Versus if we look at the traction battery pack in a UL2849 e-bike evaluation, it is required to go through UL2271 or 2580. You can have a UL2054 battery pack or a UL6233 battery pack, but there are additional tests that must be conducted for the e-bike system itself when you're going through that. Similar to 2272, the battery management system must be evaluated for functional safety aspects in terms of both the hardware and software for any safety features such as controlling the voltage, controlling the charge and or discharge current and or the temperatures observed on the cells. The electric motor is a consistent uh, it's a consistent requirement between UL2272 and UL2849. You are required to meet UL1004-1 at a minimum. There are other series of motor standards that would be allowed to help negate some of the required testing, but as a baseline, UL1004-1 is required for the electric motors.
Now, when it comes to the motor controller in UL 2272, the motor controller in 2272 is evaluated in the end product. And we do consider single fault conditions and things of that nature, but there is a different approach in UL 2849. UL 2849 says we must consider not only how the motor controller works, but if there's any intended safety functions, such as when someone stops pedaling that the motor disengages, or if there is an electronic style brake that the motor disengages. So we have to evaluate the safety functions to UL 1998 or UL 991. And while this is a very high level overview of just the major components, when a product certification is completed, the other components used within the system also have to be considered and they have to be evaluated for their specific use. That could be the adhesives, the cables, the cords, enclosures, fuses, all the polymeric materials, everything has to be used within its intended rating and its intended function. If we can go to slide number seven now. So when we talked about the test program, one of the things that I want everyone to understand is that at a system level, there are certain aspects that we have to look at, and it's consistent in both UL 2272 and UL 2849. So you've got a series of electrical tests that are required in the end product, and those electrical tests are going to run that full system through its paces of charging, discharging, loading, overloading, the uh, balance of the battery pack, if you're doing the battery pack evaluation under UL 2272, you also have to consider the mechanical stresses that the system is going to see in its specific intended application, a crushing test, drop test. You've got your environmental tests that must be considered for its use case, thermal cycling between coming in and out of a garage, coming in and out of a cold and a hot location. How will that thermal cycling degrade the electrical systems over time? And the last one is how is your motor actually working? How does the motor perform when it's overloaded, when someone is actually loading it down higher than the specifications? What happens if the motor locks up? Does the motor have the correct protective features for that? Does it maintain the maximum stated speed or does it cut off at that level? Do the materials used in the motor and in the motor system, does it have the correct flammability rating and are the markings and everything associated with the product permanent so that it's easily identifiable down the road? UL 2272 and UL 2849 are different than some of the other standards that we've talked about throughout the day or that we've had discussed in the panel. This standard addresses the safety features in terms of explosions, fires, and electric shock. It doesn't evaluate the performance or the reliability of the devices or the physical hazards as many others have addressed already in terms of the use of the personal e-mobility device. So again, many manufacturers feel that their product complies because they used components that were created and designed for the application but they fail to consider the implications of when those individual components are brought together and it's when a manufacturer goes through the requirements of ul 2272 and ul 2849 and there's a third party evaluation typically involved that those deficiencies can easily be identified what other mitigations did they potentially overlook and how can they address the product to avoid the risk of explosion, fire, and electrocution. And uh, that's the, if you'll go to the next page, please, Lawrence. And if there's any other questions related to this standard, just let me know. Thank you, Benji. All right, our next presentation is on Bird Batteries Design and Development by David Ten Hooten. Let me cue it up. So David is the Senior Director of Vehicle Engineering at Bird with 20 plus years of experience in electric vehicle automotive engineering, focusing on battery systems, functional safety and validation. David joined Bird to bring that expertise to market mobility in order to make an even greater impact on sustainable transportation 
interest in EV adoption. Thanks for being here today, David. All right, thanks a lot. Are you guys seeing the right screen here? Yep. All right. Cool, well, thanks for that. Um, yeah, it'll be, uh, actually, it's great to follow the UL, uh, the 2271, because that's very relevant. Um, I'll, I won't spend a bunch of time on this, thanks for introducing me. Um, so, but just very quickly, so I'm, I'm Dave, I've spent a lot of time on uh, EV development programs and a lot of that time in those programs on, specifically on battery systems and functional safety and validation. And I've been with Bird for a couple of years now, and uh, it's great to be part of this uh, micromobility movement, which is a much, I think, better movement for the environment than uh, than EV EV cars. So um, with that, we can jump into some battery stuff. Um, here's a picture of a battery from a consumer e-scooter that was the first model used in e-scooter sharing, called the M365. Um, it's the one that Bird started with. Um, you can see the environmental protection is basically some plastic shrink wrap. And what you can't see very well in the picture um, is that the BMS on this battery is just a really rudimentary safety circuit. There's not much to it. <laughs> and here's where we are today. Uh, you can see this right away. This is a more industrial and more robust part. Um, this is the Bird 2 battery pack, which is our current model our most recent model. Um, here's a little bit of a look inside the battery so you can kind of have a look at its construction. Um, it's a aluminum con uh, extrusion construction that has a double wall skid plate on the bottom. Uh, it's just a lot more of a robust approach and a battery than where the scooters um, that started the business uh, were. Here's a, just a kind of a simplified graphic to explain a little bit about our design philosophy. Uh, you can see, you know, when we're balancing technical trades, uh, and we're always backstopping against functional safety and ultimately um, physical air safety, which is probably the best way to go. Um, with, you know, safety is priority number one, and that's why we elect to comply with uh, non-mandated safety standards like the, the, the 2271 that, um, that Benji was just talking about and and 2272 at the vehicle level and uh ul991 which is you know inside of the 2271 we've gone uh really far out of our way to create multiple layers of analog protection features uh, to increase functional safety by reducing reliance on controls where it matters and um we've also kind of set our internal specifications beyond the mandates and even beyond industry norms in terms of battery ingress protection and environmental durability the moisture ingress can be a pretty significant risk factor in battery systems, and this is a differentiator, an example of how we're uh, trying to raise the bar for micromobility, for robustness and safety. Um, as Benji mentioned, you know, safety really starts with, this, with the most basic component of a battery, the cell. And we've chosen well-proven platforms from Tier 1 automotive suppliers, and uh, these cells are all certified against UL 1642 at the cell level, and they're well-known known platforms that have been widely used. But uh, even then, we don't take the cells at their word of the spec sheets. We have extensive qualification programs internally uh, where we, where candidate cells are tested against their manufacturer's ratings and, and beyond. We, we do all kinds of uh, electrical and mechanical destructive testing and uh, analysis of the performance to qualify them for, for our applications. So on um, battery management, you know, our approach is to take uh, the design and control methodologies from automotive BMS um, and apply it to scooters. We're, we're making a small version of a passenger vehicle battery, not a giant version of a toy battery or a cell phone battery. Um, charging, we could talk a little bit about charging. It's one of the higher risk modes for batteries. Uh, and uh, we have a highly managed um, charging approach. So every char every time a charger is plugged into our vehicle, we measure the voltage of the charger to ensure it's rated for our vehicle. 
If not, we, we won't even attempt to charge using it. We won't, we won't connect. Uh, once charging's begun, we monitor current to ensure we don't exceed the maximum uh, the battery's rated for. To protect against extreme abuse scenarios, we have a, a fuse, a physical fuse. Um, and since the charging port is a customer facing connector, our fuse is rated uh, to a voltage of 250 volts AC to deal with anything all the way up to AC mains voltage being put um, on our charge port. Uh, so, and our charging systems also disallow uh, charging with uh, measured cell temperatures that are too high or too low and, you know, and other constraints. So we have temperature sensors placed throughout all the cell stack to know the specific cell temps as well as the temps of our MOSFETs and we can suspend operation or derate performance dynamically to prevent ever exceeding our limits. Um, if, if battery uh, is ever passively exposed to extreme heat, for example, like in a storage or a transport situation, the battery has the ability to permanently disable itself so it cannot be used later when the temperature cools down. Um, just in case there was any cell damage um, underlying from that heat exposure, um, because the cell can have like an additional uh, kind of hidden risk after that. To keep the battery uh, working within its optimum envelope, we use cell balancing array to keep all of our uh, cells at the same state of charge all the time. Um, and if a cell del deltas ever exceed uh, thresholds, we can disable the pack and mark the scooter in our back end for pickup and uh, to get looked at. And so that's a... So um, to, to protect the battery from abuse while driving, uh, we calculate a maximum allowable charge and discharge current rate and send this to our motor controller so it can adjust uh, maximum power levels dynamically, never exceed the ideal range of our battery. and. Um, these limits, limits will adjust on voltage, temperature, and state of charge. So uh, when bringing a pack online, we use a pre-charge strategy that will allow us to charge up our motor controller in a controlled manner to prevent uh, current spikes. This also allows us to detect um, short circuits that may exist beyond the battery uh, before we ever close our main FET. So this allows us to keep from ever exposing our primary fuse to high current situations. Um, should a motor controller or wiring or anything ever become damaged. Um, on diagnostics, you know, our batteries also have advanced diagnostics, you know, mostly borrowed from automotive um, that will alert our back end if batteries are ever damaged or at risk of becoming damaged. Uh, here's a kind of a small excerpt from our actual diagnostics table. Um, the actual table is hundreds of things, but this is just a little snippet to give you uh, an idea. Um, you know, vandalism turns out to be more uh, prevalent than you might expect, at least in the sharing business, maybe not in the, the direct owned business. Um, and through, through our experience uh, as an operator, we've come to learn that it's one of the biggest risk factors to our to our vehicles and uh, as well as like extreme mechanical abuse. And to address these are the batteries housed in all metal enclosure that features double wall skid plate, like I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and it's sealed to uh, IP68 rating and uh, all the connectors outside the battery are IP67. Our BMS um, also incorporates a humidity sensor that allows us to know early on if the seals have been compromised or if the battery has suffered uh, water ingress. And we can send that right up to our back end and collect that scooter. Um, to address the risks of theft, we use um, security hardware and we now have tamper detection logic that will uh, detect when the battery's been unplugged unexpectedly from the vehicle. And we can disable access to the power on all of the outward facing connectors if that happens. Um, our battery uses a uh, security encrypted communication, making it as difficult as possible to repurpose into an unauthorized application that may not be safe. So our pack designs are put through shock and vibe testing and to uh, basically battery industry standard profiles as well as profiles get gathered from uh, data collected off scooters we have instrumented and ridden over 
rough terrain on our internal accelerated durability track, and that's that's generally called RLDA or road load data acquisition. And those kind of loads can be used as design inputs and uh, loading profiles for validation testing. Uh, we do submersion testing, thermal cycling, thermal boundary behavioral testing, system level destructive testing, fault insertion testing, as well as all the performance and life cycle testing. Um, we're, we're, we're a little bit obsessed with testing. Um, and just beyond the safety aspects of our battery, we also focus on performance of our battery and we use multiple strategies for calculating state of charge. And, um, and we can track the capacity of the battery as it ages and this lets us use uh, tune the performance of the, the battery as it degrades over time uh, to maximize its usable life. Uh, that keeps each battery on the road uh, for as long as possible, reducing the number of batteries that need to be recycled and replaced. And it, uh, by maximizing the use of each battery, we can minimize our uh, our impact on the, on the environment, which is kind of why we're here. Um, this, the kind of smarts of our battery communicate continuously with our servers, uh, which enables us to have a very clear picture of what's going on with our fleet. And the more we know about our scooters while they're on the street, the better we can optimize vehicle utilization and ensure public safety. Um, and that, that's about it. That's all I got for this. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you, David. Hmm? All right, up next we have Scott Rushworth with the presentation, Evolving Safe, Reliable, and Durable Bird Vehicles. So Scott is the Chief Vehicle Officer at Bird, where he oversees everything pertaining to bird engineering and manufacturing. Before coming to Bird, Scott led an engineering consulting firm that specialized in high profile projects, ranging from cloud computing to hardware and product development for many Fortune 500 companies. There we go. Great, thank you for the intro. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to, to share today. Um, today I'm gonna to tell you about uh, evolving safe, reliable, and durable bird vehicles. I helped start Bird in, in 2017, so it's been quite an interesting adventure for the last three years working here, um, really helping micromobility evolve, and we've certainly learned a lot uh, along the way. So um, I'd like to tell you about how our why we decided to build our own vehicles. If I can get to the next slide here. There we go. Um, so why do we build our own vehicles? So we started the company and we're not really sure whether this would take off at all. Um, and immediately we found that demand was very, very high, which is fantastic and very validating, but the vehicles were not as good as we wanted them to be. And so we had kind of a challenging decision of, do we decide to build our own vehicles um, or not? And so we figured we needed to really answer the why. <clears throat> why would we build our own vehicles? And to do that, we really needed to look at who our customers are. So we've, we've really kind of built a mental model and business framework that starts with our customers. And we need to listen to the voices of all these customers. So obviously riders that you know rent our vehicles are our customers, but Bird itself is a customer. So riders want a vehicle that's safe, but they want a vehicle that might, you know, accelerate gently, or some of them want it to accelerate fast or stop well. Um, Bird wants a vehicle that's easy to maintain, um, that's, you know, affordable to manufacture, um, that's a sustainable vehicle, and of course, safe. Cities also want a vehicle that's safe. They want a, a vehicle that, um, you know, emits enough data back to them so that they can keep tabs on, on how things are going in their city and that, you know, help help us uh, comply to city ordinances and things. So there were some themes that really started to emerge. Safety, as I mentioned, is a theme for all three customers. And so that's our company's number one priority. Um, as much as we try to move fast and, and, and scale, we, we don't cut any corners with safety. It has to be number one. Sustainability is vital to our core mission. If we don't have vehicles that are sustainable, um, then we're not actually doing our part to not just create transportation that's um you know convenient and fun but you know we're not really making the world you know a cleaner uh transportation if, if they're not sustainable reliable vehicles are no fun for anybody uh, obviously they're you know if the vehicle is not reliable it, it also is not sustainable or safe 
Um, but you know, that means that the vehicles are not available for riders around the city. That means they could end up looking like clutter if, if they fall offline and, and things like this. Um, we also wanted a vehicle that was modern, easy to locate, responsive to city rules, and fun to drive. And then finally, we wanted a vehicle that's serviceable. So as we were looking at what's available in the market, there was really no vehicles that checked all of these boxes. So we set out to build our own vehicles. So in the next section, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we approach vehicle design. Um, and it's it's fun going after my, my colleague Dave because there's a little bit of overlap between our, our discussions, but not, not too much. So um, in, in terms of you know, taking our three customers and looking at their common themes and sort of their wish lists of what they'd like, we really started to get some requirements um, boiled down. And here's a few very high level examples, and we have many, 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 many more of these. But one that I'll, I'll kind of, uh, a couple that I'll talk about, must have state-of-the-art electrical safety, even given extreme use cases in harsh environments, must last 24 months of daily use. So to talk about those two for a little bit, we we thought about, you know, how do we go about this turning these requirements into a vehicle? And so um, as Dave alluded to this, we actually use the, the V process, which is extremely um, or very, very common in the automotive space. And so from the very beginning, we decided to hire a team of automotive engineers, um, some aerospace that are familiar with this process because this is how we wanted to go about it. We feel that because there's humans on these vehicles, we need to take safety very, very, uh, very as our highest priority that we didn't want to cut any corners. We wanted to design and build things in the same way that you would a car or monorail or train or anything like that. So the V process basically means that you gather system level requirements and then you distill those down to subsystem level requirements. Then you distill those down to component requirements. So in the case of uh, having a vehicle that lasts 24 months and having a, a, a state of the art electrical safety, basically you would have that is the, the system level requirement that lasts 24 months. But then for the subsystem of a battery, you might decide that it needs to have a certain level of vibration testing and a certain level of water ingress protection and a certain level of charge cycles. And so let's say that you decide that the battery needs to have 700 charge cycles for the system to last 24 months, which is actually giving it a gracious amount of, 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 of buffer there. So then you need to look at the battery cells. And uh, I saw the presentation earlier that alluded to this too. Just because you have a battery cell that will last you know, 700 charge cycles, if the, the system lets water into it, a battery cell is not gonna last for 700 charge cycles. So as you can see, you work your way down the V from the most macro requirement to subsystem requirements to component. And so we have requirements for everything that you could imagine in terms of every screw nut bolt has its own list of requirements in terms of how long it should last, what the testing procedures will be. And so once we get all of those really agreed upon and, and written down, then we go into the fun phase, which is designing and building. And once we start to get prototypes, whether they're of just samples of components or subsystems that we've finished, we do validation on each of these going back up the other side of the V until we get to the point of being able to test the entire system as a whole. And so that's this is just to give you an example of, of sort of how we sort of approach making sure that if we have a, a vehicle that will say it lasts X number of months or this many charge cycles, that we actually have the, the homework to, to back it up. And so this does take a lot of time. Um, it takes some some investment, um, but I believe that the the results will will speak for themselves. So the last section I want to talk about in, in this, well, the last slide in this section that I want to talk about is our R&D facility. So in our R&D facility, which is located in Los Angeles, you can see um, in here we, we design things as we've been talking about. We also analyze things. So we determine weak points. We, we do calculations around theoretical loads. We work on ongoing updates. So if we've determined that a part didn't last as long as we thought in the field for some other reason, we will work on a revision to it. We also do a lot of live updates to our vehicles in terms of their software, which they're able to download over the air and, and we can roll those out. Um, and then we do all of our validation and testing here. Well, I shouldn't say all of it. We do a large, a large portion of it. We still do, of course, much on road and, and real world validation and testing as well. Um, in the upper left, you can see our double E laboratory where we have some, some desk birds as we call it and some oscilloscopes working away there. In the right, we have a test track that we've built 
and you can see that we've actually modeled services we found in the real world around the globe. So you'll have your, your cobblestone from Europe, your, your average paved sidewalk, um, some things we found kind of in areas where there might be construction. And so uh, we actually have a 250 step design validation process. So once we get down to the bottom of that V, it actually is over 250 different tests that we run for every vehicle or every revision of a vehicle to reclassify it again as, as complete and meeting all of our criteria. In the lower left, this is one of my, my favorite rooms. Um, we have an environmental chamber and inside there we have a, a, a dynamometer, which allows us to put different workloads on the, the motor um, and the electrical systems of the vehicle and also change the environment. So it allows us to see what it might be like driving uphill in San Antonio in the, 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 the summer or driving downhill in Minneapolis in the winter. And so this allows us to really tune the system. And it, as you heard Dave mention, our system automatically adjusts in real time based on the environmental conditions to make sure that everything is operating within the, the operating envelope that we specify. In the bottom right, you can just see one of our designs in CAD there. So this is certainly a, a lot of fun, but it's a lot of work and, and we, we take it really, really seriously. Um, and so the final section I'll share with you is just um, what are some of the results of all this hard work? And currently we believe we have the safest battery technology on the market. BERT has industry leading IP67 and IP68 waterproofing and batteries and with each generation get safer and safer. We believe we have the safest rider experience on the market from accelerating, steering and going over bumps to evasive braking. Riders are safer on a berm. We believe we have the most durable vehicles on the market and durability equals sustainability and safety. We believe we have the most serviceable vehicles on the market. Burt's vehicles are repaired faster, which means they're available to customers quicker. We have state-of-the-art vehicle diagnostics, and I like to call this a check engine light on this, a picture of check engine light on steroids. We weren't the ones to invent this. In fact, the consumer grade vehicles that we started with, um, they actually had vehicle diagnostics from the very early days, and we were the first ones that started sending them, sending them up to the cloud and, and analyzing those and using those to take actions on vehicles. We've since learned a lot in these three years and have iterated a whole lot on that system. So Bird 2, which is the, the vehicle that you've seen the most of in this, in this deck, has over 200 different fault codes, and we add, we add to those all the time depending on what we learn from the vehicle. And so the vehicle has different severities of fault codes. Um, it can send those to us in real time. It can send them to us over the cellular network. It can send them to us through a customer's phone. Um, there's a lot of different data that comes off of these things. And we use that to continually tune the system. Some of the fault codes can be um, solved automatically. Some of them will take the vehicle out of service automatically. Some of them will trigger operations teams to service the vehicle in a non-urgent manner. And some of them are just data collection points. As Dave mentioned earlier, you know, even if, if water gets into a place that's not supposed to be in, we'll immediately take the vehicle out of service and, and get data on that right over the, at the, at the, the at the real time. Um, and then finally, we have continual improvement over time. So as I mentioned, we're always working on both the hardware and the software of the vehicle. And software you know, updates go out very quickly, um, usually after, the, after they pass our validation. Um, and then hardware updates can go out, you know, at a slower pace. But if we decide that we have a, a better version of kickstand or something, we will end up stocking those parts in our repair centers. And then as those need to get swapped out, we'll make sure that we put the newer version on. So lots of challenges, but um, we, we certainly take safety very, very seriously and, and um, try to keep listening to the voices of our customers. And I think at the end, um, you know, it's very fun to see where micromobility has come in three years. And it'll be really interesting to see where it gets to in the next three years. Um, so, and here's a picture of uh, our latest creation. Uh, I think I think this is in Milan or Rome. <laughs> but thank you for having me. It, it's a pleasure to present and uh, really enjoyed all the other talks so far. Thank you. Thank you for presenting, Scott. Okay. Up next are fourth speakers for today in the uh, design and research session will be Dr. Tina Garman and Steve Como with Rider Kinematics and Vehicle Dynamics Testing of Electric Scooter Riding. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, so 
as, as Lauren said, uh, Tina and I work at Exponent, and recently we've conducted some research uh, regarding rider kinematics and vehicle dynamics, um, testing of electric scooter riding, and we will uh, skip over our bios because Lawrence just did that for us. So thanks for the introduction. And I'll turn it over to Tina. All right, thanks guys. Um, so just really quick, this is a quick history of electric scooters in the United States. And I think this is a little known fact, but the first stand-up motorized scooter was actually created in 1915, quite some time ago, by a company called the Autoped Company of America. Um, there was another design in 1919 with a seated design um, by a company called, um, or with a, with a device called the Scootamoda. And scooters really didn't see much happening until about 60 years later in 1986, we have the reintroduction of a gas-powered stand-up scooter called the GoPed. And then between 1986 and 2009, that's when the um, advancement in battery technology really exploded. And by 2009, we had a company come out with a scooter called, um, it was a garage project, it was called My Way. And um, after that, scooter companies started to um, join the rideshare program. And by 2020, we have like over 350 cities that have rideshare programs now and scooters have hit the market running and we all love them. And um, we're excited to sort of share the research that we've done with them here at Exponent today. And so I'm going to kind of skip over these ones a bit because this morning we heard so much about all the regulations and, and all the uh, committees going on to try to regulate everything. So um, as, as we saw with this morning, there, there's a lot of uncertainty and, and not necessarily a lot of commonality uh, between different states, cities, municipalities. Um, and so that's what a lot of these uh, committees are trying to solve right now. And so Tina and myself um, are members of the ASTM committee. Um, and you guys heard from all of these other committees today, so I'm not going to really speak too much to those. Um, Exponent has conducted a lot of micromobility research recently. Um, we've got a few publications here that we've submitted to SAE. Um, and earlier this year, um, Tina and myself authored this uh, micromobility vehicle dynamics and rider kinematics um, in regards to electric scooter riding, which is what we're going to focus on here today. And so, what we did for our testing, uh, we had a rider, uh, ex a number of exponent riders that we instrumented with these IMUs that Tina will get into in a little bit. Um, we instrumented a scooter and we designed the test course uh, meant to simulate an urban environment. Um, and we were able to collect a lot of data uh, throughout this testing. And so here you can see the instrumented scooter that we had. Um, we had a uh, number of different things uh, measuring some interesting data. So we've got a strain gauge that was measuring the load on the stem as the rider uh, was riding. We had forward and rear facing cameras um, that was able to show the terrain uh, to correspond to the, the data as well as the rider foot position. Uh, we had a potentiometer measuring steer angle of the scooter, a GPS unit um, that was capable of measuring accelerations, velocities, uh, roll pitch yaw of the scooter and a number of other parameters. Um, and we also had, uh, we tapped into the, the brake and throttle positions that allowed us to uh, look at the rider inputs as testing was ongoing. So not only is it important to instrument the scooter, but it's also very important to instrument the rider. So the rider is essential when evaluating performance. This is not like a motorcycle rider system where the bike is two times the weight of the rider. Um, for scooters, the rider is the critical mass in the system. And we need to be able to understand rider performance in order to develop the test methodologies and metrics that help inform best practices and encompass like a broad variety of riders. And so because of that, we need to instrument the rider and we do that with these little wireless wearable inertial measurement units. And what these can do, we can put these on different bony landmarks on the rider and we can characterize stability by evaluating accelerations. Um, accelerations and angular rotations and even positions. So these IMUs are great. They fit in the palm of your hand. You put them on the rider and you go. They're not attached to anything. They collect data at 1200 hertz. They, uh, they can do uh, tri-axis accelerations, rotations in each direction. They're great. So we instrument the rider fully with that. Um, and Steve, you can go ahead to the next slide. The testing environment that we did uh, is we wanted to simulate more of an urban environment. So we have our startup period where they're starting with that push off. They slowly go to a stop sign 
at the stop sign, they stop for a little bit and they make a left-hand turn through a slalom course. The width of the slalom course was five feet and we're using that to simulate riding in, um, on a sidewalk and sort of weaving in and out of pedestrians. The next thing we had them do was an unexpected stop. So the rider got up to his maximum speed and then we had a moderator yell at them as loud as they could stop, like you'd see for somebody, you know, trying to warn somebody of an accident. So we had the rider stop as fast as they could. Once they came to a complete stop, they kept going and then they performed a variety of low speed U-turns. All right, next slide. Okay, so first, um, a very easy thing to analyze is we put a GoPro down at the foot well, um, I'm sorry, at the base of the scooter, and we're trying to analyze different foot positions. So as it turns out, each rider um, that we, t or a variety of riders had a variety of different foot positions. For rider one, for example, he had a little bit of larger feet, so he had a tandem position, but he had his back foot up. For rider seven, this was a smaller female, and she chose to ride with her two feet sort of um, right next to each other. Rider two and rider three, interestingly, both have their are right-handed and right-footed dominant, but they chose to put um, different feet forward when they were riding in this tandem stance. So this just really tells us that the base of support for these riders are going to be very rider dependent, and we cannot um, we cannot just say that the riders are going to all riders are going to ride in a dominant foot forward tandem position. So go ahead and move forward. Now, um, I can't get into all of the metrics that we looked at, but if I were to choose my two favorite and the two most important, I think is rider lean angle and scooter roll angle. So the manipulation of these angles is what is going to control the scooter. So that, um, you know, if you were to turn left, you need to roll the scooter to the left, but you also need to manipulate, manipulate your body either to um, make the turn or to stabilize yourself on the scooter. So if we look at these charts, the highest lean and roll angles we saw were during the slalom and the U-turn course, which makes sense. The scooter achieved angles up to 48 degrees. So that's a pretty pretty decent angle, and the rider up to 24 degrees. Now, in order to determine sort of some of the temporal behavior of the lean versus roll angle, we actually have to look into the data a little bit further. So, Steve, you can switch sides. And I know this is um, kind of intimidating, but let's just look at that first square that I've highlighted at a, on the top graph. Yes, yeah, so if we look at that, um, what we see here, the roll angle of the of the bike which um, is highlighted in red and goes uh, about to negative 45 degrees is achieved at the same angle at the same time as the maximum lean angle of the rider so what's happening is as the rider is moving or as the rider is rolling the scooter to its extreme values to the left and the right they're leaning their body in the opposite direction in order to maintain balance on the scooter and we actually, we see this during motorcycle riding as well, which is a cool correlation during some of the low speed motorcycle riding. All right, you can go ahead and change slides. Uh, the, the next one that I wanted to talk about um, is the braking data. And like I said, the task here was to brake as fast as you can when you hear someone yell stop. And you can see the variability in the rider brake timing. For example, if you look over at rider eight on the plot on the right, um, the rider eight stopped in 0.8 seconds, whereas if you look at rider two, it took rider two 1.65 seconds. And it took rider two almost 20 feet to stop from the initiation of the brake signal till he was fully stopped. So depending on the rider, depending on where they're putting their weight on the scooter when they're initiating the brake, depending on if the brake is in the front or the back, all of these brake timing, brake distance are going to be very variable. Now you can change slides. Um, and then this is just to show you actually what the actual brake data looks like. So a quick representation of that, and um, because I think brake testing is going to be very important when establishing standards. And the key here to brake testing is tapping into the brake system so that you actually get a signal when the brake turns on so you can evaluate this data. You can see the purple um, circle over here. We have the brake turning on, and from that point forward, we can go ahead and we can look at the acceleration that the device is seeing. We can look at the IMU data for the acceleration the rider is seeing. We can look at brake distance. Um, and we can also look at um, things like 
STEM load right after the break occurred. All right, you can go ahead and move on. And so kind of going off of that, uh, you can see here some of the break data that we collected. And so basically on this chart, what you'll notice is that there's a variety of uh, velocities at break initiation as well as a ver variety of braking distances corresponding to those depending on the rider and depending on the surfaces that they're on. And so obviously for the higher brake initiation velocity, you get larger braking distances, which we're seeing up to 17 feet. Um, over here, we're also looking at decelerations on three different surfaces, which you'll notice is consistently less on dirt, which makes sense uh, with what we would expect compared to asphalt and concrete. Um, however, we're getting very similar values uh, between the asphalt and concrete and somewhat varying depending on the riders. Um, understandably, it's hard to generalize any of this type of data when all of these scooters that we're seeing out there have so many different designs uh, within their wheel systems as well as their brake systems. And so, in addition to the, the research that we did for this one paper, we've also done uh, work for a number of micro mobility companies at Exponent. Um, and so we, we've utilized our terrain testing, uh, including cobblestone courses, potholes, uh, parking brake hill that has about an 11 degree angle to it, um, as well as some rough road with some cracks in the road. Um, we've also utilized some data collection tools like this Dewey Soft backpack that we've rigged up, um, which has an umbilical connecting to the instrumentation on the scooter, uh, which the rider can wear. And this can actually collect at 1,000 hertz, um, which I'll show you on the next slide, um, and actually has the capability to stream data uh, during our data collection. Uh, this is a pressure footboard that we designed using some strain gauges that will give you the pressure on the front and rear of the deck. Uh, and this is also the GPS uh, plex unit that we were showing on our research scooter that can collect at 100 hertz and collects all kinds of different vehicle dynamics, such as position, velocity, acceleration, et cetera. And as I mentioned, this is our Dewey Soft system, which is capable of recording at 1,000 hertz. Um, we have our terrain cam here, our foot position cam here. Um, we were measuring shock displacement, pitch and roll of the scooter, uh, steer angle, throttle and brake position, uh, velocity, handlebar load, uh, amps from the motor using a shunt at the motor, front foot and rear foot uh, pressure, and also uh, accelerations, longitudinal, lateral, and uh, vertical. All right, and then one more quick thing that we can do also with those IMUs is we can look at um, different riders across different devices. And this was a simple study where we just slapped one of those IMUs on the back of one of the of um, several different riders and just had them ride around town on different types of scooters. And here we're evaluating their movement. Um, so this is as if you were looking down like on a bird's eye view. Um, so the wider the, heat, the, the larger the heat map, the more movement their torso has on the device. So you can look as you're um, going from scooter one, so take subject two on scooter one. He has a very tight um, torso movement. He's not moving at all. He's very, um, seems to be very balanced on the device. He goes to scooter two. He's got a little more movement. And then he goes to a bike, a, a manual pedal bike, and he's got a lot more movement. So just very simple things we can do in order to determine rider stability. And next slide. All right, and so that's basically all we have. Research and testing is essential to help further our understanding of performance and safety. There's variabilities in rider, variabilities in scooter design. So we really need to determine what metrics can help define these safety standards. And hopefully we presented a few metrics that um, maybe you guys can think about and uh, add to. So thank you again. Thanks for joining us. And please feel free to reach out to either of us with questions and comments. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Steve. Okay, up next, we have Morgan Lomley and Alex Logman with e-bike market demographics and standards. So Morgan is the Director of State and Local Policy for People for Bikes, 
She manages the bike industry's presence across the U.S. to ensure that new and existing laws and policies benefit bike riders. And Alex is the policy counsel for People for Bikes. He provides policy counsel for state and local monitoring programs. Thank you guys for being here today. Thank you so much. Hi, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. This is Morgan Lomley, and thank you for that brief introduction. Um, we we are here, Alex and I are here to provide just an overview specific to electric bicycles. I understand and have um, been fortunate to listen in on a lot of um, helpful information regarding scooters and micro mobility devices. And I'll, I'll give you all a quick overview of people for bikes and um, the, the areas that we work in specifically and, and wanted to kind of preempt this whole presentation um, with the caveat that Alex and I are um, bike and e-bike policy experts and, and certainly can't speak to um, electric scooters and hoverboards and, and the variety of other devices that are that are addressed today and um, hopefully this is helpful to you all. So we um, I'll move on to the next slide please. Hey Morgan, um, yep. sorry to cut you off. I, I'm not seeing your screen right now. Oh, go ahead and um, ask me to share again and then I'll, are, okay. are you going to control the slides or shall I? Um, let me try um, requesting to share again. Okay. Was there a little pop-up that came up? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. All right, we should be ready to go here. Um, wonderful, sounds like that works. So I'll move on here. You met me, you'll hear from my colleague Alex, our policy counsel in just a few minutes. We'll be tag teaming this presentation and then our subsequent one later in the day. Um, I promised a quick overview of People for Bikes. People for Bikes is the Bike Industry Trade Association, or actually equal parts of 501c3 foundation, a kind of a charitable foundation. And Alex and I work squarely on our 501c6 uh, coalition side. So we're the Bike Industry Trade Association. Uh, People for Bikes has been in existence for about 20 years, and we represent uh, nearly 200 members of the bike industry that uh, make and sell bikes, bike accessories, electric bicycles all of the major uh, brands that you know of and the smaller ones are, are uh, mostly represented in our coalition so we speak behalf on behalf of the bike industry today um, and as i mentioned our, our members make complete bicycles complete e-bicycles parts accessories and components so anything that's on a bike or that um, uh, is a bike in, in its complete form um, it is manufactured by our members so I'll get into demographic sales data and uh, research around electric bicycles, and Alex will cover um, the existing federal product safety standards and regulations, voluntary or not, um, that govern the, the manufacturing of, of electric bicycles, low-speed electric bicycles. So thanks for bearing with me as I kind of go into a few of the details around who currently rides e-bikes. And what we know is much different than, or kind of what we know and what we've observed is much different than um, some of the uh, demographics around e-bike riders only five years ago. If we had had this discussion five years ago, we would have um, noted that e-bike riders in general are uh, primarily folks who currently ride bikes and who are looking to continue to ride bikes in, in older age or uh, to overcome any kind of physical or cognitive um, limitation. Uh, currently today, we're seeing electric bicycle riders of all stripes, of all ages, of all um, types of physical and cognitive abilities. Um, couples currently ride uh, e-bikes uh, to overcome any kind of uh, limitations that one might have in, in keeping up on a bike. Um, we're also seeing uh, a number of different uses for e-bikes for transportation and mobility purposes in, in cities primarily increase as well as people are looking for uh, either a replacement for a vehicle or something to supplement the way they get around town um, for trips that are primarily within one to five miles. And we know that the most trips that people take in the country are, are under five miles and very easily accessible uh, by bike, but even more easily accessible by, by e-bikes since e-bikes um, help overcome any of the barriers to bicycle 
healing, including terrain, carrying cargoes and kids, um, maybe some of the barriers to, to car ownership. So the demographics of e-bike riders um, are very broad, and we understand that that's growing as well as, as more types of e-bikes enter into the marketplace that overcome any of the barriers to bicycling or even the barriers to car ownership. Sales. So the, the 2019 e-bike market was more than $15 billion. And if you look at e-bike units, so that's an individual e-bike that was sold at a store, um, that number has, uh, in, uh, over the last five years, has um, grown almost a 1,000%. So in 2016, when People for Bikes really started doing some um, some in-depth policy and regulatory work around e-bikes, the e-bike e unit sales at a local bike shop were about 17,000 and uh, in 2020, only in the first six months, that's 115,000. So you can all infer that this growth is tremendous and unprecedented within the, the bike industry and only set to grow more. Um, these are numbers that we source from the NPD group, which is a consumer insights firm that provides data to um, the bike industry. And these numbers are sourced from independent bike retailers and don't cover online sales either. And online sales account for, um, I would say at least 25 to 40% of e-bike sales too. So these numbers are generally understated, but do paint that picture that e-bike sales are growing um, very rapidly. I want to get into some studies and speed um, issues, and, and you heard from Dr. Chris Chair already today. Um, you have or will hear from John MacArthur and a number of other experts uh, who are, are participating in this forum are the experts on speeds and, and, and the, um, some of the usage studies around electric bicycles, but I wanted to highlight a few a few um, aspects of the body of research that's already out there that paints the picture of um, the relative safety of um, riding an electric bicycle compared to riding a bike and other micro mobility devices. So, um, e bikes in the uh, not in federal statutes, but in 28 states and counting, are classified within three classes a class one and class two e bike. The maximum assisted speed is 20 miles an hour. Um, that's not the average speed, that's just the speed at which the motor will cut off. And what we know from um, the body of research that's been conducted in the last few years is that e-bikes, of course, travel slightly faster than regular bikes on flat and uphill surfaces, but in terms of um, uh, on uh, downhill surfaces and some flat surfaces, the, the average speeds of e-bikes are very similar to that of the bikes, but it really depends on the desired experience of the e-bike rider. Um, what we know is that uh, many of those folks who ride e-bikes um, within the demographics I presented aren't looking for speed, they're looking for a bike-like experience and of course are subject to the same statutory or posted speed limits. Um, so many of the preconceived notions around the speeds of electric bikes um, are anecdotal in nature and, and not supported by, by a vast body of research. So all that to say that the, e the average speeds of an e-bike rider are um, similar to that of a traditional bike rider and, and, and very much subject to the terrain, the type of e-bike, the type of rider, and that desired experience. So I, I always caution against uh, wholesale statements around the average speed of an e-bike. It really depends on a number of factors. Um, one study out of Israel shows that riding the riding spe speeds of e-bike riders compared to regular cyclists was about three to five miles an hour faster. And very broadly speaking, I think that's representative of the research that um, you know your uphill speeds and your flat speeds are um, just a little bit faster by to the tune of three to five miles an hour faster than a traditional bike rider. Um, I will speak to some of the research that's been uh, developed by a number of the folks who, who are participating in this forum, but again, kind of paints the, the picture of um, a survey of about 1,800 e-bike riders. Um, this survey was conducted in, I believe, 2018, and some of the um, uh, results that came out of it showed um, that um, what we know from crash severity of bike riders versus e-bike riders is that the severity, of, uh, the number of crashes is generally similar, but the severity of an e-bike um, related crash um, is, is generally a little bit higher. Um, the, the crash risk between class one and class three e-bikes is um, similar, like I said, but the severity is a little bit higher. Um, there's a, a note here on speeds, average speeds of a class three e-bike is uh, of course a little bit faster than a traditional bike. And um, 
we are finding that the, the conflict rates and kind of safety oriented maneuvers of uh, e-bike riders in general is, um, are different than those of bike riders that need to be examined separately. Oops. I want to point out a couple of studies that were actually conducted, gosh, it seems like a, a, you know, a long time ago, but in 2014, um, the city of Boulder, Colorado, uh, saw an onset of e-bike riders on shared infrastructure, so generally a separated bike infrastructure. And um, what they decided to do was plant, uh, not plant, but survey um, the types of bike riders and e-bike riders that were using our shared infrastructure here in Boulder, Colorado, and for a year-long uh, study. And what they noticed was, Back in 2014, already about 1% of all bike riders were um, e-bike riders, and there were no noted um, issues of conflicts or crashes or um, issues related to passing or speeds um, as e-bike riders and bike riders and other trail users use that shared infrastructure together. So again, gosh, we're looking at something that's already six years old now, but those studies kind of carry true or carry forward. Um, uh, today as well. We're seeing that e-bike riders and bike riders are able to use shared infrastructure with relative um, minimal hazards to each other. Um, Jefferson County, Colorado represents about 7 million um, unique users every year on their shared uh, bike infrastructure. And Jefferson County also saw a number of e-bike riders um, starting to use their shared infrastructure and decided to study that. And what they, um, the two major takeaways from this research is that um, a lot of the the first is that a lot of the per, per, perceived conflict around e-bike riders from the perspective of a bike rider or other trail user were just that were perceived and when they asked people what their opinions were before an e-bike ride and after an e-bike ride those opinions are generally much more favorable after they actually got to test one out um, about two-thirds of park visitors um, had a more favorable opinion of e-bikes after they had ridden one for the first time so there's a lot of emotion around um, the perceptions of e-bike riders um, and then when asked whether they knew they were sharing the trail with an e-bike rider, if they weren't riding an e-bike, um, you know, more than two thirds of those folks did not realize they were sharing one with them, but um, might have opined in a survey that uh, that shared experience was not something that they desired. So again, it goes to show that there's still a lot to learn and to, to kind of prove in terms of um, how e-bikes and bike riders share a trail from a human dimensions perspective, but there's still also a lot of emotion and, and um, unjustified uh, angst around um, uh, the sharing that infrastructure that I think we can overcome as more people do share infrastructure and more people ride e-bikes for the first time. Um, so again, I, I won't go into too much detail here because I, I imagine that Dr. Cherry and John MacArthur uh, might have covered this already in terms of um, e-bike research, but there is a fascinating and very um, in-depth uh, survey of um, e-bike owners that was published in 2018 that looks at the really the different segments of demographics of types of e-bike riders and organizes that into kind of older adults, younger adults, and, and females and families and their desired experiences and their reasons for using an e-bike. And it, it, it covers everything from the desire to stay active older in life, the desire to stay mobile without a car in, the, in urban areas, and the desire to um, carry cargo and kids around town to replace shorter car trips. Um, and the safety findings within that um, survey are fascinating as well, just showing that people generally feel safer riding an e-bike than a traditional bike as they move around town. People are able to um, get where they need to go faster, but also taking a longer route to avoid um, what they would consider a safe, uh, unsafe um, segments of road or intersections. And that perceived safety plays a really big role in whether someone will ride an e-bike or a bike um, instead of other modes of transportation. So I would recommend everyone um, review that for more information on demographics and, and the types of people who ride e-bikes and why. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Alex, for some information on some of the federal safety standards around e-bike manufacturing. Thanks, Morgan. And Alex, I'm happy just to do quick... that if you'd like. Great, can I uh, just do a quick audio check to make sure you can hear me? I can hear you. Yep, I can Great. hear you too. Thank you very much, and thanks for thanks for having us today. I'll, I'll move quickly here, so I know we're a little bit short on time, and I want to make sure we can take some questions for all the presenters on this panel. So, uh, I just want to do a quick overview of um, some of the federal safety standards that do apply to electric bicycles in the United States. Um, 
and a, a important caveat to, to starting here with 16 CFR section 1512. This is the section of the Code of Federal Regulations that um, specifies what the requirements are for both bicycles and electric bicycles. But um, there's something kind of in the background um, uh, of this section, and that is a federal statute that actually specifies what an electric bicycle is. And um, only, only devices that meet the requirements of that federal statute, in fact, are subject to these uh, bike regulations here. And that has a few parameters as well. So um, essentially, uh, the e-bikes the e must have a, a maximum wattage of 750 watts and a, a maximum throttle powered speed of 20 miles per hour. So um, when we focus on um, bicycles and, and the needs of our members and people for bikes, we're really thinking of uh, the e-bikes that meet that federal definition. Um, and, and are in fact regulated as bicycles um, within the context of uh, the CPSC uh, regulations here. So um, bicycles do have a very comprehensive set of, of regulations that apply to um, regulate a broad range of their, um, you know, structural in, the structural integrity of, of the frame and the fork, their component functionality, um, and then also they relate to things uh, like use. Um, so I, I won't go through all these in, in detail, but I will give you a few examples. Um, you know, the frame and fork will have to meet uh, certain strength requirements uh, to ensure that, you know, they, they won't fracture under certain types of loads, uh, that they don't have sharp edges on them, that things like candle bars have uh, caps on them to prevent uh, against something like an impalement uh, in the event that there's a crash. Um, they regulate things like drivetrain strength, so how strong that chain is going to be and how much load it can take. Um, in terms of components, obviously braking is a big one. You must have front and rear brakes. You have a specified stopping distance that a bicycle and an e-bike both need to meet. Um, and then there's also regulations pertaining to where the brakes need to be, uh, brake levers need to be located in order to be accessible to the bike rider. And then in terms of functionality, there's some use-related things like uh, pedal clearance so that when you're cornering, uh, the, the user isn't likely to, to clip a pedal and have a, a crash as a result of that impact between the bike and the ground. Um, and then also uh, things like toe clearance so that the wheel doesn't get stuck behind the rider's toe and, and fixed out at a, um, at a turning angle when, in fact, the rider wants to go straight or um, when the rider's trying to turn, it doesn't bump the foot and prevent them from turning. So there's a, these are pretty in-depth in terms of regulating the bicycle itself, but they don't in any way um, address the, the specific features of an e-bike in terms of the, uh, the drive unit, the battery, uh, battery management system, the charger, things like that. Uh, those are not addressed in 16 CFR Part 1512. Um, one important thing to note is that on e-bikes, um, the electrical system doesn't control the braking. They, the brakes may interact with the electrical system through a, through a brake inhibitor, meaning that if the rider squeezes the brake, it will cut off the motor as a safety feature. But um, brakes are, are either cable actuated or they're um, typically on a, um, a, a separate cable actuated system or a hydraulic line that is independent of the electrical system. Uh, next slide, Morgan. You've already heard a lot about UL 2849 today, so I'm not going to go into a lot more detail here, but suffice to say, um, this is the uh, voluntary standard that the bike industry uh, worked together to create uh, that addresses those aspects of an e-bike that are not addressed in, in the CPSC regulations for bicycles. So the drive unit, the battery, the battery management system, uh, the wiring, the power inlet, the charger, these types of issues are all addressed in, in UL 2849. So between these two, um, between the CPSC standards that are in 16 CFR Part 1512 and UL 2849, I think the bike industry feels good that there's a pretty comprehensive set of standards in place to um, deal with the, the various structural and electronic and battery components uh, of an electric bicycle. Next slide, Morgan. You know, I think the things uh, that's unique about bicycles in, in this conversation is that they have been regulated for so long. Uh, we're, we're an old industry um, and the, the Consumer Product Safety Commission regulate, re regulations go back, uh, I think, more than 40 years uh, at, at this point. So um, they have a, a very long history and a very um, 
a very long-standing set uh, of regulations that the bike industry has invested a lot of resources into uh, complying with. Um, as a result of the, the CPSC regulatory structure, all bicycles and e-bikes that enter the U.S. also um, are equipped with certificates of conformity uh, to um, demonstrate their compliance with, with those CPSC standards. So I think the bike industry uh, feels that it's in a little bit of a unique position in that it already has uh, a, a lot of these um, legal requirements in, in place. Um, and so it doesn't really want to reinvent the wheel uh, as we have this evolving technology uh, of e-bikes kind of layered onto a very mature regulatory system for um, bicycles that's been in place for a long time. And next slide, Morgan, I think that wraps us up. Thank you. And I'll turn it back over to our friends at the CPSC for questions, I think. We got one more presentation, but uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Morgan, and thank you, Alex. All right. So there was a slight change to our agenda. Um, ben LaRocca will be speaking in place of Paul White for the Intelligent Shared Mobility presentation. Awesome, you got it up. Okay. Um, so Ben has more than 15 years of experience in government relations and public policy working on Capitol Hill, state capitals, and city halls across the country as a staff communicator and lobbyist in tech, transportation, manufacturing, and consumer products. He was an early employee at Lime and now leads government partnerships for Super Pedestrian, which is an engineering and robotics company based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And also he works for their shared scooter brand, Link. Hey, uh, thanks so much. Um... I'm going to uh, get started by telling you guys a little bit of background about Super Pedestrian. As my guess, it's a little bit less of a uh, <clears throat> um, uh, household name than maybe some of the other scooter companies that you guys have heard from today. Uh, we were founded in the early 2010s by a gentleman named Asaf Bitterman. Uh, he was a, uh, he's a physicist by training, and he was a professor at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Um, he founded a lab called the Sensible City Lab uh, in the late 2000s. Uh, and, and the goal of this lab was to use big data to solve hard urban transportation problems. So this was everything, or you know, it could be things that are mundane. How do you collect trash more efficiently? Um, but also was involved in things like early micromobility projects, like how do you rebalance uh, station-based bike shares more efficiently. So they did like a bunch of work on the Valib uh, system in Paris, which is um, one of the, the largest and earliest um, station-based bike share systems. So um, he, he did a lot of work on a lot of different things. One thing was shared, um, shared transportation to reduce congestion, right? So cities are um, cities are getting more dense, um, and there's just ways that, uh, you know, we're going to have to move more people and we're not exactly sure what. So, um, his, his thesis was that in order to do that, we really needed, um, smaller vehicles. So he developed a technology called, uh, the vehicle intelligence system, which I'll get into in a little bit more depth in a minute, but it is really about how do you, uh, create affordable and safe electric vehicles when you don't have ownership. So if you own your own bike or you own your own scooter, you know that it's charged. You know that the tires are properly inflated. You know that it's uh, been maintained appropriately because you did all that yourself. When you step on a shared vehicle or, or sit on a shared vehicle, you don't have any of that same knowledge. So, um, and, and from just a from a, a cursory look, you might not know necessarily that the person that wrote it before you, um, you know, wrote it down a hill too fast and shorted out the motor or something like that. So, so you might not know some of those uh, inherent unsafe issues that have been discussed at length by many of the um, uh, uh, many of the uh, presenters today. So, uh, so he did this VIS. I'll get into it. Uh, his first product was an e-bike called the Copenhagen Wheel. 
Um, so Super Professor is spun out of uh, Sensible City. They produce this Copenhagen wheel. That was about seven years ago. So um, this is an e-bike that the, the wheel, the motor, uh, excuse me, the motor, the battery, everything is in the rear wheel of a bike. So it, it can be retrofitted on a normal bike or you can buy it as a system. It also had one of the first graphical interfaces with a phone. So the, the e-bike is controlled by, by an app. So you can set you know, how fast you want to go, if you want to you know, only have it uh, provide power when you're going up hills, et cetera, those sort of, those sort of things. Um, so uh, about three years ago, when scooters started, uh, started on the scene, they said uh, they, they saw some scooters you know, uh, that were probably not as robust as um, could, could have been uh, in the beginning. And they said, hey, we can make a scooter um, uh, as safe and efficient uh, as anybody. So we should do that. So they uh, they spent two years. Um, they bought every scooter they could they could find on the market. They have a, a, a an R and D facility in Cambridge where they broke them down. Um, we saw earlier about the test that you can put scooters under where you do how many newtons of force can be uh, on the stem or on the floorboard or the handlebars before you have issues. So so they they put them through a bunch of torture tests in their um, at their facility in Cambridge, and they came up with a scooter. Uh, you can see it on the screen here. It's called Link. Um, this scooter was uh, released in late 2019. Um, and at that time, we paired with a, uh, a bike share company called Zagster. They've been around for about a decade uh, doing a lot of um, scooter, bike, and e-bike um, uh, deployments with uh, colleges and cities and, and corporate campuses. Uh, and our first market was um, Fort Pierce, Florida. Um, so we are. Uh, so we've only been in the, sh the scooter sharing business for a little less than a year, even though uh, really our technology has been around for uh, about a decade um, in the making. So um, going on and just click the next slide, but it does not appear to be advancing. Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, here's the scooter. Um, you can see some safety features on here, which I'll talk a little bit about. It has two mechanical brakes and an electrical brake. Um, it's got a, a fairly large floorboard. So again, um, you, you, we heard that different people like to stand in different ways on the floorboard. So we want to make sure that they um, that they're that they're comfortable. And it was designed to be used with a uh, a five percentile female and a ninety eight percentile male. Any of which would feel comfortable on the on the the scooter and uh, from a mechanical uh, standpoint that it can uh, withstand those loads uh, and the forces that can be. Uh, felt, you know, going over a, a bump or hitting a pothole, et cetera. Uh, this this photo is in Columbus, Ohio, where um, we we are uh, deploying with all uh, with a number of our competitors. Um, so so talking about vehicle intelligent system, um, it it monitors over a hundred um, common failures, um, and and so uh, this this is this. This can be used for multiple different fault levels. Um, you know, if, if it detects that a single single battery cell is not per, not performing the way it should be, it can shut that uh, battery fault down. If it detects um, a, a stuck throttle or a broken brake lever, those things are very common in the shared um, in, in the shared space because of vandalism or a scooter getting kicked over or something like that. So it can detect those issues. Uh, and then it will either shut a ride down if it needs to, if it's not safe, or it can prevent a ride from being uh, sent. And uh, and and it, it because it self monitors, um, it will provide messages to our operations team that says, "Hey, come fix me. Hey, I have a problem. Hey, uh, hey, get me off the street because I shouldn't be out here. And uh, you know, I don't want to. My battery's low, and I need somebody to come get me so I don't uh, completely uh, go dead." And um, and then become uh, a hazard in the street for somebody to trip over. Um, uh, so so that does a couple things. Um, one, it allows us to have uh, pretty low operational costs uh, on, on two different fronts. One, it allows for a long lifetime of a vehicle. Uh, based on our our eight months or nine months in the field, we think that uh, our scooters are going to last about twenty five hundred rides a piece. Um, so our depreciation is quite low. Uh, and then also uh, it allows us to, uh, it, it, it knows when we need to fix scooters. So we don't have unsafe scooters out in the field that need fixing without being fixed. 
and we're not um, uh, spending money on uh, on fixing uh, on fixing scooters that uh, are that should be out being ridden uh, and and being able to provide a service to uh, to to the citizens of the city that we uh, that we serve. Um, so uh, this this slide is a um, it is a demo that we did of a very high temperature day at our, our test market in Florida. Um, we, on a very hot day, we rode our scooter and a couple test scooters up and down a hill a bunch of times. So it was very hot um, and, and tested how the motor um, and the battery system was able to dissipate heat. So, um, so the, uh, the blue line you can see is, is the baseline of how the, the motor would normally uh, function. The orange line was um, uh, another scooter as a demo, um, and you can see the the heat that um, the peaks are, are are a hotter temperature. And then the yellow line was our scooter, uh, and, and and the black line is the 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 goal for uh, for heat dissipation. Um, and, and and that VIS system was able to dissipate that heat safely, which uh, with much uh, lower peaks than um, than the, the test, uh, scooter. Um, so, uh, we've, e even though we are a new scooter sharing company, as mentioned, um, we've been at this a long time. We've been, um, uh, thinking about this, uh, and, and really perfecting the technology for a long time. So we have a, a patent portfolio, uh, that's quite extensive across the world, um, uh, in, in really dealing with some of those ways that, uh, the vehicles themselves can um, can keep riders safe. So, so I think something that's important uh, to think about is, uh, and we've heard we've heard about this today from a lot of folks. Some of the most serious uh, scooter accidents are are generally with a collision with a motor vehicle, right? A car hits somebody, or something else happens. It's a high percentage of the very serious crimes, or the very serious injuries. But a lot of the middle injuries, you know, the, the, the broken arms and the sprained ankles and a lot of that can be traced back to rider error or scooter malfunction. And I think that's where uh, we think we can make a big difference uh, through VIS. We can ensure that, uh, and, and, and basic vehicle design as well, that uh, the scooter we're putting out on the ground is going to minimize the ability of, of someone to uh, get into any of those real minor um, Minor accidents that that might happen, and and there's a there's a, a much broader safety um, philosophy that goes behind that. And uh, um, if anybody's interested in in having Link come to their city, definitely happy to talk about that. Um, uh, but anyways, yeah. All right, I know uh, we're running late. I'll wrap it up there. Uh, if anybody has any questions, would be happy to um, answer them. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for speaking, and uh, thanks for being ready. Um, I know on short notice. Okay, let's uh, go through some of the questions that we have here. Um, let's see, we got a two part question here, I think. Um, seems to be directed for UL and maybe people for bikes, but do you know how many explosions, fires, or electrocutions have occurred with consumer e-bikes and not the shared e-bikes? This is Benji. Um, as far as I know, the data could be as accessible and available, but I don't have it with me right now. And it's something that we can definitely look into and try to get you the data on that. But I don't know the number off the top of my head between ride share and consumer purchased devices. And more than likely that would come from the NEISS system that was previously discussed earlier today. This, this is Alex at People for Bikes. I think we'd have to defer to that question. We don't have any independent data um, that addresses that issue. Okay, thanks. And I guess I'll just ask the second part of the question. It's probably a similar answer, but 
um, how many injuries or fatalities have occurred from use of consumer e-bikes, not shared e-bikes, that were due to known product failure or defect as opposed to user error infrastructure or traffic motor vehicle crashes. This is Benji again. It's going to be also going back into this, the CPSC NEISS system and looking at that data to analyze how many specifics there are and differentiating. Um, but I don't know, the, we don't know the breakdown right now between rideshare and consumer products. It would be a matter of analyzing the data. All right. Thanks, Benji. Okay, this question is for Exponent. Did the riders comment on their experience riding on pavers and cobbles during dynamic tests? Did they feel stable? Was there discomfort? There, there was some uh, comments. Uh, we, we basically took surveys of all the riders uh, following our testing. Um, the cobblestone and pothole riding was for uh, something else. It wasn't for our SAE research. Um, that being said, uh, Tina was actually one of the people doing some of that riding, um, and she had to drop off this call, but she <laughs> did uh, talk about the discomfort uh, riding on cobblestones and, and potholes and, and things like that. The, the scooter, and you can see in the data as well, you can see all the vertical uh, accelerations jumping drastically. You can see all the shock uh, displacement data, um, and it, it's pretty apparent that it's not a very comfortable uh, environment to ride on. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, it looks like we have another question for Exponent, but I think it can also be opened up to the group. Um, what are your thoughts on tire size and how it relates to transitioning between different kind of surf floor surfaces? Sure, I'd be happy to start with that one. Um, and so that, that's actually some, some additional testing that we are looking at doing. Um, we have looked into doing more research uh, with different tire sizes and, and a few different designs. Um, that being said, the testing that we were doing uh, focused on a single scooter. It, it didn't have a number of different scooter designs within it, um, but that, that is some testing that we are hoping to pursue in the, the near future. Yeah, this is Scott from Bird. We, we've done an extensive amount of testing with different tire sizes and, and different tire materials, and um, we've actually deployed vehicles that have everything from hard tires to kind of in-between tires that are um, that do not have a tube but have an air pocket in them. And we've kind of settled back on um, really an automotive grade tire for an e-scooter sized vehicle. And we found that with that combination of actually having a chamber with, with real air in it and not a solid tire gives the best performance over uh, cobblestone and things of this. Um, currently we're using a 10 inch tire and, and don't feel there's a big advantage to going much larger. Thank you. I think we got another question that can be opened up to the group. Um, what are your thoughts on a new CFR being written for e-scooter and e-mobility devices that reference the requirements similar to 16 CFR 1512 and also reference UL 2272 for requirements of e-scooter and e-mobility devices? Hey Lawrence, this is Benji. Um, and when it comes to that aspect of it, if there is a mandate that would point to the applicable standard, if you look at other industries that have followed that rationale and that logic, it, it makes it a more of a requirement then to comply with the full system level evaluation 
So that would be one of the benefits of having such a consideration in place is that you would then, it would be a aspect of each product on the market that it would comply with a adopted and known safety standard and would potentially reduce, result in a reduction of the potential explosions, fires, and electrocutions that are addressed in the UL standard 2272 and or 2849. Thanks, Benji. Okay, Ben, it looks like we got a question for you here. Um, it was mentioned that many minor injuries are caused by rider error. Is there data that indicates what types of error, errors riders make that lead to injury? Um, so, I think there's a lot of decent sources out there. Um, uh, Austin did a great study with the CDC. I know um, Portland has done some work as well. Uh, my former company, Lime, just put out a really interesting uh, and I thought really impressive um, safety uh, uh, safety sort of a data set out yesterday or the day before. Um, and and I think what what most of that data says is that a huge number of injuries are on like the first or second ride. Um, and so dealing with that first ride in experience is, uh, is a big deal. So um, like uh, city of Seattle um, awarded permits last week. Um, one of the things that they are requiring is that all first time riders cap their speed at eight miles per hour instead of the normal um, speed of 15 miles per hour and, and hopes that it'll reduce that first time. Um, and then I think the other real main risk factor is um, uh, uh, is alcohol consumption. So I think you know those two factors in general are two that are pretty um, pretty important. Um, things like good vehicle design can help on a lot of other things. Like if you have been riding scooters for a while, um, you know the difference between sort of the six inch wheels, eight inch wheels, and ten inch wheels make a huge difference. And, um, you know, a 10 inch wheel uh, with a good shock absorber uh, is just so much more stable of a vehicle than sort of the first six inch wheel scooters that were, were being used a couple of years ago. Thanks, Ben. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question here. Um, question for people for bikes, uh, how, I believe it's for people for bikes, how do the e-bike hazard scenarios differ, if at all, from the bicycle hazard scenarios? This is Morgan. I think this is a good opportunity to point out that what we know about the way that e-bikes are used and bikes are used is very similar and the hazards and risks, um, which are completely separate conversations, really are dependent on not primarily dependent, but one of the major factors is the availability of safe infrastructure for people to ride. And um, I mentioned, I talked a lot about desired experiences during our presentation. The desired experiences are very similar between e-bike riders and bike riders and the perception of safety is dictated by the availability of uh, safe, connected, comfortable infrastructure. And I, I can't answer that question directly, but I think we really need to point to the fact that e-bikes and bikes um, are similar in their operation and um, in their kind of desired experiences and um, the relative safety of a rider can is primarily dictated by the availability of, of safe and connected infrastructure. Thank you, Morgan. So our last session of the day and our fifth session is uh, policy and consumer safety. And the moderator for this session is my colleague, Jay Katawala, and I'll be handing it off to him now. Thanks a lot, Lawrence. Uh, my name is Jay Katawala. I'm an electrical engineer uh, working in the electrical group of engineering sciences at CPSC. 
Uh, I've worked with the agency now for about four years. And around the time that I started was when uh, the UL 2272 uh, outline of investigation was being um, uh, uh, becoming a published standard. Uh, so since that time, I've worked on lithium batteries and micro mobility products as they have evolved over the last uh, few years. And uh, I'm also a uh, Virginia licensed attorney, but here uh, really just um, uh, doing this work um, in a technical capacity. So uh, have done uh, quite quite a bit of uh, testing work um, in this product area. Uh, so that's my uh, experience. Uh, what I have to contribute here. So with that, I wanted to introduce uh, the first speaker in our policy and consumer safety uh, panel. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Sherry uh, Shafflin from the U.S. Department of Transportation. Sherry has 34 years of public service spanning tribal, state, and federal governments and nonprofits. She has led leadership positions in the Federal Highway Administration Office of Planning, Environment, and Realty for 16 years. Currently, as Director of the Office of Human Environment, she supervises three teams with responsibilities that include advanced multimodal connectivity by addressing bicycle and pedestrian networks, mobility innovation, environmental justice, and economic development. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Sherry. Thank you very much. Um, I just really want to express my appreciation for all the great presenters thus far today. Uh, there's just tremendous professional and high quality work going on. And I really hope that we at the federal government can help amplify and be partners in continuing to roll out uh, mobility options that are safe and effective and give people of all uh, abilities a choice to get where they need to go in an equitable way. So everything we can all do to pull together to help that end, uh, we certainly appreciate it and look forward to working with everybody on that. Um, I am trying to represent today the uh, high level overview of the work that uh, my office has been facilitating and coordinating primarily with federal highways, but across USDOT and that's going to include uh, NHTSA, our Office of Secretary, and uh, FTA, and others that are all pulling together our subject matter expertise and resources and programs to try to be responsive to this um, growing and emerging uh, mobility option. So let me uh, first start with I'm not getting the slide to move. Let's see. There we go. Um, as, as you can imagine, in a large organization, we are trying to all speak with the same voice as we've had with this many presentations already today. Um, but we are somewhat bound by a very long list of uh, federal laws, policy, regulations, and definitions that have uh, kind of put pedestrian and bicycling activities into a box. So it is not as easy for us to just uh, rename and start calling things different things. So we are all, uh, this is our current working definition. Uh, uh, to generally say micromobility refers to any small low speed human or electric power transportation device, including bicycles, scooters, electric assist, and fully electric bicycles electric scooters, scooters, and other small lightweight and wheeled uh, conveyances, okay? The reason that uh, we are quite interested in this is uh, micromobility has been able to grow because of the gains that all of our partners, local, state, uh, federal land management agencies have made in implementing their bicycle and pedestrian networks. And we have a large uh, uh, support and acknowledgement of all the efforts that have gone in to make all of these uh, networks more ADA compliant, 
particularly with the curb ramps. So by virtue of having safer, more complete streets, trails, sidewalks, uh, really the multimodal foundation of a supply is what is generating the demand that's provided by all the various micromobility options we've heard about today. And um, our contributions just in the bike ped world, you know, are about a billion dollars a year from various programs uh, that leverages other monies and uh, all the planning activities that are accomplished under these resources set the stage for people to uh, be opportunistic to figure out how to finance uh, fixing, completing uh, gaps in their network so that people can actually get where they want to go. And so let's, um, you know, that's the greatest thing that I think uh, Federal Highways and USDOT is bringing to the table is to build out the bike and pedestrian network system and all the responsibilities we have that go with that. So with this rapid evolution of micromobility, which we've heard about today, uh, let me sh share with you what it looks like through the eyes of a Fed. Um, certainly our challenge is um, how do we uh, keep up in a conservative moving transportation planning, project development, uh, design standard and financial management kind of world when we have a rapid evolution of micromobility. Um, we care because uh, these new travel modes are becoming a growing part of the picture of urban mobility. Um, I'll provide a few numbers in the next slide again to see how it looks through our eyes, but basically the data and research are showing that these micromobility services and devices can help improve mobility and service areas um, and also improve the effectiveness of transit systems. And it will help us hopefully it reduce the demand for vehicle trips and parking and even reduce traditional uh, congestion and activity centers, um, not just for passenger travel, but also for goods delivery and the growing demand for last mile logistics with the use of e-cargo bikes, uh, deliveries and robots of various sorts. Um, we fund quite a few of these programs through a variety of federal aid funding sources. So we certainly have an incentive that uh, this investment uh, fits in a uh, sustainable uh, transportation system, that the economics work out, the subsidies combined with the user fees, you know, create systems that have uh, lasting value and lasting time to them because people are planning their lives, uh, their ways to work and other means around it. And certainly from our perspective, uh, we start to figure out how many, you know, a new mode is introduced. So now what's the mode shift look like? Who's, who and why are people shifting from one mode to the next? And how are people starting to trip train and move through uh, space and urban areas? And that all starts to fall in our planning and modeling and data management kinds of issues. Uh, we also, of course, need to understand the design of these vehicles and how each of them interact with our various multimodal facilities because we have a uh, responsibility to design and provide guidance on how to design streets, bicycle facilities, signal signage, pavement markings, uh, and obviously deal with the safety data information. Uh, and most importantly, uh, how to address the policy goals we have to make services more equitable and available to all users of all abilities. Another unique aspect is managing the operation of the fleet of vehicles so that they don't create accessibility barriers along sidewalks and congested pedestrian areas. Uh, we've made a big investment in retrofitting facilities to make them compliant with uh, ADA needs. Uh, the sidewalks, the transit stations, access to buses, and to have it, these areas rendered inaccessible with dockless vehicles is, is just not going to be a win-win for anyone. So uh, kudos to everyone trying to make it work for all users. And many of the aspects of the micromobility devices use um, innovative technologies from various technology to manage software used to identify service locations. And 
the message certainly in this administration and from our secretary Elaine Chao is that we need to engage with emerging technologies to address legitimate public concerns about safety, security, and privacy without hampering innovation. So that is um, our posture moving forward. So many folks have shown some of these slides and the growing numbers and the increase. Uh, as a manager, how it looks to me is uh, the feds have to engage. We have to build our capacity to be ready to answer questions that our uh, agency leadership is going to have, that our stakeholders are going to have, primarily for uh, Federal Highway, for example, the state DOTs and the metropolitan planning organizations, and then certainly Congress. Uh, we are seeing an increased demand and technical assistance request as reauthorization proposals are moved forward. Um, but a couple of the stats that are impressive, uh, and uh, referring obviously to the NACDO data, uh, in the United States in 2019, people took 136 million trips on shared bikes, e-bikes, and scooters, and that was 60% more than 2018. And since 2010, the numbers show about 342 million trips on shared bikes and scooters. In 2019, 109 cities had dockless scooter programs, 44% or 45% increase from 2018, and it contributed to an over 100% increase, increase in trips taken on scooters nationwide. Um, so what this tells me from a pro managing a program to build out infrastructure is the demand for having higher quality, comfortable uh, infrastructure to accommodate the variety of users that are trying to squeeze into the available space uh, is going to be a challenge and how they're going to move through intersections uh, becomes a challenge. But I think that demand for more comfortable infrastructure is growing and we certainly uh, expect it to amplify as we look at the post-pandemic uh, user needs and perspectives uh, that have changed. So one place to keep track of this, and I want to do a great shout out to uh, the Bureau of Transportation Statistics and USDOT. I hope folks have had a chance to visit and see uh, some of their data. They released uh, in 2019 a new interactive map that documents the documented the rapid growth of docked and dockless bike share and e-scooter systems across the country. And it shows uh, by city the name, the system, um, and you can see trend uh, video from 2015 to 2019 as the data um, symbols grow, come, go away, and come back in various uh, uh, graphical ways. So the total bike share and e-scooter systems had reached almost 300 uh, communities serving, uh, almost 300 serving more than 200 cities as of July 2019. Uh, they also have released a new map that shows dock bike share ridership has fluctuated during the recent pandemic months. And we've included a second link down there for folks to click on to uh, see some of that. And please stay tuned to this site uh, because uh, they will be releasing some uh, data that shows uh, detailed uh, uh, comparative months to comparative months trend for 12 of the major cities that have uh, public data available and uh, ways to play with that data that are of uh, great interest to researchers and advocates and industry and uh, practitioners. So moving on to the work that we're doing uh, in uh, research, uh, uh, in regards to working with folks on federal lands, uh, we have an interagency agreement with the Forest Service that will include a research project uh, to assess and evaluate emerging trail users and uses. Uh, it'll identify um, micromobility options and include e-technology such as e-bikes or other technology and assist, assisted devices for people with disabilities. And this project will begin uh, in uh, out, out another year. Our federal lands uh, office, we are working with them to research the future of e-bikes on public lands and how to effectively manage a growing trend. Uh, this will identify the inventory of existing and potential impacts related to e-bike use on public lands and be followed by an analysis of the data 
to inform science-based decision-making and the management process for land managers. We have also joined the National Park Service Emerging Mobility Working Group to share best practices. And all this information is, uh, and uh, coordination is really important because as you, many of you may know, the Department of Interior is getting ready to uh, finalize their e-bike regulations. And that really starts to send, you know, national signals that we're, you know, ready, willing, and able to support the U.S. traveling public to use these devices in increasingly uh, different places. And once folks start using them in recreational sense, they'll start using them to get to parks or uh, visit uh, nearby gateway communities. And so we start to introduce and send signals of safety and use and ability to handle these uh, devices uh, on the system that we have available. So uh, we will continue to be working with all the federal land management agencies to share best practices and help with uh, safe rollout. So moving on to our uh, kind of laundry list here of work that we have underway. And let me check the time uh, and move through this pretty quickly. Uh, we have a number of internal working groups that um, include people from safety, uh, infrastructure, our operations that deal with MUTCD, planning, uh, and, and, and subject matter experts that are all trying to work together to kind of lump all the new activities going on in mobility innovation uh, into a micromobility group, a mobility on demand, and a mobility innovation work group. So the point here is that we are quite able to push and pull information as people want to work with us, have requests, uh, invite speakers in, and keep um, the good body of knowledge going as we all come up to speed and try to help in these issues. We also, with our growing uh, capacity building, are positioned now to support a number of external coordination activities. And uh, I just give a few examples here, and we're certainly willing to hear other key places where we should be involved. Uh, but working with APTA and a number of uh, organizations in the DC area uh, to have conversations about moving micromobility forward. Uh, the large transportation research board has a number of committees that are addressing this, but a prime one is the mobility Man management committee that uh, tries to figure out how to integrate all the shared mobility activities. And certainly the National Science Foundation, uh, we've been working closely with them with their smart and connected communities and helping to review proposals and provide technical assistance on uh, innovations for uh, what kind of uh, new mobility devices solve problems in communities with the university community, uh, working very closely with uh, uh, community organizations so that the research is applied. Uh, it's a great program. And then certainly the uh, larger associations that are the uh, ability to bring a wide variety of stakeholders together to share information. We've recently uh, got staff membership in the uh, uh, North American Bike Share Association. On the right-hand side, you'll see a number of our research projects, uh, products, uh, micromobility memos. Uh, uh, and I note these are internal, so they're not going to be publicly posted, but they are what we try to produce to bring everyone on the same page in a really large organization, uh, which we've done with uh, uh, kind of background and perspectives on what the federal role is. And then there's a phase two uh, memo that is addressing uh, the status of research between all of the, uh, well, nine different federal agencies where we uh, interviewed federal agencies on what their needs and issues and research issues were. And we'll be sharing that so that we can coordinate amongst the feds working in this space and perhaps uh, move to a, a, uh, an informational sharing body in the near future. And with our uh, Safe Routes to School program, we wanted to get some insight into uh, if children are starting to use micromobility devices. Uh, what you have externally available is this uh, report on the uh, basics of micromobility and uh, devices for personal transport. Uh, that we have worked with uh, the Pedestrian, Bicycle, and Information Center from uh, University of North Carolina. Uh, we are significantly fund them to do a lot of uh, bicycle and pedestrian work and have extended some requests for services to keep track of a lot of the micro mobility issues and help us uh, 
synthesize and package information, and one of those is uh, e-scooter management in mid-sized cities. Uh, we also are working on a case study to uh, that was describes kind of the evolution of micromobility in Santa Monica, California, as it's gone up and down, and they've responded to challenges as they have rolled out their program. Uh, coming soon, so keep an eye on our livability website, our uh, micromobility fact sheets on our activities and research underway for both Federal Highway and US DOT. And then, of course, I've mentioned the BTS maps. Uh, so I will end with that and be happy to uh, answer any questions. I think that's where we are. Let me double check. Wait, I think we've got, oh, excuse me. Those are the pictures of the uh, uh, resources that are up at the Pedestrian Bicycle Information Center. And um, sorry, my slide was stuck. And then really just the final closing slide here. Uh, this is the work that we have under development as well, uh, working with uh, how multimodal networks will fit in our uh, connected and automated vehicle future and integrating emerging mobility into transportation management for all the planners out there. And with our curbside management work, what we're building on from some of ITE's work is uh, we'll include uh, how we manage the curb for micro mobility devices as well. And um, uh, through our ITS JPO office, uh, working on special studies about uh, opportunities and challenges for shared mobility uh, infrastructure. So keep an eye on, on these sites and this information. And then closing with uh, the Transportation Research Board information, uh, it's a big sign that uh, state DOTs and transit agencies are supportive in trying to figure out how to manage micromobility by uh, through these very competitive research programs, picking research topics that have to do with uh, micromobility. And you can see those listed there. And uh, we have summarized a lot of this in a attachment that you will see in the handouts and, uh, uh, and access for um, contacting any of us that we can, so we can help you with anything that I've brought up today. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Sherry. Uh, really, really great insight. Uh, so that last document that she was referring to is in the handouts tab on the right side. Uh, if you have any issues uh, opening that up, um, you know you can you can contact um, uh, any of the um, the contact uh, the points of contact, and we can uh, provide that for you um, even later on if there is any issues. Uh, so with that, uh, let's move on to the next speaker. Um, so the next presentation is uh, Safety of Shared Micromobility Systems by Edward Fu and Lawrence Wilsey Sampson. So Edward leads the policy, legislative, and regulatory functions at BIRD. He led the creation of nearly every state law governing the micromobility industry and is a frequent speaker and lecturer on micromobility policy and regulatory issues. Prior to joining Bird, Ed was a litigator at Davis, Polk, and Wardwell in New York. He holds a JD from NYU and a BS in computer science from Rutgers. Thank, thank you, Ed. Uh, Lawrence Wilsey Sampson is a senior manager for policy research at Bird. He holds the position of senior research fellow at the Center for Competition, Regulation, and Economic Development at the University of Johannesburg. He has a doctorate in economics from Columbia University. So with that, I'll turn it over to Edward and Lawrence. Hey guys, uh, thanks for that introduction, Lawrence. My name is Ed and I'm here with a, a different Lawrence today to talk about the unique safety considerations associated with shared micromobility devices. A lot of the discussion today, including from um, our much smarter coworkers at Bird focused on the safety considerations associated with the physical hardware, especially for the scooter, which is a new physical mode for riders. But what Lawrence and I want to talk about today are the safety considerations associated with the shared ecosystems that these devices belong to. It's one of the very unique aspects of scooters and micromobility generally, which is that they are overwhelmingly used as part of shared systems and not as privately owned devices. And 
this pattern of usage introduces its own safety considerations that have to be considered as part of the broader micromobility safety discussion. So today we're going to look at four major areas, policy, governance, interface, and adoption. And Lawrence is uh, going to speak to policy. Uh, thanks, Ed, and um, thanks to everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to talk today. Um, so in terms of policy, I think the first observation I'd start with is that unlike more mature modes, uh, policy is, is set locally and, and it varies considerably from city to city. And I want to talk about three aspects of policy as they relate to scooters today. Um, but before I, I jump in, I think I'll note that this doesn't encompass policy for other vehicles on the road. And I think other, as, as, as others have mentioned, probably the most important factor for preventing severe crashes is, is likely to be the network of protected bike infrastructure or, or controls or, or speed limits on cars and, and trucks. Um, but in terms of scooters, actually, just to stop there, I think one of the things that makes it really hard to study the, the impact of different policies across cities is that cities are very different from each other. Uh, both in terms of the bike infrastructure, but also in terms of the set of policies that they have around uh, our vehicles. So you're not just changing one policy as you go from one city to the, to the other. So when you're doing these comparisons, it's really hard to, to tease out the impact of the different sets of policies. So just there's lots of confounding factors. So in terms of the, the policy type, um, things that are important that, that we see in terms of how we're regulated, I want to focus on three aspects. The first is, is speed limits. So this can be controls on um, yeah, on, on the speeds that we can go, um, the controls on, on where we can ride, so both in terms of the operational areas, but also in terms of like geofencing and things like that, and, and then in terms of availability, which is um, limitations on the times when scooters might be available. So for speed limits, generally speed, uh, citywide speed limits are capped at 18 miles per hour. We also see some cities with 15 miles per hour, and then there's, there's one city at least that I know of that has 10 miles per hour speed limit. Um, in addition to the city level controls and speed, there are geospeeding uh, limits as well. So there might be different speeds uh, applicable across different parts of the city. Um, uh, then in terms of like where, where, where scooters can go, there's both the operational area, but there's, and there's also sort of parts of the city that are maybe close to scooters or parts of the city that might be pedestrianized and close to, to motor vehicles, uh, to cars. Uh, both of those things might have implications for, for safety outcomes. Um, and, and finally, there are choices about whether or not to have a 24-hour service, seven days a week, or, or to limit that service for certain hours or, certain, or on certain days or certain parts of the city. Um, and cities and, and both cities and operators might have different approaches, and that also has different implications for safety. So in short, this is, um, this is a sort of a rich area for, for research. There's lots of variation across cities, um, and, and sort of there's, there's lots of work here to be done. So passing it back to you, Ed. So in conjunction with what rules a city set, uh, sets, it's also important how they enforce them. And to take the policy dimensions that Lawrence was talking about for speed limits, geographical limitations, and availability, these are enforced electronically for shared micromobility, which means that a, a, a rider on a scooter in a 15 mile per hour city can't go faster than 15 hour, miles per hour no matter what. If the GPS detects that the scooter is in a certain area, the scooter will slow down and shut off automatically. And after a certain time, you just can't unlock the scooter at all. And this is kind of a new enforcement paradigm. Uh, private cars, bikes, they, they don't do this. Your car doesn't slow down when you turn onto a different road. It doesn't automatically shut off when you reach a certain street and it doesn't get disabled after midnight. And I know um, uh, David Zipper has a great article in City Lab about what such an impact might have, uh, what this paradigm might have, the impact it could have on car safety. Uh, but the point is, is that we don't do this for anything right now, except for shared bikes and scooters. And so this is a new area, and I think there's a lot of opportunity and also some risk. And the opportunity, I think, is obvious to, to, to all of us, which is that there, there's a lot more com compliance. It's one thing to educate riders on what they should do, but it's another to take that discretion away from them and put it in the hands of the vehicle. You get a lot higher rates of compliance as a result. But I think when you phrase it that way, you can also see the risk inherent to it, which is that one, people aren't used to their vehicles being in, um, enforced like this. And two is that policymakers aren't always used to setting policy under such expectations. So I'll give two examples. One is speed limits. A lot of the road speed limits for cars are set at the 85th percentile. So the idea is that 15% of drivers will exceed that speed for various reasons at any given time, like passing or so on. But a speed limit on a scooter, when you put it on a, as part of the speed governor, is absolute. Your scooter can't go faster than that, even if you needed to. And so from a policymaker perspective, the, the question isn't, what's the speed we should recommend people travel at, or what 85% of people should be driving at? The question is really, what is the absolute maximum speed anyone should ever be allowed to travel on one of these devices, no matter the situation? And that's a very different approach to setting speed limits. 
geofences is another example. So for starters, it's kind of a strange experience to have your scooter just slow down and stop as if you hit some kind of invisible wall. Uh, there's not often a lot of signage that tells uh, scooter riders or shared micromobility riders generally what's going on. And so there's some challenges with rider education and awareness that we have to tackle. Um, but GPS is also isn't a perfectly accurate system. Um, w once I was I was riding a uh, competitor's uh, scooter when it suddenly came to a stop in the middle of a busy intersection right as the light was turning. And it turns out that the scooter thought that I was at the pedestrian plaza at the corner of the intersection where the city had set up a, um, a, a, a very sensible geofence. But obviously it didn't intend for the geofence to start right in the middle of the intersection. And so I'm thankful that everything worked out okay, but it's a, it's a good example, I think, of the limitations of automatic compliance that we have to take into account uh, when, when we start enforcing things with this new with this new kind of paradigm. And I'll pass it to Lawrence to talk about uh, interface. Uh, thanks, Ed. Um, so another safety tool that's unique to shared devices is the app interface that our riders use to access our devices. So we can layer into that some safety nudges and training that might not be available always on, on private uh, vehicles. So you, you obviously there's, a, there's an art to this. You, you don't want to overwhelm the rider. Too much information or too many things at the start of you know, when they open the app, that's going to um, overwhelm them. They're going to ignore and skim through or not use the service at all. So you want to make just tailored to be exactly the right, right amount. Um, one of the set of things that we do is, is around rider education. You open the app and you'll get an education on the on rules of the road for the city that you're in before you're able to ride. Actually, before we even launched in Chicago last month, we pushed a safety quiz in the app, which riders could take to learn the rules of the road and earn, and earn ride credits. Um, there, there's a few more opportunities to be innovative. Um, one is warm-up mode. That's, a, that's an option available to riders to, to choose to ride with reduced acceleration. You open the app and you select the warm-up mode and the vehicle's acceleration is automatically reduced. Um, another feature that which we've implemented is helmet selfie. So riders can choose to take a picture of themselves wearing a helmet and, and receive ride credits uh, at the end of the ride. That's also something that we've done. And finally, there's also, there's, you know, finally, but also I mean, in addition, there's also uh, end of ride messaging. Uh, if riders have ended the ride in a, in a no park area or something like that, you, you, could, you might send them a message or a warning to try and encourage better behavior. So this is a, this app interface, which is you know, on our shared, uh, shared vehicles, is a safety lever that isn't always available to private devices or not implemented in private devices. And um, it's something that we encourage other operators to work with us on and, and develop, and perhaps eventually for us all to come to some consensus on. So just now handing back to Ed. Great, and so this is the, um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about is the same slide that I guess uh, everyone had the same idea of, of presenting today. Um, but this is really, the, this slide is the reason I guess why we're all here. And shared micromobility and scooters in particular are really, really, really popular. I don't think um, most of us anticipated a year or two years ago um, it's just exactly how popular this would be. Um, and it's particularly the fact that shared scooters went from zero to 88 million in pretty much two years um, because they were shared and not something you had to buy. And so it's hard to find a kind of precedent for this in transportation modes or even in, in, in a lot of consumer products more, more generally. And so this rate of adoption, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's very exciting for a lot of reasons, but it also brings some risks, of course. When you introduce so many new rides, you have a lot of new riders that are riding a brand new mode, sometimes for all intents and purposes, just didn't exist a few years ago. Drivers aren't as familiar and people are gonna be riding in neighborhoods and cities without a lot of uh, adequate bike infrastructure. And all of these factors affect safety and risk. But I think there's also opportunity here. Um, there's safety in numbers, uh, the sheer number of car trips that are being eliminated. We, we've taken tens of millions of car trips off the street, and that's you know that that that's a meaningful safety impact that's that's maybe hard to quantify, um, but if it has it has a real impact. And most importantly, as I think um, people before me have have said many times uh, more eloquently, but in, infrastructure really is the single most important thing we can do for bike and scooter safety. And it's, this isn't a new idea. It's not, it's not something that, that anyone's just discovered recently. But the harsh reality is, is that it's one of the hardest things for us to do because of politics. And like it or not, cars remain a dominant mode of travel and, car, and they don't particularly like their parking or their lanes being taken away from them. But I want to tie this to what um, Ms. Schaffline and Dr. Cherry mentioned earlier, which is that what, what, you know, when there were those uh, tragic fatalities in Atlanta, um, I think last year, the city, you know, one option for the city might have been to shut down the program and said, look, you know, uh, we, we don't want to deal with this. Uh, you, you should get back in your cars. Uh, if surrounding yourselves with several tons of metal, um, you know, make, makes, you, makes you safer. Um, but they didn't do that, and they took a different tack. Uh, the city of Atlanta recognized that the real underlying issue here was that their citizens wanted to ride bikes and scooters, but that their transportation network was designed for cars. 
but that more importantly now, thanks to this massive demand for shared micro mobility, there's also overwhelming demand for bike lanes and safe places to ride. And so the city now had um, enormous political will and momentum to triple their bike infrastructure and invest millions into their streets to make them safer for everyone, not just bike riders and scooter riders, but pedestrians and other cars and, and drivers too. And so that's the long-term change I think we're most excited about at Bird. This kind of these kinds of structural changes um, that create safer streets for all of us are ultimately I think have a bigger impact than almost anything else we can be doing. And so we're really excited about that possibility. Thanks. All right, thanks a lot, uh, Ed and Lawrence. I uh, really appreciate uh, your participation today. Um, I know uh, getting late in the afternoon here, um, so really appreciate everyone's patience. Um, so that for the next uh, presentation, uh, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Huddleston um, with a statement on safety and continued uh, innovation in micromobility. Uh, Jennifer is the Director of Technology and Innovation Policy at the American Action Forum, where she focuses on the intersection of emerging technology and law. Her work has appeared in a wide range of outlets, including USA Today, the Chicago Tribune, Business Insider, Slate, the New York Daily News, and The Hill. Jennifer has appeared on media outlets to discuss technology-related issues. She has also testified before Congress and state legislatures and has been a regular panelist on issues such as transportation innovation, data privacy, and liability for content on online platforms, including Section 230. Jennifer has a JD from the University of Alabama School of Law and a BA in Political Science from Wellesley College. Welcome, Jennifer, and uh, please continue. Thank you. Thank you. Can, hopefully, I, all the technology is is working right now. Um, thank you for the introduction. As was said, I am the Director of Technology and Innovation Policy at American Action Forum, where my research, broadly speaking, covers the intersection of law and technology. The topic of micromobility has certainly been an exciting one when it comes to that intersection, as we've continued to see innovations in transportation technology occurring more rapidly and in ways that many of us could not have anticipated. In my uh, statement today, I plan to make three key points. First, when considering the safety related to these micromobility products, particularly e-scooters, that policymakers should consider making regulations that don't deter future innovation or improvements in safety. Secondly, that when safety policy is at hand, we must be cautious that policies don't unfairly distinguish based on the nature of the ownership of these devices, whether they're shared or private devices. And finally, what some of the opportunities for non-regulatory actions that can improve safety might be. So to begin with, I wanna discuss a bit about how policymakers should consider uh, approaching safety in such a way that doesn't deter innovation or future improvements. And there are two main issues that can arise. Either standards and descriptions can be set in such a way that are too narrow or too broad, and in both cases, they can actually de deter innovation in some ways. We can look at what's happened in some states to see how this might play out, particularly in the micromobility realm. For example, in Pennsylvania, scooters were initially not considered street legal, in part because of a very narrow definition. The definitions and regulations had been updated earlier to account for segways. So they were imagining a scooter that riders rode upright, that had large wheels, and that the wheels were went side to side. When the current e-scooters came on the market, most of them had wheels that went front to back. They were much smaller, smaller and you could have a variety of designs. So as a result, there was a lot of questions about what exactly categories of safety regulations and of existing regulations regarding road deployment these fell under. In Alabama, though, scooters encountered a different problem. The definition of motorcycles was so broad that there were actually arguments that it included 
dockless e-scooters and e-bikes as we heard about in some of the other presentations. Now, I think most of us would say probably there are significant differences in the safety risk between a motorcycle and an e-scooter or e-bike. But under the way the law was constructed, riders would have been expected to have to, to be subject to the same requirements and innovators would have been subject to the same regulations regarding, regarding their devices as much more powerful motorcycles. When considering the, these regulations as well, we also want to make sure that the description of the scooters does not deter potential safety improvements. So for example, right now, most scooter designs have two wheels, but it's possible that an innovator may come up with a safer design that involved four wheels, but was still something that would be basically considered a scooter. It might be possible that someone comes up with an adaptive device that is designed for people who may need to sit while using an e-scooter, but that would still be classified as a form of micromobility. With this in mind, Policymakers should consider how a more flexible approach can, to these regulations can allow such improvements to continue and not just so narrowly define a transportation innovation such that we aren't able to have those improvements, particularly ones that may promote future safety. With, we've seen such rapid change in the transportation environment, in part because we've seen policymakers signaling their desire for more transportation innovation and recognizing that we're seeing people think of creative ways to help everyone get from point A to point B in a safer, more efficient, and more enjoyable manner. Now, when it comes to these safety standards, we want to make sure that they are applied in a way that actually addresses safety and aren't used for other purposes. So my second point extends from that first point in that we want safety policy to, be a, to not be dependent on whether these are shared devices or whether they're a private device. As has been mentioned, in some cases we've seen cities implement speed limits. This seems like a reasonable safety precaution at times, but they're typically only applied to devices that are shared devices, only applied to devices that are part of a memorandum of understanding or a pilot program in a way. So a private scooter isn't subject to the same speed limit. In some ways, this might be the same as having one speed limit for taxi cabs and another speed limit for private cars. If the policies at play are actually about safety, then they should be applied equally to these devices unless there is a specific reason why the safety concern does not apply to a private device as well as a publicly shared device. So with that in mind, and the, there are certainly a lot of, of ways to address this, but we should make sure that they are applied equally and that we are not over-regulating shared devices, which have become increasingly popular, while allowing private de devices to, um, to have the freedom to, to innovate and explore. Finally, we also should consider what non-regulatory elements might be able to improve safety. We've seen a lot of growth, particularly as scooters have gained popularity when it comes to the, the public. This includes uh, companies that have offered safety days um, and other informative things that we just heard about like safety quizzes and the apps that can improve safety without regulation. Additionally, we've seen social norms evolve in such a way as people integrate these devices into the existing transportation ecosystem. Other things that could help include perhaps signage in areas where these devices are new to alert motorists as well as pedestrians that they're now in the area and to be aware of them. It can also include public education around things such as helmet wearing or how to ride safety done by government officials as well as by the private companies and including things like safety days where new riders can learn how to properly operate a device and what sorts of things they may encounter in their neighborhood. In a lot of ways, though, these are very community specific and innovators and policymakers should consider working together to determine how best they can go about um, serving that particular community's needs, particularly when it comes to what a rider might encounter in their neighborhood, but also to what other issues may arise. For example, 
if you're in the DC area that a lot of us are in, even in the broader area, issues can be very different. If you're in Old Town Alexandria, you're dealing with a lot different landscape and a lot more narrow streets versus if you're in other parts of the city where you may have bike lanes or broader streets um, where it may be more easy to operate. So working with those communities and working with both the riders and the policymakers and the innovators can help provide a safe environment for everyone and also can help make other people in the community more aware of how to approach these things. We've seen transportation changing more rapidly than ever before, and it's an exciting time in this space. It's also important to everyone that we have a safe mode of transportation. Scooters have shown that they are a way of, of safely getting from point A to point B, and an enjoyable way for a lot of people of solving that last mile pro problem. In that way, we've seen an incredible growth in popularity has been discussed multiple times today. And so we're in addressing these issues and considering potential safety regulations, we want to ensure that we allow innovators to continue to solve problems in creative ways. I don't think many of us would have predicted in 2010 that we'd be sitting here in 2020 discussing e-scooters as the next mode of transportation. So whatever that next spark of innovation is, we want to make sure that we allow it to continue as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. Uh, uh, really, really great uh, presentation um, and uh, uh, comments there. Um, so now we want to move on to our uh, uh, next speaker. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Rachel Weintraub uh, with a presentation on consumer micromobility safety issues. Uh, Rachel is the Legislative Director and General Counsel for Consumer Federation of America. Her primary focus is advocacy on product safety issues, representing CFA on behalf of consumers before the Consumer Product Safety Commission, Congress, state legislatures, and within voluntary standard setting organizations. She frequently talks to the media about product safety and other consumer issues, and has spoken about product safety issues at numerous national conferences. Rachel also serves on the F-15 Executive Committee of ASTM and is a past president of the International Consumer Product Health and Safety Organization and previously served on the board of ANSI. Rachel is a graduate of the Boston University School of Law. Thank you, Rachel, for being here and for speaking today. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Um, well, really, thank you so much for all the work um, that went into today's forum by CPSC staff and others, and also to all the presenters. Um, all the presentations were substantive and thoughtful and really interesting. So thank you. Um, one of the risks of going later in the day is that everyone has said what um, we were planning to say, but um, that is not entirely the case, so um, please stay tuned. So something that everyone has talked about, though, is that the growth of micromobility products in the United States has been profound, and along with the increased popularity has been increased reports of injuries, and as well as deaths. Um, I will discuss micromobility products, known incidents, um, discuss some data from medical literature, um, and provide recommendations to the CPSC. So first I will focus on electric scooters. According to a January 2020 journal of the American Medical Association, um, in an article they presented that more than 39 and electric scooter injuries were treated in emergency rooms across the United States between 2014 and 2018, which is an increase of 222% over the period. Um, and they analyzed the types of injuries that um, patients experienced, and that's what I'm going to discuss. Um, a third of patients suffered head trauma, um, a bit less than a third, 27%, um, suffered fractures, contusions and abrasions and lacerations. Um, on electric scooters, well, this was true before today, it's no longer true, um, but we're glad the CPSC has issued a report and communicated today about data about electric 
scooters, and we urge the agency and all um, government entities to take action, to monitor, investigate, track, and ultimately reduce incidents as these products continue to be and will likely will um, grow in popularity. Um, the CDC and the Austin Public Health Department conducted an epidemiological investigation that many of you are likely familiar with. Of the, of, and um, the analysis of these incidents was published in April of 2019. And it found that of the 190 injured, injured riders identified, 48% had injuries to the head. 70% sustained injuries to the upper limbs, 55% to lower limbs, and 18% to the chest, abdomen, um, and multiple injuries across body regions was possible. Many individuals sustained injuries to their arms, knees, face, and hands, and almost half of the injured riders had a severe injury. The study determined that there were 20 individuals injured per 100,000 e-scooter trips taken during the study period, and significantly, especially in terms of policies looking forward, the study determined that these injuries may have been preventable, and um, very few, only one of the 190 injured scooter riders was wearing a helmet. On to electric bicycles. Um, these products, as we discussed today, are similarly experiencing increased use and have been associated with increased incidence of injury and death. Um, and the growth is profound. Cities such as Chicago are starting programs making these products available, indicating that other cities are likely exploring similar programs that will increase the numbers of these vehicles across the country. The Journal of Injury Prevention analyzed CPSC NICE data of e-bikes, power scooters, and pedal bicycles from 2000 to 2017 and found that while people injured using e-bikes are more likely to suffer internal injuries and require hospital admission, power scooter injuries were nearly three times more likely to result in the diagnosis of a concussion. E-bike related injuries were more than three times more likely to involve a collision with a pedestrian than either pedal bicycles or powered scooters, but there was no evidence that powered scooters were more likely than bicycles to be involved in a collision with a pedestrian. 17% of e-bike accident victims suffered internal injuries compared to about 7.5% for both powered scooters and pedal bikes. And while population-based rates of pedal bicycle related injuries have been decreasing, which is a good thing, particularly among young children, reported e-bike injuries have been increasing dramatically, particularly among older people. So the conclusion that um, these authors drew was that e-bike and power, power scooter reduce and injury patterns differ from more traditional pedal operated bicycles. Efforts to address injury prevention and control are warranted, and further studies examining demographics and hospital resource utilizations are necessary. Um, I also wanted to point out that the CPSC has conducted at least eight recalls of electric bicycles due to a variety of hazards, fall, crash, and other injury hazards. Hoverboards. So as was discussed, and for those of us in the space, we are all very aware that these products were in the news consistently for causing fires and damaging property in 2016 and 2017. The CPSC is aware of at least 250 fire incidents involving hoverboards, and the CPSC estimated that um, there have been 13 burn injuries, three smoke inhalation injuries, and more than 4 million in property damage related to hoverboards. But in the first two years that these products were on the market, more people were actually injured by falls than by fires. According to an April 2018 article in the Journal of Pediatrics that analyzed NICE data for children under 18 years of age involving hoverboards and skateboards for 2015-2016, the authors found that there were 26,854 injuries serious enough to require emergency room treatment. Um, to drill down on what else they found, the mean and median ages for hoverboard and skateboard injuries were 11 and 13 years respectively. In both groups, boys were more commonly injured. 
The majority of hoverboard injuries occurred at home. The wrists were the most common injured body part and fractures were the most common diagnosis in both groups. The majority of patients in both groups were discharged from the hospital and approximately 3% of the patients with skateboard injuries and hoverboard injuries were admitted to the hospital. The CPSC has conducted numerous recalls, um, I counted at least 20, and issued safety alerts for hoverboards due to fire hazards. And we discuss um, the UL standard um, as well. The CPSC conducted an educational campaign focused on the fire hazards caused by hoverboards. However, newer products have caused fires indicating that perhaps the current voluntary standard may not be sufficiently addressing fire risks. And um, we urge the CPSC to focus on the fall hazards posed by these products as well. Another issue um, that was brought up briefly today, um, but not extensively discussed, is the fact that many of these products, especially when they are shared products, are connected products. The connectivity of an e-scooter or any micro-mobility product could serve to pose additional hazards to consumers. Um, we know of reports that an electronic scooter's Bluetooth module was hacked and that the hacker was able to control the braking and acceleration of the scooter. So we urge the CPSC, as well as manufacturers and, and retailers and providers of these products um, to address these issues for the CPSC to take enforcement action to protect consumers. Um, you know, and it's interesting because on the one hand, the connectivity could pose risks in terms of hacking and such as what occurred with the braking and acceleration. On the other hand, it's possible that these issues could be fixed in a much easier way than a traditional recall through um, updates to the software. Protective equipment. Um, that's something else that um, I think is very important, has not been ex discussed extensively today. Um, all micromobility equipment necessitates the use of protective equipment, such as helmets. Helmets may not be available that are specifically de designed to protect consumers from each of these products. And for micromobility products that are rented on the streets, for example, um, often, or at least in Washington, D.C., no protective equipment is provided, which increases risks of serious injury to consumers. In conclusion, the CPSC should engage in the documentation of incidents, the study of deaths and injuries, lead efforts to enforce reporting obligations, recall unsafe products, track and release incident data, support policies that reduce the severity and incidence of injury and death, and educate consumers, and all stakeholders about safe operation of these vehicles. Thank you very much. Happy to take questions at the end of this panel. Thank you, Rachel, for that presentation. Um, so we're, we'll move on to the next um, presentation. Um, so our next speakers, uh, my colleague Lawrence Mella has already introduced. Uh, once again, uh, here's Morgan Lamell and Alex Lagerman, uh from People for Bikes, uh, this time presenting uh, from the point of view of policy and consumer safety. So um, I want to hand it over to Morgan and Alex. Thank you. Hey, thank you again. This is Morgan. Um, you all heard from me and my colleague Alex just a couple hours ago as we covered some state safety and studies around e-bikes and um, I would be remiss to not uh, qualify our expertise again as strictly within the purview of bicycles and electric bicycles. You've you all heard a lot about e-scooters and hoverboards today from uh, much more qualified presenters than us and um, one of our overall goals of presenting today and um, one of the reasons we're very grateful to have been extended this opportunity is to uh, really uh, look to distinguish electric bicycles and bicycles from the variety of other innovative micromobility devices out there. And so what you'll learn from us um, in this presentation is a little bit of a shift from the prior presentations, even within this segment, but um, framing electric bikes as uh, from a, a state and federal regulatory 
um, and legislative perspective as, as more in alignment with bicycles than, than electric scooters and hoverboards and again the, the myriad of other products that we're um, seeing come to our streets and uh, fast and furious. So Alex and I will cover, um, let me move forward here, cover uh, state e-bike laws, federal e-bike laws, and then, and then close with a description of um, many of the, the federal laws that um, align e-bikes very closely with bicycles and, and in some respects um, uh, differentiate them from, from other micro-mobility devices today. So that's a quick intro. Um, this is me, uh, you'll hear from Alex as well. I did already go through the mission and background of People for Bikes, um, but just for those who just joined within the last few minutes here, People for Bikes is the Bicycle Industry Trade Association, and we speak on behalf of most, if not all, of the major bike suppliers and manufacturers of bicycles and e-bikes and parts and accessories across uh, the United States. So thankful again to be here and for this opportunity. So. I'll get into state e-bike laws, and again, it, it's somewhat of a deviation from some of the consumer-facing information we, we heard just in the last couple of minutes, but want to paint the picture of how electric bicycles are very clearly regulated at the state level. As you all know, the federal government through the CPSC regulates um, the manufacturing and first sale of e-bikes, and um, the analogy and kind of metaphor we give is that it's legal to sell an e-bike in all 50 states, but states clearly regulate where that e-bike can be used. So an individual consumer can go into a bike shop, legally buy an e-bike, but then the rules as to where you can ride that bike and how, and how vary from state to state. So about five to six years ago, People for Bikes and its uh, partners within the bike industry came together to clarify how e-bikes are treated within state vehicle codes with the intent of giving e-bike riders the same rights and duties as the road uh, to the road as a traditional bike rider. So again, this, this effort, just as e-bike manufacturing standards are defined in federal law consistent with bicycle manufacturing standards, we're looking for e-bike um, rules and to the rules and rights to the road to be very uh, closely aligned with that of bicycle rules and rights to the road. So what the bike industry did was proactively came together to define three classes of e-bikes that fall within the um, 15 USC 2085, which Alex covered a little bit earlier today. So all three classes of e-bikes fall within that federal definition of, of what an e-bike is specific to a bike. And we're looking for harmonized standards for state e-bicycle regulation across all 50 states. So at the end of the day, all 50 states would recognize an e-bike as a bike, as long as it falls within one of the three classes and I'll, I'll get into these details in just a second. We're, there's still work to do. Like I mentioned, we've been doing this for five or six years now, uh, six legislative sessions to be specific, and uh, slowly but surely moving to a total number of 50 states in DC that define the three classes of e-bikes. And there's still a couple uh, states that do not define e-bikes as bikes, and I'll get into um, what those states are in just a second here. So like I, like I mentioned, the industry recognized that state e-bike laws were all over the place and uh, decided to proactively uh, define its products within three classes. A class one e-bike is a pedal assist e-bike. You have to be pedaling to engage the motor, but that motor will shut off at 20 miles an hour. And as I mentioned on my earlier presentation, that 20 mile an hour is not the average speed. That's just the speed at which the motor will shut off and the e-bike rider is left to uh, human power alone to propel the, the, the e-bike forward. A class two e-bike is a throttle actuated e-bike. You can twist a throttle and you don't have to be pedaling to engage the motor. The bicycle does have to have oper operable pedals um, and that motor will shut off at 20 miles an hour, uh, just like a class one e-bike. So after 20 miles an hour, throttle or pedal assist actuated, you're on your own with a class one or two e-bike. A class three e-bike is a pedal assist e-bike. Again, you have to pedal to engage the motor and propel um, the bike forward with the motor, but that uh, e-bike uh, will shut off once uh, the rider reaches a speed of 28 miles an hour. So again, once the rider reaches 28 miles an hour, you're, uh, be, uh, you're up to motor, uh, human power alone. So those are the three classes of e-bikes. Those fall squarely within the federal definition for manufacturing and for sale of an e-bike. And I uh, cannot uh, overstate this, that uh, the 20 and 28 mile motor cutoffs are not an average user speed. That is the speed at which the motor will shut off. 
I mentioned our legislative work here and that uh, we uh, started six legislative sessions ago working to harmonize e-bike regulations within state vehicle codes across the country. So about six years ago, this map was all yellow or red. And what the red states mean uh, is that those state vehicle codes define an e-bike as a moped, a motorized vehicle, some kind of um, motorized conveyance, but not assigning the rider of that motorized conveyance the same rights to the road as a bicycle. Um, the states in yellow define an e-bike as a bicycle, but not within the three classes yet. Those are states that um, we are working, the red states and the yellow states are states where we're working on codifying the three classes of e-bikes so that um, a bicycle or an e-bike is a bike as long as it falls within the three classes. And you'll see 28 states in green here, and those are the states that uh, define a bike, an e-bike as a bike, so long as it falls within one of those three classes. So, in other words, as I mentioned, the uh, those states um, define the three classes of e-bikes, and a rider of a class one, two, three e-bike in the green states has the same rights to the road and same duties as a bicycle rider. In those 28 states, uh, there's also been codified a provision that requires the supplier of the e-bike to display a label on the e-bike um, with its class. It has to display the class, class one, two, or three, the um, top motor assisted speed of 20 or 28 miles an hour, and sometimes that's below those classes, but as long as the max um, under, under each class is 20 or 28, and the maximum wattage. And because uh, e-bike suppliers can't parse out what state they sell a bike into, you know, whether it's Rhode Island or Massachusetts or California, uh, for the most part, suppliers are just displaying the sticker under the clear coat, so it's not easily tampered with um, for sale in all 50 states. So the trickle-down effect from the 28 states that codify this provision requiring a class sticker is that, um, you know, by default, uh, all 50 states, uh, bike shops in all 50 states have e-bikes that all display this class sticker. So key takeaways, if, if you um, recall a few slides ago, that map that I showed you, the states in green are uh, geographically diverse, are politically diverse, diverse in terms of population and types of riding, uh, big cities, small cities. And so our work to classify the three classes of e-bikes as a bike in those states is very bipartisan. We've had support from across the aisle. And the reason I mention that is because we're when we um, work to develop legislative champions for these issues within uh, state departments of transportation as well, and on the legislative side, uh, we are able to find support from all stripes of regulators and legislators simply because we paint this issue as um, a kind of a common sense cleanup to state vehicle codes to align e-bikes with bicycles, um, knowing that e-bikes have also have a, a history of um, uh, you know, responsible safety. And we um, also show that e-bikes are, for the most part, e-bikes are operated safely and, and really offer a bike-like experience to the e-bike the e rider. And so it makes sense to update state statutes consistent with those three, those three classes. Um, we get a lot of questions from public safety officials, transportation planners, and land managers about what does this three class system mean? And um, what it really does is it provides that extra layer of regulation so that they can decide what classes of e-bikes go where and really provides a framework at the state level to regulate e-bikes um, more appropriately at the, at the local level. All of those states do have provisions that allow cities and municipalities and counties to uh, regulate e-bikes more restrictively or less restrictively than that uh, state framework, but we're generally finding that cities align with the state laws with just a few exceptions across the country. And last but not least for, for my end here, you know, states have chosen to regulate electric scooters and other shared micromobility devices separately from e-bikes. Um, you heard from Ed Fu earlier from BIRD, uh, and Ed and his colleagues, uh, both within BIRD and across the, the kind of sphere, we're very successful in um, updating many state statutes uh, specific to how electric scooters are regulated, but that really is a separate issue from um, how e-bikes are regulated and we work together to differentiate those issues. So um, when we're talking about 
these regulations and statutes that we've that we've helped put in place for e-bikes, it really pertains to private ownership of e-bikes, and they've been implemented at all 28 states and counting with really no no issues um, and no increases in, in hazards or risks to public safety. So that's something we're happy to report on. With that, I'll turn it over to Alex Logan, my colleague, and our People for Bikes Policy Council to get into some of the key points around the, the federal um, product safety laws for e-bikes. Thanks again, Morgan. Um, we've covered a little bit of this in the prior presentation, but I will give sort of a, a brief recap of, uh, of what the two big product safety laws do look like. Um, again, e-bikes uh, are, are defined by federal statute, and you can see the citation there, 15 U.S.C. 2085, um, and this federal law also states that e-bikes must comply with these same product safety requirements as bicycles, uh, which deal with a, a broad range of, of structural and use and component standards to uh, really regulate the, the bike part of the bike, but don't go into the electrical standards, which are uh, fall under that UL standard that we've heard about earlier today. Uh, I want to take a moment to talk a bit more about 15 USC 2085 um, than we did uh, in that earlier presentation and some of the details of, of that statutory provision. Um, it does not distinguish between pedal and throttle assist style bicycles. Um, so uh, it, at least in terms of the underlying federal statute, uh, bo both those types of e-bikes have sort of an equal um, regulatory status. Uh, there is a 750 watt maximum on those bikes, a 20 mile per hour speed limit under the motor power alone. The, the federal statute doesn't uh, specify what the um, top assisted speed of an e-bike is under uh, a pedal assist mode or combined human and, and motor power. Um, so that's one of the areas that the class system was intended to very firmly address is um, getting into that higher speed pedelec device and very clearly stating what the, the top end speed for that should be. And that 28 mile per hour speed limit aligns with international standards um, in, in most countries outside the US where the uh, maximum speed of a pedelec style device can be 45 kilometers per hour. So um, the class system harmonizes nicely with other international standards for, for e-bikes for those, um, those higher speed devices. Um, you know, I think one of the issues that our industry is really thinking about lately uh, with, with media reports going on of, of different types of um, issues uh, is um, confusion for consumers um, when, when somebody calls something an e-bike. You know, I think the recent Simon Cowell incident was uh, one that's easy for everyone to understand because it was so widely reported. Um, but there were a lot of media reports about uh, Mr. Cal, you know, being involved in an, in an e-bike crash and being injured as a result of that. And then, you know, over the next 48 hours after those initial reports, um, it turns out he was on uh, something that's quite a different uh, device than something that meets the requirements of the 15 USC 2085 here. And it appeared to be something that was like 5,000 watts of power and uh, a speed of 50 or 60 miles an hour. So I think that is in an issue for all of us in the micro mobility space is that uh, in terms of, you know, maybe marketing materials or, or media reports, sometimes these um, terms are used very loosely, uh, whereas for us, they have a lot of legal significance. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to do the best we can, I think, to emphasize uh, what exactly um, an e-bike is from our perspective in terms of the work that we do and in terms of the uh, products that the bike industry is putting out there. Next slide, Morgan. And then again, for the uh, voluntary standards, the, the, the 16 CFR Part 1512 is obviously a uh, required federal regulation that you must meet when you sell a new bicycle in the United States. But um, there are some additional standards that go beyond just that uh, federal regulation that specify, you know, the condition of the bike on the showroom floor. Um, and, and the class system, you know, I, I really would view that as a, a sort of voluntary and proactive effort of the bike industry to try and um, put some additional specificity um, on that on that federal statute, particularly for the class three e-bikes to ensure that um, we have a reasonable uh, upper bound speed for those types of devices. Those state laws also have a few additional requirements um, for e-bikes uh, 
throttle assist style bikes uh, need to be equipped with uh, brake inhibitors. Um, class three bikes need to be equipped with a speedometer. Um, so state law does provide a few additional requirements in addition to federal law, although they tend not to be really focused uh, so much on the condition of the uh, bicycle itself, um, but more so on its use. Um, also state law addresses things like the use of lights um, at nighttime or at sunrise and sunset. So e-bikes and bicycles are subject to the same requirements there um, as well. So those sort of have a product nexus, but um, not necessarily something that goes into that um, product testing in terms of 16 CFR part 1512. And then again, the UL standard for the electrical system, that's sort of been the uh, piece um, that, that was very much needed to determine what the standards would be for batteries and motors and things like that. So um, with UL 2849, that issue um, has been addressed in terms of creating uh, a, a national standard for e-bikes to follow. Next slide, Marty. And you know, again, uh, bikes just have, a, have an interesting posture in terms of the regulatory history um, and what they've been, you know, I, I think also their use history. We have a, a long history of um, people riding bikes in the United States and are, um, you know, I was really heartened today to hear so much of the conversation about infrastructure earlier on because uh, from People for Bikes perspective, that's certainly probably the biggest thing we can do to improve the safety of the, the bike riding experience. And that was, you know, really the foundational focus of, of People for Bikes when it was started as an organization was to um, accelerate the development of, of safe and protected bike networks that would hopefully eliminate these different, uh, you know, conflicts between, uh, between motor vehicles and bikes, but also giving bikes a dedicated space that's, you know, different from the sidewalk because you don't always want them there either. So, um, you know, providing those dedicated networks and those dedicated systems for bikes is, is the best way to uh, eliminate or reduce the incidence of the, the, the kinds of collision, I think, collisions that have been reported by some of these other presenters today or, or sometimes in the media. Uh, and that's a, that's a huge uh, focus as well. Next slide, Morgan. And, you know, moving forward, um, you know, I think the bike industry feels really good about where it sits um, in terms of in terms of product standards. We have also, People for Bikes, always been very heavily focused on the research side, particularly as we've started this, this e-bike work. Um, you know, there's a lot of deficiencies in terms of the research of uh, bike usage, bike injuries, things like that overall, but then also with the e-bike side. So it's an area I foresee us continuing to spend additional resources um, in the general research front and the safety research front to make sure that uh, any of the work we're doing in the e-bike space uh, makes sense from a safety perspective. Um, and then again, also continuing the um, the work we do on the infrastructure front to make sure that e-bike riders and bike riders have a safe place to go since so many of the uh, the issues that are presented by by daily bike use are really identical for those those user groups. And that's it for me. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Morgan and Alex. And I also want to say thank you to our other um, uh, panel five uh, participants, Sherry, Edward, Lawrence, Jennifer, and uh, Rachel. Uh, really appreciate uh, all of your insights. Um, so before we uh, move to the questions, uh, just have a quick uh, state uh, statement uh, to make before the discussion section. So just want to uh, take a moment to talk about uh, connected uh, consumer products. So uh, these products uh, pose challenges for our agency uh, because of software evaluation, which is a change from the typical engineering analysis that uh, staff has performed in the past. And so to that end, CPSC has been working with contractors and NIST to develop capabilities, and the agency has recently hired uh, Mr. Nevin Taylor, uh, spelled T-A-Y-L-O-R, uh, who will serve as the CPSC chief technologist. So in this role, he will help the agency establish standard protocols for evaluating these connected products, among uh, other responsibilities. So just wanted to um, uh, 
uh, let the group know about um, that recent um, hire that we made. So with that, um, I'm going to move on to uh, questions here for the for the group. Um, so I'm going to go. Uh, so to, to the first question, it's a little bit um, open end here, but uh, you know anyone in in the panel five that wants to uh, you know speak to this point, um, you know feel free to go ahead and um, jump in by unmuting. Um, so the first question is: Is can anyone speak to local uh, local requirements? and with regard specifically uh, directed more towards like the helmet requirements for um, micro mobility. Hey, this is Ed from Bird, um, and, and I can speak. I, I can speak to that. Um, my sense is that, um, and, and I might have uh, missed one or two, one or two cities here, but my sense is that as a general rule, uh, all of the cities follow the state's guidance on this. And when it comes to state guidance, my understanding is that the only two uh, states that that require it of that require it of adult riders would be would be uh, Oregon and and Washington. Uh, Washington State, that is. Um, I'm not aware of another jurisdiction. I think that has that has a helmet uh, that has a helmet requirement that imposes it, and this largely also tracks uh, this. I, I believe for for bicycles as well. Um, I, I I think probably some someone uh, that there um, people from bikes is probably better suited to speak to this uh, than I am. But my understanding, I think, is also that King County is one of the few few places uh, that requires adults on on adult cyclists, and so I think that the two track each other pretty closely. Uh, thank you for that. And any anyone else want to uh, share their insights regarding that question? Yeah, thanks. This is Alex Logeman from People for Bikes. Um, I, I think Edward's pretty on point there with his uh, answer as it pertains to bikes. Um, generally, this is an issue addressed in state law. Um, Probably two dozen states or so, maybe a little more, have um, state helmet laws that primarily address the use of helmets on children. Um, those could be for people either under age 12 or under age 18 in some cases. Um, and, and so that's usually what ends up being put in place. Uh, many states also have a helmet requirement for uh, class three e-bikes for users of any age. Well, thank you. Thank you for your insights there. So um, next question I have here, uh, it was actually asked right after uh, Ed, after you had, had spoken. Um, so given um, that GPS is inadequate for very precise geofencing, uh, are you aware of any technologies that exist beyond GPS that could potentially deliver a safe user experience while still maintaining uh, our adequate level of regulatory compliance? I think the answer to that is not right now. I think that there's a lot of very smart folks, um, and I think probably some of some of my colleagues uh, at BIRD as, uh, as well, that are working on um, sort of other technologies um, that, that, uh, that, that can address this issue. To my knowledge, most there's a lot of research that's focused on um, what happens if you can, if you know, basically if you can install a bunch of infrastructure around in a city that 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 can, that the scooter or the e-bike can res, can respond to. Um, but as far as as far as like something from 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 a satellite perspective, um, I think GPS is unfortunately a pretty mo the, the the best we have so far. With few caveats that there's 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 some things that you can do to make it a little bit more accurate. But at the end of the day, um, a GPS based solution in an urban environment is isn't going to be very accurate, and you're going to need um, a lot of uh, physical infrastructure. I think before you'll see an appreciable uh, appreciable um, resolution difference. Thank you for that. Um, so next question I have here is uh, regarding training for uh, micro mobility usage. Um, I guess what what are um, what are some insights that that the the panel five has regarding new riders and renters. Uh, to potentially reduce injuries. So this is, uh, you know, going more toward to the effect of, um, you know, perhaps an interface or uh, any kind of training or education um, that could be provided, um, you know, either at the time or even beforehand in order to mitigate some of the injuries that are happening. This is Morgan Longley, People for Bikes. Um, the training, helmet requirements, any kind of uh, restrictions or obligations placed on the individual are important. And 
we we should not ever use as as a red herring to <clears throat> preclude uh, the fact that infrastructure safe places for people, regardless of their device to go, regardless of whether it's a car, hoverboard, an electric skateboard, electric bike, a bike, an electric scooter, is the number one most critical aspect to ensuring safety of all consumers on our streets. Enough room for every single consumer, regardless how they choose to get around, is the number one deciding factor of whether someone will stay, stay safe in our public spaces or not. So uh, we, we, People for Bikes participates and leads some trainings. Uh, we uh, remain active in state legislative work to ensure consumer safety, but our primary focus, and one thing we'd really like to leave folks with, is the consideration that safe places and building enough uh, in the built environment to ensure consumer safety is a critical component of this work in ensuring consumer safety for years to come. Excellent. Um, so next next question I had is, um, it was it was asked with regard to um, uh, the city of Seattle, but I guess more generally, is is anyone aware of any specific uh, numeric speed limitation uh, for uh, these devices when they're in use? Um, so not really to the to the maximum, but rather uh, something much lower, given the uh, the e I guess the the overall ecosystem of um of all the different vehicles that might be on the the road or a sidewalk um you know the entire uh system i guess so this is jennifer huddleston generally what we've seen on a policy front here is not a speed limit in the traditional sense that most of us would encounter it of when you're driving a car or whatever and it says 20 mile an hour zone or school zone or, or anything like that what we've seen more is speed caps, particularly in regards to pilot programs or to other agreements for shared operation in the city and the regulation of the kind of shared deployment element of this. Um, this is Sherry Shafflin with Federal Highways. I think as sure. we try to measure comfort in the walking and biking network, we've introduced a new variable in the variable speeds of a multi-use path. So uh, an elderly person, a young, uh, a young child who might dart out, uh, somebody with a baby buggy, you know, they're all gonna have different perceptions of comfort now that we are, uh, that they may have uh, not expected in a multi-use trail, for example. So I, you know, starting to see some research underway for people to try to think about that comfort, measure that, get feedback, and you know, we've got to give that information back to the trail managers and the communities um, to help figure out how to uh, accommodate all users. And and one other thing that I want to um, point out um, relating to the work that was done on J3194, the SAE standard. I think there was um, there was a little bit of a conscious decision there when it's in setting in segregating the speed categories for various micromobility vehicles to try to split them into a sidewalk slash bike lane slash uh, middle of the road speed and I think they I think they were set somewhere around eight and twenty and thirty if I remember correctly and the point isn't that every sidewalk is appropriate for eight or every bike lane is appropriate for twenty or something like that but I think just more the general concept that when we think of our streets there are those three general categories of uh, of places to ride and and with different speed expectations for each and that in, in a more a more fulsome categorization system or taxonomy eventually might uh, address uh, think of those three as a uh, thing of those three and classify them by weight and speed of the vehicles that are permitted within them. Excellent. Well, hey, I, I really appreciate everyone's everyone's insights. I know that that, that there was kind of a um, quick fire uh, questions there. Uh, just want to share as much information as we can. Uh, so we've run out of time on panel five, but I just want to remind all the participants if you have a question and it was not answered. Uh, please use the question box uh, to at least write the question down. Uh, we'll we'll have a record of it, and so uh, it will become a part of this um, uh, the forum. And so it's something that we could potentially address in the future. So just keep that in mind. 
Um, so it is 4.30, and so I want to turn it back over to my colleague, uh, Lawrence Mella, for some final comments. Thanks, Jay. And uh, thank you again to all of our panelists for joining us today and uh, sharing sharing their knowledge um, for this very important discussion. Um, I think today we framed a lot of uh, the opportunities and and challenges related to micromobility and consumer safety. Um, we know micromobility products are not necessarily brand new, but advancements in technology and introduction of things like ride sharing and fleet use have kind of changed the way that uh, people are using these things in our commuting norms. Um, it's given consumers some additional choices on how they uh, move around, especially in in high density areas and urban environments. And by using this uh, safety solutions, by approaching safety solutions by using a uh, systems approach, I think that gives uh, everyone kind of the best chance in addressing uh, the safety concerns more comprehensively. And so before we close, I just want to remind everyone that um, this meeting was being recorded and we, uh, once we get through some technical things with the recording, we will try to get this out to everyone um, and try to get it posted on our website. Um, additionally, we will be publishing a meeting log on our website that will include a brief synopsis of the day and we will attach um, the presentations from the speakers today. And uh, we will try to get that out um, to all the registrants through emails uh, with a link. And thank you, thanks again for um, everyone. Thanks again to the speakers. And thanks to all that attended. I know that we um, had some attendees from the West Coast that joined us in the morning at 6 o'clock in the morning over there. And I, and I think we even had some international um, attendees. So I just wanted to say thank you and appreciate uh, all of you. Uh, working through the different time zones. And the last thing I want to say is, while we don't have anything specific planned right after this forum, feel free to uh, to reach out to us. I'm going to drop my email here in a second. Uh, reach out to us if, if you guys want to share any other information that you think would be very helpful to the CPSC in uh, moving forward in our goal of uh, safety for consumers. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great afternoon.